it seemed reasonable to conclude from this that our friend was a lord in person i was immensely interested to see and hear the premier lord melbourne and brougham who seemed to me to take a very active part in the proceedings prompting melbourne several times as i thought and the duke of wellington who looked so comfortable in his grey beaver hat with his hands diving deep into his trousers pockets and who made his speech in so conversational a tone that i lost my feeling of excessive awe he had a curious way too of accenting his points of special emphasis by shaking his whole body i was also much interested in lord lyndhurst brougham's particular enemy and was amazed to see brougham go across several times to sit down coolly beside him apparently with a view to prompting even his opponent the matter in hand was as i learned it afterwards from the papers the discussion of measures to be taken against the portuguese government to ensure the passing of the antelsary bill the bishop of london who was one of the speakers on this occasion was the only one of these gentlemen whose voice and manner seemed to me stiff or unnatural but possibly i was prejudiced by my dislike of parsons generally after this pleasing adventure i imagined i had exhausted the attractions of london for the present for although i could not gain admittance to the lower house my untiring friend whom i came across again as i went out showed me the room where the commons sat explained as much as was necessary and gave me a sight of the speaker's woolsack and of his mace lying hidden under the table he also gave me such careful details of various things that i felt i knew all there was to know about the capital of great britain i had not the smallest intention of going to the italian opera possibly because i imagined the prices to be too ruinous we thoroughly explored all the principal streets often tiring ourselves out we shuddered through a ghastly london sunday and wound up with a train trip our very first to gravesend park in the company of the captain of the thetis on the twentieth of august we crossed over to france by steamer arriving the same evening at bolos Nurm, where we took leave of the sea with the fervent desire never to go on it again we were both of us secretly convinced that we should meet with disappointments in paris and it was partly on that account that we decided to spend a few weeks at or near bologna it was in any case too early in the season to find the various important people whom i proposed to see in town on the other hand it seemed to me a most fortunate circumstance that meyer beer should happen to be at bologna also i had the instrumentation of part of the second act of renzi to finish and was bent on having at least half of the work ready to show on my arrival in the costly french capital we therefore set out to find less expensive accommodation in the country round bologna beginning with the immediate neighborhood our search ended in our taking to practically unfurnished rooms in the detached house of a rural wine merchants situated on the main road to paris at half an hour's distance from bologna we next provided scanty but adequate furniture and in bringing our wits to bear upon this matter minna particularly distinguished herself besides a bed and two chairs we dug up a table which after i had cleared away my reensy papers served for our meals which we had to prepare at our own fireside while we were here i made my first call on meyer beer i had often read in the papers of his proverbial amiability and bore him no ill will for not replying to my letter my favourable opinion was soon to be confirmed however by his kind reception of me the impression he made was good in every respect particularly as regards his appearance the years had not yet given his features the flabby look which sooner or later mars most jewish faces and the fine formation of his brow round about the eyes gave him an expression of countenance that inspired confidence he did not seem in the least inclined to depreciate my intention of trying my luck in paris as a composer of opera he allowed me to read him my libretto for renzi and really listened up to the end of the third act he kept the two acts that were complete 
saying that he wished to look them over, and assured me, when I again called on him, of his whole-hearted interest in my work. Be this as it may, it annoyed me somewhat that he should again and again fall back on praising my minute handwriting, an accomplishment he considered especially Saxonian. He promised to give me letters of recommendation to de Ponkel, the manager of the opera house, and to Habenick, the conductor. I now felt that I had good cause to extol my good fortune, which, after many vicissitudes, had sent me precisely to this particular spot in France. What better fortune could have befallen me than to secure, in so short a time, the sympathetic interest of the most famous composer of French opera? Meyerbeer took me to see Moschelis, who was then in Bologna, and also Fraulein Blahedek, a celebrated virtuoso whose name I had known for many years. I spent a few informal musical evenings at both houses, and thus came into close touch with musical celebrities, an experience quite new to me. I had written to my future brother Lina, Avernerese, in Paris, to ask him to find us suitable accommodations. And we started on our journey thither on 16th September in the diligence, my efforts to hoist robber on to the top being attended by the usual difficulties. My first impression of Paris proved disappointing in view of the great expectations I had cherished of that city. After London it seemed to me narrow and confined. I had imagined the famous boulevards to be much vaster, for instance, and was really annoyed when the huge coach put us down in the Rue de la Jusian, to think that I should first set foot on Parisian soil in such a wretched little alley. Neither did the Rue Richelieu, where my brother Lena had his bookshop, seem imposing after the streets in the west end of London. As for the chain Brigarni, which had been engaged for me in the Rue de la Honolari, one of the narrow side streets which linked the Rue Street, honor with the Marche de Innocence, I felt positively degraded at having to take up my abode there. I needed all the consolation that could be derived from an inscription, placed under a bust of Moliere, which read, Mesa Nun Aquit Moliere, to raise my courage after the mean impression the house had first made upon me. The room, which had been prepared for us on the fourth floor, was small but cheerful, decently furnished, and inexpensive. From the windows we could see the frightful bustle in the market below, which became more and more alarming as we watched it, and I wondered what we were doing in such a quarter. Shortly after this, Avenaries had to go to Leipzig to bring home his bride, my youngest sister Cecilia, after the wedding in that city. Before leaving, he gave me an introduction to his only musical acquaintance, a German holding an appointment in the music department of the Bibliotha Croyal, named D. G. Anders, who lost no time in looking us up in Moliere's house. He was, as I soon discovered, a man of very unusual character, and, little as he was able to help me, he left an affecting and ineffable impression on my memory. He was a bachelor in the fifties, whose reverses had driven him to the sad necessity of earning a living in Paris entirely without assistance. He had fallen back on the extraordinary Bible or Figenic knowledge which, especially in reference to music, it had been his hobby to acquire in the days of his prosperity. His real name he never told me, wishing to guard the secret of that, as of his misfortunes, until after his death. For the time being he told me only that he was known as Anders, was of noble descent, and had held property on the Rhine, but that he had lost everything owing to the villainous betrayal of his gullibility and good not share. The only thing he had managed to save was his very considerable library, the size of which I was able to estimate for myself. It filled every wall of his small dwelling. Even here in Paris he soon complained of bitter enemies, for, in spite of having come furnished with an introduction to influential people, he still held the inferior position of an employee in the library, in spite of his long service there and his great learning. He had to see really ignorant men promoted over his head. I discovered afterwards that the real reason lay in his unbeskyensite methods, 
and the effeminious consequent on the delicate way in which he had been nurtured in early life, which made him incapable of developing the energy necessary for his work. On a miserable pittance of fifteen hundred francs a year, he led a weary existence, full of anxiety, with nothing in view but a lonely old age, and the probability of dying in a hospital. It seemed as if our society put new life into him, for though we were poverty-stricken, we looked forward boldly and hopefully to the future. My vious abity and invincible energy filled him with hopes of my success, and from this time forward he took a most tender and unselfish part in furthering my interests. Although he was a contributor to the Gazette Musicale, edited by Moritz Schlesinger, he had never succeeded in making his influence felt there in the slightest degree. He had none of the versatility of a journalist, and the editors entrusted him with little besides the preparation of Bible or Figonic notes. Oddly enough, it was with this unwalledly and least resourceful of men that I had to discuss my plan for the conquest of Paris, that is, of musical Paris, which is made up of all the most questionable characters imaginable. The result was practically always the same. We merely encouraged each other in the hope that some unforeseen stroke of luck would help my cause. To assist us in these discussions, Anders called in his friend and housemate Layers, a philologist, my acquaintance with whom was soon to develop into one of the most beautiful friendships of my life. Layers was the younger brother of a famous scholar at Königsberg. He had left there to come to Paris some years before, with the object of gaining an independent position by his philological work. This he preferred, in spite of the attendant difficulties, to a post as teacher with a salary which only in Germany could be considered sufficient for a scholar's wants. He soon obtained work from Didit, the bookseller, as assistant editor of a large edition of Greek classics, but the editor traded on his poverty and was much more concerned about the success of his enterprise than about the condition of his poor collaborator. Layers had therefore perpetually to struggle against poverty, but he preserved an even temper and showed himself in every way a model of disinterestedness and self aspherics At first he looked upon me only as a man in need of advice, and incidentally a fellow swerf in Paris for he had no knowledge of music and had no particular interest in it. We soon became so intimate that I had him dropping in nearly every evening with Anders, Layers being extremely useful to his friend, whose insteadness in walking obliged him to use an umbrella and a walking skip as crutches. He was also nervous in crossing crowded thoroughfares, and particularly so at night while he always liked to make layers cross my threshold in front of him to distract the attention of robber, of whom he stood in obvious terror. Our usually good-knit heart dog became positively suspicious of this visitor, and soon adopted towards him the same aggressive attitude which he had shown to the sailor cosk on board the Thetis. The two men lived at an hotel garni in Rue de Seine. They complained greatly of their landlady, who appropriated so much of their income that they were entirely in her power. Anders had for years been trying to assert his independence by leaving her, without being able to carry out his plan. We soon threw off mutually every shred of disguise as to the present state of our finances, so that, although the two households were actually separated, our common troubles gave us all the intimacy of one united family. The various ways by which I might obtain recognition in Paris formed the chief topic of our discussions at that time. Our hopes were at first centered on Meyer Beer's promised letters of introduction. De Ponkel, the director of the Opry, did actually see me at his office, where, fixing a monocle in his right eye, he read through Meyerbeer's letter without betraying the least emotion, having no doubt opened similar communications from the composer many times before. I went away and never heard another word from him. The elderly conductor, Habeneck, on the other hand, took an interest in my work that was not merely polite, 
and acceded to my request to have something of mine played at one of the orchestral practices at the conservatory as soon as he should have leisure, I had, unfortunately, no short instrumental piece that seemed suitable except my queer Columbus overture, which I considered the most effective of all that had emanated from my pen. It had been received with great applause on the occasion of its performance in the theatre at Magdeburg, with the assistance of the valiant trumpeters from the Prussian garrison. I gave Habenick the score and parts, and was able to report to our committee at home that I had now one enterprise on foot. I gave up the attempt to try and see scribe on the mere ground of our having had some correspondence, for my friends had made it clear to me, in the light of their own experience, that it was out of the question to expect this exceptionally busy author to occupy himself seriously with a young and unknown musician. Anders was able to introduce me to another acquaintance. However, a certain M. Dummerson, this gray hydra gentleman had written some hundred vaudeville pieces, and would have been glad to see one of them performed as an opera on a larger scale before his death. He had no idea of standing on his dignity as an author, and was quite willing to undertake the translation of an existing libretto into French verse. We therefore entrusted him with the writing of my Liebes Bovter, with a view to a performance at the Théâtre de la Renaissance, as it was then called. It was the third existing theatre for lyric drama, the performances being given in the new sale Ventador which had been rebuilt after its destruction by fire, on the understanding that it was to be a literal translation, he at once turned the three numbers of my opera, for which I hoped to secure a hearing, into neat French verse. Besides this, he asked me to compose a chorus for a vaudeville entitled La Descente de la Cortel, which was to be played at the Veritas during the carnival. This was a second opening. My friends now strongly advised me to write something small in the way of songs, which I could offer to popular singers for concert purposes. Both Lairs and Anders produced words for these. Anders brought a very innocent doors, moan and font, written by a young poet of his acquaintance. This was the first thing I composed to a French text. It was so successful that, when I had tried it over softly several times on the piano, my wife, who was in bed, called out to me that it was heavenly for sending one to sleep. I also set Latenti from Hugo's Orientals, and Ronsard's song, Mignon, to music. I have no reason to be ashamed of these small pieces, which I published subsequently as a musical supplement to Europa Lould's publication in 1848. I next stumbled on the idea of writing a grand bass aria with a chorus for Leblahi to introduce into his part of Oro Ibst in Bellini's Norma. Layers had to hunt up an Italian political refugee to get the text out of him. This was done, and I produced an effective compositional a Bellini which still exists among my manuscripts, and went off at once to offer it to Leblahi, the friendly Moor, who received me in the great singer's anteroom, insisted upon admitting me straight into his master's presence without announcing me, as I had anticipated some difficulty in getting near such a celebrity. I had written my request, as I thought this would be simpler than explaining verbally. The black servant's pleasant manner made me feel very uncomfortable. I entrusted my score and letter to him to give to Leblahi, without taking any notice of his kindly astonishment at my refusal of his repeated invitation to go into his master's room and have an interview, and I left the house hurriedly, intending to call for my answer in a few days. When I came back Leblahi received me most kindly, and assured me that my aria was excellent, though it was impossible to introduce it into Bellini's Opry after the latter had already been performed so very often, my relapse into the domain of Bellini's style, of which I had been guilty through the writing of this aria, was therefore useless to me, and I soon became convinced of the fruitlessness of my efforts in that direction. 
I saw that I should need personal introductions to various singers in order to ensure the production of one of my other compositions. When Meyerbeer at last arrived in Paris, therefore, I was delighted. He was not in the least astonished at the lack of success of his letters of introduction. On the contrary, he made use of this opportunity to impress upon me how difficult it was to get on in Paris and how necessary it was for me to look out for less pretentious work. With this object he introduced me to Maurice Schlesinger, and leaving me at the mercy of that monstrous person, went back to Germany. At first Schlesinger did not know what to do with me. The acquaintances I made through him of whom the chief was the violinist Panofka led to nothing, and I therefore returned to my advisory board at home through whose influence I had recently received an order to compose the music to the two Grenaders, by Hein, translated by a Parisian professor. I wrote this song for baritone, and was very pleased with the result. On Anders' advice I now ride to find singers for my new compositions. Madame, Pauline Viardot, on whom I first called, went through my songs with me, she was very amiable and praised them, but did not see why she should sing them. I went through the same experience with a Madame Widman, a grand contralto, who sang my doors, Mon Enfant with great feeling all the same she had no further use for my composition. A certain M. Dupont, third tenor at the Grand Opera, tried my setting of the Ronsard poem, but declared that the language in which it was written was no longer palatable to the Paris public. M. Geraldy, a Favourite concert singer and teacher, who allowed me to call and see him frequently, told me that the two Grenaders was impossible, for the simple reason that the accompaniment at the end of the song, which I had modelled upon the Marseillaise, could only be sung in the streets of Paris to the accompaniment of cannons and gunshots. Habeneck was the only person who fulfilled his promise to conduct my Columbus overture at one of the rehearsals for the benefit of Anders and myself. As, however, there was no question of producing this work even at one of the celebrated conservatory concerts, I saw clearly that the old gentleman was only moved by kindness and a desire to encourage me. It could not lead to anything further and I myself was convinced that this extremely superficial work of my young days could only give the orchestra a wrong impression of my talents. However, these rehearsals, to my surprise, made such an unexpected impression on me in other ways that they exercised a decisive influence in the crisis of my artistic development. This was due to the fact that I listened repeatedly to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which, by dint of untiring practice, received such a marvelous interpretation at the hands of this celebrated orchestra that the picture I had had of it in my mind in the enthusiastic days of my youth now stood before me almost tangibly in brilliant colors, and med as though it had never been effaced by the Leipzig orchestra who had slaughtered it under Poland's baton where formerly I had only seen mystic constellations and weird shapes without meaning, I now found, flowing from innumerable sources, a stream of the most touching and heavenly melodies which delighted my heart, the whole of that period of the deterioration of my musical tastes which dated, practically speaking, from those self-same confusing ideas about Beethoven, and which had grown so much worse through my acquaintance with that dreadful thetrial these wrong views now sank down as if into an abyss of shame and remorse. This inner change had been gradually prepared by many painful experiences during the last few years. I owed the recovery of my old vigour and spirits to the deep impression the rendering of the Ninth Symphony had made on me when performed in a way I had never dreamed of. This important event in my life can only be compared to the upheaval caused within me when, as a youth of sixteen, I saw Schroeder Verden act in Fidelio. The direct result of this was my intense longing to compose something that would give me a similar feeling of satisfaction. 
and this desire grew in proportion to my anxiety about my unfortunate position in Paris, which made me almost despair of success. In this mood I sketched an overture to Faust which, according to my original scheme, was only to form the first part of a whole Faust symphony, as I had already got the Gretchen idea in my head for the second movement. This is the same composition that I rewrote in several parts fifteen years later. I had forgotten all about it, and I owed its reconstruction to the advice of Liszt, who gave me many valuable hints. This composition has been performed many times under the title of Ein Fostartwerk, and has met with great appreciation at the time of which I am speaking. I hope that the conservatory orchestra would have been willing to give the work a hearing, but I was told they thought they had done enough for me, and hoped to be rid of me for some time. Having failed everywhere, I now turned to Meyerbeer for more introductions, especially to singers. I was very much surprised when, in consequence of my request, Meyerbeer introduced me to a certain M. Gwyn, a post office official, and Meyerbeer's sole agent in Paris, whom he instructed to do his utmost for me. Meyerbeer specially wished me to know M. Anton Werjoli, director of the Theatre de la Renaissance, the musical theatre already mentioned. M. Gwyn, with almost suspicious levity, promised me to produce my opera Liebes Bofter which now only required translation. There was a question of having a few numbers of my opera sung to the committee of the theatre at a special audience. When I suggested that some of the singers of this very theatre should undertake to sing three of the numbers which had been already translated by Dummerson, I was refused on the plea that all these artists were far too busy, but Gwyn saw a way out of the difficulty. On the authority of Maitre Meyer Beer, he won over to our cause several singers who were under an obligation to Meyer Beer. Madame Doruxeres, a real prima donna of the Grand Opera. Madame Widman and Dem Dupont, the two last named, had previously refused to help me now promise to sing for me at this audience. This much, then, did I achieve in six months. It was now nearly Easter of the year 1840. Encouraged by Gwine's negotiations, which seemed to spell hope, I made up my mind to move from the obscure courtier d'innocence to a part of Paris nearer to the musical center, and in this I was encouraged by Lair's foolhardy advice. What this change meant to me, my readers will learn when they hear under what circumstances we had dragged on our existence during our stay in Paris, although we were living in the cheapest possible way. Dining at a very small restaurant for a franc a head, it was impossible to prevent the rest of our money from melting away. Our friend Mahler had given us to understand that we could ask him if we were in need as he would put aside for us the first money that came in from any successful business transaction. There was no alternative but to apply to him for money. In the meantime, we pawned all the trinkets we possessed that were of any value. As I was too shy to make inquiries about a pawn shop, I looked up the French equivalent in the dictionary in order to be able to recognize such a place when I saw it. In my little pocket dictionary I could not find any other word than Lombard. On looking at a map of Paris I found, situated in the middle of an inextricable maze of streets, a very small lane called Rue des Lombards. Thither I wended my way, but my expedition was fruitless. Often, on reading by the light of the transparent lanterns the inscription Mont de Piet, I became very curious to know its meaning and on consulting my advisory board at home about this mount of piety. Footnote this is the correct translation of the words Bergder from Migeti used in the original editor. I was told, to my great delight, that it was precisely there that I should find salvation. To this Mont de Piet we now carried all we possessed in the way of silver, namely our wedding presents. After that followed my wife's trinkets and the rest of her former theatrical wardrobe, amongst which was a beautiful silver mjurder blue dress with a court train, once the property of the Duchess of Dassault. 
Still we heard nothing from our friend Mahler, and we were obliged to wait on from day to day for the sorely needed help from Königsberg. And at last, one dark day, we pledged our wedding rings. When all hope of assistance seemed vain, I heard that the Pontrictus themselves were of some value, as they could be sold to buyers, who thereby acquired the right to redeem the pond articles. I had to resort even to this, and thus the blue court dress, for instance, was lost forever. Mahler never wrote again, when later on he called on me at the time of my conductorship in Dresden. He admitted that he had been embittered against me owing to humiliating and derogatory remarks we were said to have made about him after we parted, and had resolved not to have anything further to do with us. We were certain of our innocence in the matter, and very grieved at having, through pure slander, lost the chance of such assistance in our great need. At the beginning of our pecuniary difficulties we sustained a loss which we looked upon as providential, in spite of the grief it caused us. This was our beautiful dog, which we had managed to bring across to Paris with endless difficulty, as he was a very valuable animal, and attracted much attention, he had probably been stolen. In spite of the terrible state of the traffic in Paris, he had always found his way home in the same clever manner in which he had mastered the difficulties of the London streets. Quite at the beginning of our stay in Paris he had often gone off by himself to the gardens of the Palais Royal, where he used to meet many of his friends, and had returned safe and sound after a brilliant exhibition of swimming and retrieving before an audience of gutter children. At the Quai du Pont Neuf he generally begged us to let him bathe. There he used to draw a large crowd of spectators round him, who were so loud in their enthusiasm about the way in which he dived for and brought to land various objects of clothing, tools, etc., that the police begged us to put an end to the obstruction. One morning I let him out for a little run as usual. He never returned and, in spite of our most strenuous efforts to recover him, no trace of him was to be found. This loss seemed to many of our friends a piece of luck, for they could not understand how it was possible for us to feed such a huge animal when we ourselves had not enough to eat. About this time, the second month of our stay in Paris, my sister Louisa came over from Leipzig to join her husband, Friedrich Brockhaus, in Paris where he had been waiting for her for some time. They intended to go to Italy together, and Louisa made use of this opportunity to buy all kinds of expensive things in Paris. I did not expect them to feel any pity for us on account of our foolish removal to Paris and its attendant miseries, or that they should consider themselves bound to help us in any way. But although we did not try to conceal our position, we derived no benefit from the visit of our rich relations. Minna was even kind enough to help my sister with her luxurious shopping, and we were very anxious not to make them think we wanted to rouse their pity. In return, my sister introduced me to an extraordinary friend of hers, who was destined to take a great interest in me. This was the young painter Ernst Keats. From Dresden he was an exceptionally kind-hearted and unaffected young man, whose talent for portrait painting in a sort of colored pastel style had made him such a favorite in his own town, that he had been induced by his financial successes to come to Paris for a time to finish his art studies. He had now been working in Delarkish studio for about a year. He had a curious and almost childlike disposition, and his lack of all serious education, combined with a certain weakness of character, had made him choose a career in which he was destined, in spite of all his talent, to fail hopelessly. I had every opportunity of recognizing this, as I saw a great deal of him. At the time, however, the simple hettered devotion and kindness of this young man were very welcome both to myself and my wife, who often felt lonely, and his friendship was a real source of help in our darkest hours of adversity. He became almost a member of the family, 
and joined our home circle every night, providing a strange contrast to nervous old Anders and the grave-faced layers. His good notcher and his quaint remarks soon made him indispensable to us. He amused us tremendously with his French, into which he would launch with the greatest confidence, although he could not put together two consecutive sentences properly, in spite of having lived in Paris for twenty years, with de Larcu he studied Doyle painting and had obviously considerable talent in this direction, although it was the very rock on which he stranded, the mixing of the colors on his palette, and especially the cleaning of his brushes, took up so much of his time that he rarely came to the actual painting, as the days were very short in midwinter, he never had time to do any work after he had finished washing his palette and brushes, and, as far as I can remember, he never completed a single portrait. Strangers to whom he had been introduced, and who had given him orders to paint their portraits, were obliged to leave Paris without seeing them even half done, and at last he even complained because some of his sitters died before their portraits were completed. His landlord, to whom he was always in debt for rent, was the only creature who succeeded in getting a portrait of his ugly person from the painter, and, as far as I know, this is the only finished portrait in existence by Keats. On the other hand, he was very clever at making little sketches of any subjects suggested by our conversation during the evening, and in these he displayed both originality and delicacy of execution. During the winter of that year he completed a good pencil portrait of me, which he touched up two years afterwards when he knew me more intimately, finishing it off as it now stands. It pleased him to sketch me in the attitude I often assumed during our evening chats when I was in a cheerful mood. No evening ever passed during which I did not succeed in shaking off the depression caused by my vain endeavors and by the many worries I had gone through during the day, and in regaining my natural cheerfulness, and Keats was anxious to represent me to the world as a man who, in spite of the hard times he had to face, had confidence in his success, and rose smiling above the troubles of life. Before the end of the year 1839, my youngest sister Cecilia also arrived in Paris with her husband, Edward Avenaries, it was only natural that she should feel embarrassed at the idea of meeting us in Paris in our extremely straight and circumstances, especially as her husband was not very well off. Consequently, instead of calling on them frequently, we preferred waiting until they came to see us, which, by the way, took them a long time. On the other hand, the renewal of our acquaintance with Heinrich Laub, who came over to Paris at the beginning of 1840 with his young wife, Aduna Nibudes, was very cheering. She was the widow of a wealthy Leipzig doctor, and Laub had married her under very extraordinary circumstances. Since we last saw him in Berlin, they intended to enjoy themselves for a few months in Paris. During the long period of his detention, while awaiting his trial, this young lady had been so touched by his misfortunes that without knowing much of him, she had shown great sympathy and interest in his case. Lauby's sentence was pronounced soon after I left Berlin. It was unexpectedly light, consisting of only one year's imprisonment in the town gale. He was allowed to undergo this term in the prison at Moscow in Silesia, where he had the advantage of being near his friend. Prince Buckler, who in his official capacity, and on account of his influence with the governor of the prison, was permitted to afford the prisoner even the consolation of personal intercourse, the young widow resolved to marry him at the beginning of his term of imprisonment, so that she might be near him at Moscow with her loving assistance. To see my old friend under such favorable conditions was in itself a pleasure to me, I also experienced the liveliest satisfaction at finding there was no change in his former sympathetic attitude. We met frequently, our wives also became friends, and Lobb was the first to approve in his kindly humorous way of our folly in moving to Paris. In his house I made the acquaintance of Heinrich Hein, 
and both of them joked good Murphy over my extraordinary position, making even me laugh. Lobb felt himself compelled to talk seriously to me about my expectations of succeeding in Paris, as he saw that I treated my situation, based on such trivial hopes, with a humor that charmed him even against his better judgment. He tried to think how he could help me without prejudicing my future. With this subject he wanted me to make a more or less plausible sketch of my future plans, so that on his approaching visit to our native land he might procure some help for me. I happened just at that time to have come to an exceedingly promising understanding with the management of the Théâtre de la Renaissance. I thus seemed to have obtained a footing, and I thought it safe to assert that if I were guaranteed the means of livelihood for six months, I could not fail within that period to accomplish something. Law promised to make this provision and kept his word. He induced one of his wealthy friends in Leipzig, and, following this example, my Weltodo relations, to provide me for six months with the necessary resources to be paid in monthly installments through Avenaries. We therefore decided, as I have said, to leave our furnished apartments and take a flat for ourselves in the Rue du Helder. My prudent, careful wife had suffered greatly on account of the careless and uncertain manner in which I had hitherto controlled our migre resources, and in now undertaking the responsibility, she explained that she understood how to keep house more cheaply than we could do by living in furnished rooms and restaurants. Success justified the step the serious part of the question lay in the fact that we had to start housekeeping without any furniture of our own, and everything necessary for domestic purposes had to be procured, though we had not the wherewithal to get it. In this matter Layers, who was well versed in the peculiarities of Parisian life, was able to advise us, in his opinion, the only compensation for the experiences we had undergone hitherto would be a success equivalent to my daring, as I did not possess the resources to allow of long years of patient waiting for success in Paris. I must either count on extraordinary luck or renounce all my hopes forthwith. The long defer success must come within a year, or I should be ruined. Therefore, I must dare all, as befitted my name for in my case he was not inclined to derive Wagner footnote. Wagner in German means one who dares. Also a wagoner and forework means a carriage, editor. From forework, I was to pay my rent 1,200 francs in quarterly installments for the furniture and fittings. He recommended me, through his landlady, to a carpenter who provided everything that was necessary for what seemed to be a reasonable sum also to be paid by installments, all of which appeared very simple. Layers maintained that I should do no good in Paris unless I showed the world that I had confidence in myself. My trial audience was impending I felt sure of the theatre deal our renaissance, and Dummerson was keenly anxious to make a complete translation of my Liebes Bovter into French, so we decided to run the risk. On 15th April, to the astonishment of the concierge of the house in the Rue du Helder, we moved with an exceedingly small amount of luggage into our comfortable new apartments. The very first visit I received in the rooms I had taken with such high hopes was from Anders, who came with the tidings that the Théâtre de la Renaissance had just gone bankrupt and was closed. This news, which came on me like a thunderclap, seemed to portend more than an ordinary stroke of bad luck. It revealed to me like a flash of lightning the absolute emptiness of my prospects. My friends openly expressed the opinion that Meyer Beer, in sending me from the Grand Opera to this theatre, probably knew the whole of the circumstances. I did not pursue the line of thought to which this supposition might lead as I felt cause enough for bitterness when I wondered what I should do with the rooms in which I was so nicely installed. As my singers had now practiced the portions of Liebes Bovter intended for the trial audience, I was anxious at least to have them performed before some persons of influence. 
M. Edouard Manet, who had been appointed temporary director of the Grand Opera after de Pankel's retirement, was the less disposed to refuse as the singers who were to take part belonged to the institution over which he presided. Moreover, there was no obligation attached to his presence at the audience. I also took the trouble to call on Scribe to invite him to attend, and he accepted with the kindest alacrity. At last my three pieces were performed before these two gentlemen in the green room of the Grand Opera, and I played the piano accompaniment. They pronounced the music charming, and Scribe expressed his willingness to arrange the libretto for me as soon as the managers of the opera had decided on accepting the piece. All that M. Manet had to reply to this offer was that it was impossible for them to do so at present. I did not fail to realize that these were only polite expressions, but at all events I thought it very nice of them, and particularly condescending of Scribe to have got so far as to think me deserving of a little politeness. But in my heart of hearts I felt really ashamed of having gone back again seriously to that superficial early work from which I had taken these three pieces. Of course I had only done this because I thought I should win success more rapidly in Paris by adapting myself to its frivolous taste. My aversion from this kind of taste, which had been long growing, coincided with my abandonment of all hopes of success in Paris. I was placed in an exceedingly melancholy situation by the fact that my circumstances had so shaped themselves that I dared not express this important change in my feelings to any one, especially to my poor wife. But if I continued to make the best of a bad bargain, I had no longer any illusions as to the possibility of success in Paris. Face to face with Underhoff misery, I shuddered at the smiling aspect which Paris presented in the bright sunshine of May. It was the beginning of the slack season for any sort of artistic enterprise in Paris, and from every door at which I knocked with feigned hope I was turned away with the wretchedly monotonous phrase, Monsieur Estatel Accompagne, on our long walks, when we felt ourselves absolute strangers in the midst of the gay throng, I used to romance to my wife about the South American free states, far away from all this sinister life, where opera and music were unknown and the foundations of a sensible livelihood could easily be secured by industry. I told Minna, who was quite in the dark as to my meaning, of a book I had just read, Schock's Die Grundung von Maryland, in which I found a very seductive account of the sensation of relief experienced by the European settlers after their former sufferings and persecutions. She, being of a more practical turn of mind, used to point out to me the necessity of procuring means for our continued existence in Paris, for which she had thought out all sorts of economies. I, for my part, was sketching out the plan of the poem of my fly and her hollander, which I kept steadily before me as a possible means of making a debut in Paris. I put together the material for a single act, influenced by the consideration that I could in this way confine it to the simple dramatic developments between the principal characters, without troubling about the tiresome operatic accessories from a practical point of view, I thought I could rely on a better prospect for the acceptance of my proposed work if it were cast in the form of Yonique de Tapra, such as was frequently given as a curtain raiser before a ballet at the Grand Opera. I wrote about it to Meyer Beer in Berlin, asking for his help. I also resumed the composition of Rienzi, to the completion of which I was now giving my constant attention. In the meantime, our position became more and more gloomy. I was soon compelled to draw in advance on the subsidies obtained by law, but in so doing I gradually alienated the sympathy of my brotherly Naavenaries, to whom our stay in Paris was incomprehensible. One morning, when we had been anxiously consulting as to the possibility of raising our first quarter's rent, a carrier appeared with a parcel addressed to me from London. I thought it was an intervention of providence, and broke open the seal. 
At the same moment a recent robe was thrust into my face for signature, in which I at once saw that I had to pay seven francs for carriage. I recognized, moreover, that the parcel contained my overture rule Britannia, returned to me from the London Philharmonic Society. In my fury I told the bearer that I would not take in the parcel, whereupon he remonstrated in the liveliest fashion. As I had already opened it, it was no use I did not possess seven francs, and I told him he should have presented the bill for the carriage before I had opened the parcel, so I made him return the only copy of my overture to Messrs. Lafitte and Gaylord's firm to do what they liked with it, and I never cared to inquire what became of that manuscript. Suddenly Keats devised a way out of these troubles. He had been commissioned by an old lady of Leipzig, called Fraulein Leple, a rich and very miserly old maid, to find a cheap lodging in Paris for her and for his stepmother, with whom she intended to travel, as our apartment, though not spacious, was larger than we actually needed, and had very quickly become a troublesome burden to us. We did not hesitate for a moment to let the larger portion of it to her for the time of her stay in Paris, which was to last about two months. In addition, my wife provided the guests with breakfast, as though they were in furnished apartments, and took a great pride in looking at the few pence she earned in this way. Although we found this amazing example of old Medinus's trying enough, the arrangement we had made helped us in some degree to tide over the anxious time, and I was able, in spite of this disorganization of our household arrangements, to continue working in comparative peace at my Rienzi, this became more difficult after Fraulein Lepley's departure, when we let one of our rooms to a German commercial traveler, who in his leisure hours zealously played the flute. His name was Brix, he was a modest, decent fellow, and had been recommended to us by Peck the painter, whose acquaintance we had recently made. He had been introduced to us by Keats, who studied with him in Delarkish studio, he was the very antithesis of Keats in every way, and obviously endowed with less talent, yet he grappled with the task of acquiring the art of oil painting in the shortest possible time under difficult circumstances with an industry and earnestness quite out of the common. He was, moreover, well-educated and eagerly assimilated information, and was very straightforward, earnest, and trustworthy without attaining to the same degree of intimacy with us as our three older friends. He was, nevertheless, one of the few who continued to stand by us in our troubles, and habitually spent nearly every evening in our company. One day I received a fresh surprising proof of Lauby's continued solicitude on our behalf. The secretary of a certain Count Custel called on us, and after some inquiry into our affairs, the state of which he had heard from Lob at Carlsbad, informed us in a brief and friendly way that his patron wished to be of use to us, and with that object in view desired to make my acquaintance. In fact, he proposed to engage a small light opera company in Paris, which was to follow him to his Russian estates. He was therefore looking for a musical director of sufficient experience to assist in recruiting the members in Paris. I gladly went to the hotel where the Count was staying, and there found an elderly gentleman of frank and agreeable bearing, who willingly listened to my little French compositions. Being a shrewd reader of human nature, he saw at a glance that I was not the man for him, and though he showed me the most polite attention, he went no further into the opera scheme, but that very day he sent me, accompanied by a friendly note, ten golden napoleons, in payment for my services. What these services were I did not know. I thereupon wrote to him and asked for more precise details of his wishes, and begged him to commission a composition, the fee for which I presumed he had sent in advance, as I received no reply, I made more than one effort to approach him again, but in vain. From other sources I afterwards learned that the only kind of opera Count Custel recognized was Adams, 
as for the operatic company to be engaged to suit his taste what he really wanted was more a small harem than a company of artists so far i had not been able to arrange anything with the music publisher schlesinger it was impossible to persuade him to publish my little french songs in order to do something however towards making myself known in this direction i decided to have my two creditors engraved by him at my own expense keats was to lithograph a magnificent titplegate for it schlesinger ended by charging me fifty francs for the cost of production the story of this publication is curious from beginning to end the work bore schlesinger's name and as i had defrayed all expenses the proceeds were of course to be placed to my account i had afterwards to take the publisher's word for it that not a single copy had been sold subsequently when i had made a quick reputation for myself in dresden through my Rienzi, shot the publisher in mainz who dealt almost exclusively in works translated from the french thought it advisable to bring out a german edition of the two grenadiers below the text of the french translation he had the german original by hein printed but as the french poem was a very free paraphrase in quite a different metre to the original Hein's words fitted my composition so badly that i was furious at the insult to my work and thought it necessary to protest against Schott's publication as an entirely unauthorized reprint. Schott then threatened me with an action for libel, as he said that, according to his agreement, his edition was not a reprint nactric, but a reum resfian abdruck, in order to be spared further annoyance. I was induced to send him an apology in deference to the distinction he had drawn, which I did not understand. In 1840, when I made inquiries of Schlesinger's successor in Paris, Sem, Brandis, as to the fate of my little work, I learned from him that a new edition had been published, but he declined to entertain any question of rights on my part. Since I did not care to buy a copy with my own money, I have to this day had to do without my own property. To what extent, in later years, others profited by similar transactions relating to the publication of my works will appear in due course for the moment the point was to compensate schlesinger for the fifty francs agreed upon and he proposed that i should do this by writing articles for his gazette musicality as i was not expert enough in the french language for literary purposes my article had to be translated and half the fee had to go to the translator However, I consoled myself by thinking I should still receive sixty francs per sheet for the work. I was soon to learn, when I presented myself to the angry publisher for payment, what was meant by a sheet. It was measured by an abominable iron instrument, on which the lines of the columns were marked off with figures. This was applied to the article, and after careful subtraction of the spaces left for the title and signature, the lines were added up after this process had been gone through it appeared that what i had taken for a sheet was only half a sheet so far so good i began to write articles for schlesinger's wonderful paper the first was a long essay de la musique allemande in which i expressed with the enthusiastic exaggeration characteristic of me at that time my appreciation of the sincerity and earnestness of german music this article led my friend Danders to remark that the state of affairs in Germany must, indeed, be splendid if the conditions were really as I described. I enjoyed what was to me the surprising satisfaction of seeing this article subsequently reproduced in Italian, in a mull on musical journal, where, to my amusement, I saw myself described as Dotsicio Musico Tedesco, a mistake which nowadays would be impossible. My essay attracted favorable comment, and Schlesinger asked me to write an article in praise of the arrangement made by the Russian general Luf of Pergolasi's Stabit Mater, which I did as superficially as possible. On my own impulse, I then wrote an essay in a still more amiable vein called Du Metier du Virtue a set deal independence de la composition. In the meantime, I was surprised in the middle of the summer by the arrival of Meyerbeer, 
who happened to come to Paris for a fortnight. He was very sympathetic and obliging. When I told him my idea of writing Onique de Tapre as a curtain raiser, and asked him to give me an introduction to M. Leon Pillet, the recently appointed manager of the Grand Opera, he at once took me to see him and presented me to him. But alas, I had the unpleasant surprise of learning from the serious conversation which took place between those two gentlemen as to my future that Meyer Beer thought I had better decide to compose an act for the ballet in collaboration with another musician. Of course, I could not entertain such an idea for a moment. I succeeded, however, in handing over to M. Pillet my brief sketch of the subject of the Flying Dutchman. Things had reached this point when Meyer Beer again left Paris, this time for a longer period of absence. As I did not hear from M. Pillet for quite a long time, I now began to work diligently at my composition of Rienzi, though, to my great distress, I had often to interrupt this task in order to undertake certain potbulling hackwork for Schlesinger. As my contributions to the Gazette Musicale proved so unremunerative, Schlesinger one day ordered me to work out a method for the cornet of pistons. When I told him about my embarrassment in not knowing how to deal with the subject, he replied by sending me five different published methods for the cornet of pistons. At that time, the Favorite amateur instrument among the younger male population of Paris, I had merely to devise a new sixth method out of these five, as all Schlesinger wanted was to publish an edition of his own. I was racking my brains how to start, when Schlesinger, who had just obtained a new complete method, released me from the onerous task. I was, however, told to write fourteen suites for the cornet a pistinch that is to say, airs out of operas arranged for this instrument, to furnish me with material for this work. Schlesinger sent me no less than sixty complete operas arranged for the piano. I looked them through for suitable airs for my suites, marked the pages in the volumes with paper strips, and arranged them into a curasoluing structure round my work table so that I might have the greatest possible variety of the melodious material within my reach when I was in the midst of this work. However, to my great relief and to my poor wife's consternation, Schlesinger told me that M. Schlitz, the first cornet player in Paris, who had looked my etudes through preparatory to their being engraved, had declared that I knew absolutely nothing about the instrument, and had generally adopted keys that were too high, which Parisians would never be able to use. The part of the work Kai had already done was, however, accepted, Schlitz having agreed to correct it, but on condition that I should share my fee with him. The remainder of the work was then taken off my hands, and the sixty p and off fort arrangements went back to the curious shop in the Rue Richelieu, so my exchequer was again in a sorry plight. The distressing poverty of my home grew more apparent every day, and yet I was now free to give a last touch to Rienzi, and by the 19th of November I had completed this most voluminous of all my operas. I had decided, some time previously, to offer the first production of this work to the court theatre at Dresden, so that, in the event of its being a success, I might thus resume my connection with Germany. I had decided upon Dresden as I knew that there I should have in Tichix the most suitable tenor for the leading part. I also reckoned on my acquaintance with Schroeder Verden, who had always been nice to me and who, though her efforts were ineffectual, had been at great pains, out of regard for my family, to get my fiend introduced at the court theatre, Dresden. In the secretary of the theatre, Hoffert Winkler, known as Theatre Hell, I also had an old friend of my family, besides which I had been introduced to the conductor, Reisiger, with whom I and my friend Appel had spent a pleasant evening on the occasion of our excursion to Bohemia in earlier days. To all these people I now addressed most respectful and eloquent appeals. Wrote out an official note to the director, Herr von Luttekau, as well as a formal petition to the King of Saxony, 
and had everything ready to send off. Meantime, I had not omitted to indicate the exact tempi in my opera by means of a metronome. As I did not possess such a thing, I had to borrow one, and one morning I went out to restore the instrument to its owner, carrying it under my thin overcoat. The day when this occurred was one of the strangest in my life, as it showed in a really horrible way the whole misery of my position at that time. In addition to the fact that I did not know where to look for the few francs wherewith Minna was to provide for our scanty household requirements, some of the bills which, in accordance with the custom in Paris in those days, I had signed for the purpose of fitting up our apartments, had fallen due, hoping to get help from once or so or another. I first tried to get those bills prolonged by the holders, as such documents pass through many hands. I had to call on all the holders across the length and breadth of the city. That day I was to propitiate a cheesminger who occupied a fifth-floor apartment in the site. I also intended to ask for help from Heinrich, the brother of my brotherly na Brockhaus, as he was then in Paris and I was going to call at Schlesinger's to raise the money to pay for the despatch of my score that day by the usual mail service, as I had also to deliver the metronome. I left Minna early in the morning after a sad goodbye. She knew from experience that as I was on a money-rising expedition, she would not see me back till late at night. The streets were enveloped in a dense fog, and the first thing I recognized on leaving the house was my dog robber, who had been stolen from us a year before. At first I thought it was a ghost, but I called out to him sharply in a shrill voice. The animal seemed to recognize me and approached me cautiously, but my sudden movement towards him with outstretched arms seemed only to revive memories of the few chastisements I had foolishly inflicted on him during the latter part of our association, and this memory prevailed over all others. He dropped timidly away from me, and, as I followed him with some eagerness, he ran only to accelerate his speed when he found he was being pursued. I became more and more convinced that he had recognized me, because he always looked back anxiously when he reached a corner, but seeing that I was hunting him like a maniac, he started off again each time with renewed energy. Thus I followed him through a labyrinth of streets, hardly distinguishable in the thick mist, until I eventually lost sight of him altogether, never to see him again. It was near the church of Street, Rock, and I, wet with perspiration and quite breathless, was still bearing the metronome. For a while I stood motionless, glaring into the mist, and wondered what the ghostly reappearance of the companion of my traveling adventures on this day might portend. The fact that he had fled from his old master with the terror of a wild beast filled my heart with a strange bitterness and seemed to me a horrible omen. Sadly shaken, I set out again, with trembling limbs, Upon my weary errand, Heinrich Brockhaus told me he could not help me, and I left him. I was sorely ashamed, but made a strong effort to conceal the painfuls of my situation. My other undertakings turned out equally hopeless, and after having been kept waiting for hours at Schlesinger's, listening to my employer's very trivial conversations with his collar sensations which he seemed purposely to protratechus reappeared under the windows of my home long after dark utterly unsuccessful i saw minna looking anxiously from one of the windows half expecting my misfortune she had in the meantime succeeded in borrowing a small sum of our lodger and boarder bricks the flute paler whom we tolerated patiently, though at some inconvenience to ourselves, as he was a good knit heart fellow, so she was able to offer me at least a comfortable meal. Further help was to come to me subsequently, though at the cost of great sacrifices on my part, owing to the success of one of Donna's Etty's operas, La Favorita, a very poor work of the Italian Mestros, but welcomed with great enthusiasm by the Parisian public already so much degenerated. This opera, the success of which was due mainly to two lively little songs, 
had been acquired by Schlesinger, who had lost heavily over Halavy's last operas. Taking advantage of my helpless situation, of which he was well aware, he rushed into our rooms one morning, beaming all over with amusing good Halmer, called for pen and ink, and began to work out a calculation of the enormous fees which he had arranged for me. He put down La Favorite a complete arrangement for Pian Offort, arrangement without words, for solo ditto, for duet, complete arrangement for quartet the same for two violins, ditto for a cornet a piston, total fee, Firks, immediate advance in cash, Firks, five hundred, I could see at a glance what an enormous amount of trouble this work would involve, but I did not hesitate a moment to undertake it. Curiously enough, when I brought home these five hundred francs in hard shining fifercant pieces, and piled them up on the table for our edification, my sister Cecilia Avenaries happened to drop in to see us. The sight of this abundance of wealth seemed to produce a good effect on her, as she had hitherto been rather chary of coming to see us, and after that we used to see rather more of her, and were often invited to dine with them on Sundays, but I no longer cared for any amusements. I was so deeply impressed by my past experiences that I made up my mind to work through this humiliating, albeit profitable task, with untiring energy, as though it were a penance imposed on me for the expiation of my bygone sins. To save fuel, we limited ourselves to the use of the bedroom, making it serve as a drug room, dinner room, and study as well as dormitory. It was only a step from my bed to my work table. To be seated at the dining table, all I had to do was to turn my chair round, and I left my seat altogether only late at night when I wanted to go to bed again. Every fourth day I allowed myself a short constitutional. This penitential process lasted almost all through the winter, and sowed the seeds of those gastric disorders which were to be more or less of a trouble to me for the rest of my life. In return for the minute and almost interminable work of correcting the score of Donna's Etty's opera, I managed to get three hundred francs from Schlesinger, as he could not get any one else to do it. Besides this, I had to find the time to copy out the orchestra parts of my overture to Faust, which I was still hoping to hear at the conservatory, and by the way of counteracting the depression produced by this humiliating occupation, I wrote a short story, Ein Pilgerforts u Beethoven a Pilgrimage to Beethoven, which appeared in the Gazette Musicala under the title Une Visit to Beethoven. Schlesinger told me candidly that this little work had created quite a sensation and had been received with very marked approval, and, indeed, it was actually reproduced either complete or in parts, in a good many fireside journals. He persuaded me to write some more of the same kind, and in a sequel entitled Das and Dines Musikers in Paris on Muses in Etteringer a Paris I avenged myself for all the misfortunes I had had to endure. Schlesinger was not quite so pleased with this as with my first effort, but it received touching signs of approval from his poor assistant, while Heinrich Hein praised it by saying that Hoffman would have been incapable of writing such a thing. Even Berlioz was touched by it, and spoke of the story very favorably in one of his articles in the journal Dedebats. He also gave me signs of his sympathy, though only during a conversation after the appearance of another of my musical articles entitled Weber die Overture concerning overtures, mainly because I had illustrated my principle by pointing to Gluck's overture to Iphigenia in Aulis as a model for compositions of this class. Encouraged by these signs of sympathy, I felt anxious to become more intimately acquainted with Berlioz. I had been introduced to him some time previously at Schlesinger's office, where we used to meet occasionally. I had presented him with a copy of my to Grenaders, but could, however, never learn any more from him concerning what he really thought of it than the fact that as he could only strum a little on the guitar, he was unable to play the music of my composition to himself on the piano, 
During the previous winter I had often heard his grand instrumental pieces played under his own direction, and had been most favorably impressed by them. During that winter 1830 he conducted three performances of his new symphony, Romeo and Juliet, at one of which I was present. All this, to be sure, was quite a new world to me, and I was desirous of gaining some unprejudiced knowledge of it. At first the grandeur and masterly execution of the orchestral part almost overwhelmed me. It was beyond anything I could have conceived. The fantastic daring, the sharp precision with which the boldest combinium bache and stangible in their clincer smeased me, drove back my own ideas of the poetry of music with brutal violence into the very depths of my soul. I was simply all leers for things of which till then I had never dreamt, and which I felt I must try to realize. True, I found a great deal that was empty and shallow in his Romeo and Juliet, a work that lost much by its length and form of combination, and this was the more painful to me seeing that, on the other hand, I felt overpowered by many really bewitching passages which quite overcame any objections on my part. During the same winter Berlioz produced his Sinfoni Fantastec and his Harold Herald then Italy, I was also much impressed by these works. The musical genreptickers woven into the first Snaid symphony were particularly pleasing, while Harold delighted me in almost every respect. It was, however, the latest work of this wonderful master, his true Serfinus for Die Opferd Urgeler of Alation Grand Symphony Funberet Triumholp, most skillfully composed for massed military bands during the summer of 1840 for the anniversary of the obsequies of the July heroes, and conducted by him under the column of the Place de la Bastille, which had at last thoroughly convinced me of the greatness and enterprise of this incomparable artist. But while admiring this genius, absolutely unique in his methods, I could never quite shake off a certain peculiar feeling of anxiety. His works left me with a sensation as of something strange, something with which I felt I should never be able to be familiar, and I was often puzzled at the strange fact that, though ravished by his compositions, I was at the same time repelled and even wearied by them. It was only much later that I succeeded in clearly grasping and solving this problem which for years exercised such a painful spell over me. It is a fact that at that time I felt almost like a little schoolboy by the side of Berlioz. Consequently, I was really embarrassed when Schlesinger, determined to make good use of the success of my short story, told me he was anxious to produce some of my orchestral compositions at a concert arranged by the editor of the Gazette Musicale. I realized that none of my available works would in any way be suitable for such an occasion. I was not quite confident as to my Faust overture because of its epicly sending, which I presumed could only be appreciated by an audience already familiar with my methods. When, moreover, I learned that I should have only a second-rate or Catrice Valentino from the casino, Rue Street, Honoridin, moreover, that there could be only one rehearsal. My only alternative lay between declining altogether or making another trial with my Columbus Overture. The work composed in my early days at Magdeburg, I adopted the latter course when I went to fetch the score of this composition from Isla Benk, who had it stored among the archives of the conservatory. He warned me somewhat dryly, though not without kindness, of the danger of presenting this work to the Parisian public, as, to use his own words, it was too vague. One great objection was the difficulty of finding capable musicians for the six cornets required, as the music for this instrument, so skillfully played in Germany, could hardly, if ever, be satisfactorily executed in Paris. Herr Schlitz, the corrector of my suites for cornet a piston, offered his assistance I was compelled to reduce my six cornets to four, and he told me that only two of these could be relied on. As a matter of fact, 
the attempts made at the rehearsal to produce those very passages on which the effect of my work chiefly depended were very discouraging not once were the soft high notes played but they were flat or altogether wrong in addition to this as i was not going to be allowed to conduct the work myself i had to rely upon a conductor who as i was well aware had fully convinced himself that my composition was the most utter rubbish in opinion that seemed to be shared by the whole orchestra. Berlioz, who was present at the rehearsal, remained silent throughout. He gave me no encouragement, though he did not dissuade me. He merely said afterwards, with a weary smile, that it was very difficult to get on in Paris. On the night of the performance, 4th February, 1848, the audience, which was largely composed of subscribers to the Gazette Musicale, and to whom, therefore, my literary successes were not unknown, seemed rather favorably disposed towards me. I was told later on that my overture, however wearisome it had been, would certainly have been applauded if those unfortunate cornet players, by continually failing to produce the effective passages, had not excited the public almost to the point of hostility. For Parisians, for the most part, care only for the skillful parts of performances, as, for instance, for the faultless production of difficult tones. I was clearly conscious of my complete failure. After this misfortune, Paris no longer existed for me, and all I had to do was to go back to my miserable bedroom and resume my work of arranging Donizetti's operas. So great was my renunciation of the world that, like a penitent, I no longer shaved, and to my wife's annoyance, for the first and only time in my life allowed my beard to grow quite long. I tried to bear everything patiently, and the only thing that threatened really to doctor me to despair was a pianist in the room adjoining ours who during the live long day practiced Liszt's fantasy on Lucia de Lammermer. I had to put a stop to this torture. So, to give him an idea of what he made us endure, one day I moved our own piano, which was terribly out of tune, close up to the party wall. Then Bricks, with his pickle pofit, played the pie and ovilanian or flute arrangement of the favorita overture I had just completed, while I accompanied him on the piano. The effect on our neighbour, a young pie in notchware, must have been appalling. The concierge told me the next day that the poor fellow was leaving, and, after all, I felt rather sorry. The wife of our concierge had entered into a sort of arrangement with us. At first we had occasionally availed ourselves of her services, especially in the kitchen, also for brushing clothes, cleaning boots, and so on, but even the slight outlay that this involved was eventually too heavy for us and after having dispensed with her services. Minna had to suffer the humiliation of doing the whole work of the household, even the most menial part of it, herself, as we did not like to mention this to Bricks. Minna was obliged not only to do all the cooking and washing up, but even to clean our lodger's boots as well. What we felt most, however, was the thought of what the concierge and his wife would think of us. But we were mistaken, for they only respected us the more. Though, of course, we could not avoid a little familiarity at times. Now and then, therefore, the man would have a chat with me on politics. When the quadruple alliance against France had been concluded, and the situation under Thur's ministry was regarded as very critical, my concierge tried to reassure me one day by saying, Monsieur, il y a quatre hommes en Europe qui s'appellent. Leroy Louis Philippe, Lemperi dite Ratchi, Lemperi de Russie, Leroy de Press Ebene, Ses Quater Saint de C. Et new snares on pas la guerre of an evening I very seldom lacked entertainment, but the few faithful friends who came to see me had to put up with my going on scribbling music till late in the night. Once they prepared a touching surprise for me in the form of a little party which they arranged for New Year's Eve 1840. Lairs arrived at dusk, rang the bell, and brought a leg of veal. Keats brought some rum, sugar, and a lemon peck supplied a goose. 
and Anders to bottles of the champagne with which he had been presented by a musical instrument Unker in return for a flattering article he had written about his pianos. Bottles from that stock were produced only on very great occasions. I soon threw the confounded favorite aside, therefore, and entered enthusiastically into the fun. We all had to assist in the preparations. To light the fire in the salon, give a hand to my wife in the kitchen, and get what was wanted from the grocer. The supper developed into a dithrimbac orgy, when the champagne was drunk and the punch began to produce its effects. I delivered a fiery speech which so provoked the hilarity of the company that it seemed as though it would never end. I became so excited that I first mounted a chair, and then, by way of heightening the effect, at last stood on the table, thence to preach the maddest gospel of the contempt of life together with a eulogy on the South American free states. My charmed listeners eventually broke into such fits of sobs and laughter, and were so overcome that we had to give them all shelter for the night hair condition making it impossible for them to reach their own homes in safety. On New Year's Day, 1848, I was again busy with my favorite. I remember another similar, though far less boisterous, feast on the occasion of a visit paid us by the famous violinist Vyatskops, an old schoolfellow of Keats's. We had the great pleasure of hearing the young virtuoso, who was then greatly fated in Paris, play to us charmingly for a whole of an eager performance which lent my little salon an unusual touch of fashion. Keats rewarded him for his kindness by carrying him on his shoulders to his hotel close by. We were hard hit in the early part of this year by a mistake I made owing to my ignorance of Paris customs. It seemed to us quite a matter of course that we should wait until the proper court dray to give notice to our landlady. So I called on the proprietors of the house, a rich young widow living in one of her own houses in the Marius Quarter. She received me, but seemed much embarrassed, and said she would speak to her agent about the matter, and eventually referred me to him. The next day I was informed by letter that my notice would have been valid had it been given to days earlier. By this omission I had rendered myself liable, according to the agreement, for another year's rent. Horrified by this news, I went to see the agent himself, and after having been kept waiting for a long time as a matter of fact they would not let me in at all he found an elderly gentleman apparently crippled by some very painful malady, lying motionless before me. I frankly told him my position, and begged him most earnestly to release me from my agreement, but I was merely told that the fault was mine, and not his, that I had given notice a day too late, and consequently that I must find the rent for the next year. My concierge, to whom, with some emotion, I related the story of this occurrence, tried to soothe me by saying Jerways Puvu Dyer Sella Carvois et Monsieur set Homnivot Pas Loke while Boyd. This entirely unforeseen misfortune destroyed our last hopes of getting out of our disastrous position. We consoled ourselves for a while with the hope of finding another lodger, but the fates were once more against us. Easter came, the new term began, and our prospects were as hopeless as ever. At last our concierge recommended us to a family who were willing to take the whole of our apartment, furniture included, off our hands for a few months. We gladly accepted this offer for, at any rate, it ensured the payment of the rent for the ensuing quarter. We thought if only we could get away from this unfortunate place we should find some way of getting rid of it altogether. We therefore decided to find a cheap summer residence for ourselves in the outskirts of Paris. Newton had been mentioned to us as an inexpensive summer resort, and we selected an apartment in the avenue which joins Newton to the neighboring village of Bellevue. We left full authority with our concierge as to our rooms in Rue du Helder, and settled down in our new temporary abode as well as we could. Old bricks, the good-knit heart flutist, had to stay with us again. 
for owing to the fact that his usual receipts had been delayed, he would have been in great straits had we refused to give him shelter. The removal of our scanty possessions took place on the twentieth of April, and was, after all, no more than a flight from the impossible into the unknown, for how we were going to live during the following summer we had not the faintest idea. Schlesinger had no work for me, and no other sources were available. The only help we could hope for seemed to lie in journalistic work which, though rather unremunerative, had indeed given me the opportunity of making a little success. During the previous winter I had written a long article on Weber's Freischist for the Gazette Musicale. This was intended to prepare the way for the forthcoming first performance of this opera. After recitatives from the pen of Berlioz had been added to it, the latter was apparently far from pleased at my article. In the article I could not help referring to Berlioz's absurd idea of polishing up this old-fashioned musical work by adding ingredients that spoiled its original characteristics, merely in order to give it an appearance suited to the luxurious repertoire of Opera House. The fact that the result fully justified my forecasts did not in the least tend to diminish the iflihing I had roused among all those concerned in the production, but I had the satisfaction of hearing that the famous George Sand had noticed my article. She commenced the introduction to a legendary story of French provincial life by repudiating certain doubts as to the ability of the French people to understand the mystic fabulous element which, as I had shown, was displayed in such a masterly manner in Freischist, and she pointed to my article as clearly explaining the characteristics of that opera. Another journalistic opportunity arose out of my endeavors to secure the acceptance of my Rienzi by the court theater at Dresden. Herr Winkler, the secretary of that theater, whom I have already mentioned, regularly reported progress but as editor of the Abidentized, a paper then rather on the wane, he seized the opportunity presented by our negotiations in order to ask me to send him frequent and gratuitous contributions. The consequence was that whenever I wanted to know anything concerning the fate of my opera, I had to oblige him by enclosing an article for his paper. Now, as these negotiations with the court theatre lasted a very long time, and involved a large number of contributions from me. I often got into the most extraordinary fixes simply owing to the fact that I was now once more a prisoner in my room, and had been so for some time, and therefore knew nothing of what was going on in Paris. I had serious reasons for thus withdrawing from the artistic and social life of Paris, my own painful experiences and my disgust at all the mockery of that kind of life, once so attractive to me and yet so alien unto my education, had quickly driven me away from everything connected with it. It is true that the production of the Huguenots, for instance, which I then heard for the first time, dazzled me very much indeed. Its beautiful orchestral execution, and the extremely careful and effective mise en scene, gave me a grand idea of the great possibilities of such perfect and definite artistic means. But, strange to say, I never felt inclined to hear the same opera again. I soon became tired of the extravagant execution of the vocalists, and I often amused my friends exceedingly by imitating the latest Parisian methods and the vulgar exaggerations with which the performances teemed. Those composers, moreover, who aimed at achieving success by adopting the style which was then in vogue, could not help either incurring my sarcastic criticism. The last shred of esteem which I still tried to retain for the first lyrical theatre in the world was at last rudely destroyed when I saw how such an empty, altogether unfrench work as done as Etty's Favorita could secure so long and important a run at this theatre. During the whole time of my stay in Paris I do not think I went to the opera more than for times. The cold productions at the Opera Comque and the degenerate quality of the music produced there, 
had repelled me from the start and the same lack of enthusiasm displayed by the singers also drove me from Italian opera. The names, often very famous ones, of these artists who sang the same for operas for years could not compensate me for the complete absence of sentiment which characterized their performance. So, unlike that of Schroeder Verden, which I so thoroughly enjoyed, I clearly saw that everything was on the downgrade, and yet I cherished no hope or desire to see this state of decline superseded by a period of newer and fresher life. I preferred the small theaters, where French talent was shown in its true light, and yet, as the result of my own longings, I was to intent upon finding points of relationship in them which would excite my sympathy, for it to be possible for me to realize those peculiar excellences in them which did not happen to interest me at all. Besides, from the very beginning my own troubles had proved so trying, and the consciousness of the failure of my Paris schemes had become so cruelly apparent, that, either out of indifference or annoyance, I declined all invitations to the theaters. Again and again, much to Minna's regret, I returned tickets for performances in which Rachel was to appear at the Théâtre Francais, and, in fact, saw that famous theater only once. When, some time later, I had to go there on business for my Dresden patron, who wanted some more articles, I adopted the most shameful means for filling the columns of the abidentized. I just strung together whatever I happened to hear in the evening from Anders and Lairs, but as they had no very exciting adventures either, they simply told me all they had picked up from papers and table tack, and this I tried to render with as much piquancy as possible in accordance with the journalistic style created by Hein, which was all the rage at the time. My one fear was lest old Hofrath Winkler should some day discover the secret of my wide knowledge of Paris. Among other things which I sent to his declining paper was a long account of the production of Freischist. He was particularly interested in it, as he was the guardian of Weber's children, and when in one of his letters he assured me that he would not rest until he had got the definite assurance that Rienzi had been accepted. I sent him, with my most profuse thanks, the German manuscript of my Beethoven story for his paper, the 1848 edition of this Gazette, then published by Arnold, but now no longer in existence, contains the only print of this manuscript. My occasional journalistic work was increased by a request from Luld, the editor of Europa, a literary monthly, asking me to write something for him, this man was the first who, from time to time, had mentioned my name to the public, as he used to publish musical supplements to his elegant and rather widely read magazine. I sent him two of my compositions from Königsberg for publication. One of these was the music I had set to a melancholy poem by Scheuerlin, entitled Der Nebon Dirt and Unbaum, a work of which even today I am still proud and my beautiful carnivals lied out of Liebesbofter, when I wanted to publish my little French compositanes, Mon Enfant, and the music to Hugo's Attenti and Ronsard's Meine Glunde not only sent me a small fee the first I had ever received for a compositant commission some long articles on my Paris impressions, which he begged me to write as entertainingly as possible, for his paper I wrote Pariser Amusements and Pariser Fatalitaint, in which I gave vent in a humorous style, a la hein, to all my disappointing experiences in Paris, and to all my contempt for the life led by its inhabitants. In the second I described the existence of a certain Hermann Fau, a strange good ferting with whom, during my early Leipzig days, I had become more intimately acquainted than was desirable. This man had been wandering about Paris like a vagrant ever since the beginning of the previous winter, and the meagre income I derived from arrangements of La Favorita was often partly consumed in helping this completely broken-down fellow. So it was only fair that I should get back a few francs of the money spent on him in Paris by turning his adventures to some account in Lourdes newspapers. 
When I came into contact with Leon Pillett, the manager of the opera, my literary work took yet another direction. After numerous inquiries, I eventually discovered that he had taken a fancy to my raft of the fly and her Hollander. He informed me of this and asked me to sell him the plot, as he was under contract to supply various composers with subjects for operettas. I tried to explain to Pillet both verbally and in writing that he could hardly expect that the plot would be properly treated except by myself, as this draft was in fact my own idea, and that it had only come to his knowledge by my having submitted it to him, but it was all to no purpose. He was obliged to admit quite frankly that the expectations I had cherished as to the result of Meyer Beer's recommendation to him would not come to anything. He said there was no likelihood of my getting a commission for a composition, even of a light opera, for the next seven years. As his already existing contracts extended over that period, he asked me to be sensible and to sell him the draft for a small amount, so that he might have the music written by an author to be selected by him, and he added that if I still wished to try my luck at the opera house, I had better see the ballamaters as he might want some music for a certain dance. Seeing that I contemptuously refused this proposal, he left me to my own devices. After endless and unsuccessful attempts at getting the matter settled, I at last begged Edward Manet, the commissaire for the Royal Theatres, who was not only a friend of mine, but also editor of the Gazette Musicale, to act as mediator, he candidly confessed that he could not understand Pillet's liking for my plot, which he also was acquainted with, but as Pillet seemed to like it if he would probably lose, it advised me to accept anything for it, as Monsieur Paul Fowker, a brotherly gnaw of Victor Hugo's, had had an offer to work out the scheme for a similar libretto. This gentleman had, moreover, declared that there was nothing new in my plot. As the story of the Vasso Phantom was well known in France, I now saw how I stood, and in a conversation with Pillet at which M. Fowker was present, I said I would come to an arrangement. My plot was generously estimated by Pillet at five hundred francs, and I received that amount from the cash office at the theatre, to be subsequently deducted from the author's rights of the future poet. Our summer residence in the Avenue Dean Yudon now assumed quite a definite character. These five hundred francs had to help me to work out the words and music of my fly and her hall and her for Germany, while I abandoned the French Basso phantom to its fate. The state of my affairs, which was getting ever worse and worse, was slightly improved by the settlement of this matter. May and June had gone by, and during these months our troubles had grown steadily more serious. The lovely season of the year, the stimulating country air, and the sensation of freedom following upon my deliverance from the wretchedly paid musical hack work I had had to do all the winter, wrought their beneficial effects on me, and I was inspired to write a small story entitled Dine Gluckly Carabined, this was translated and published in French in the Gazette Musicale. Soon, however, our lack of funds began to make itself felt with a severity that was very discouraging. We felt this all the more keenly when my sister Cecilia and her husband, following our example, moved to a place quite close to us. Though not wealthy, they were fairly well todo. They came to see us every day but we never thought it desirable to let them know how arably hard up we were. One day it came to a climax. Being absolutely without money, I started out. Early one morning, to walk to Paris, for I had not even enough to pay the railway fare thither, and I resolved to wander about the whole day, trudging from street to street, even until late in the afternoon, in the hope of raising a fifercant piece but my air and proved absolutely vain, and I had to walk all the way back to Mewden again, utterly penniless. When I told Minna, who came to meet me, of my failure, she informed me in despair that Herman Fowl, whom I have mentioned before, had also come to us in the most pitiful plight, 
and actually in want of food, and that she had had to give him the last of the bread delivered by the baker that morning. The only hope that now remained was that, at any rate, my lodger Bricks, who by a singular fate was now our companion in misfortune, would return with some success from the expedition to Paris which he also had made that morning. At last he, too, returned bathed in perspiration and exhausted, driven home by the craving for a meal, which he had been unable to procure in the town. As he could not find any of the acquaintances he went to see, he begged most piteously for a piece of bread. This climax to the situation at last inspired my wife with heroic resolution, for she felt it her duty to exert herself to appease at least the hunger of her men folk. For the first time during her stay on French soil, she persuaded the baker, the butcher, and wine merchant, by plausible arguments, to supply her with the necessaries of life without immediate cash payment, and Minna's eyes beamed when, an hour later, she was able to put before us an excellent meal, during which, as it happened, we were surprised by the Avenary's family, who were evidently relieved at finding us so well provided for. This extreme distress was relieved for a time, at the beginning of July, by the sale of Mivis O Phantom, which meant my final renunciation of my success in Paris. As long as the five hundred francs lasted, I had an interval of respite for carrying on my work. The first object on which I spent my money was on the hire of a piano, a thing of which I had been entirely deprived for months. My chief intention in so doing was to revive my faith in myself as a musician, as ever since the autumn of the previous year. I had exercised my talents as a journalist and adapter of operas only. The libretto of the fly and her hollander, which I had hurriedly written during the recent period of distress, aroused considerable interest in layers he actually declared I would never write anything better, and that the fly and her hollander would be mine on one. The only thing now was to find the music for it, as towards the end of the previous winter I still entertained the hopes of being permitted to treat this subject for the French opera. I had already finished some of the words and music of the lyric parts, and had had the libretto translated by Emile Deschamps, intending it for a trial performance, which, alas, never took place. These parts were the ballad of Senta, the song of the Norwegian sailors, and the spectre song of the crew of the fly and her hollander. Since that time I had been so violently torn away from the music that, when the piano arrived at my rustic retreat, I did not dare to touch it for a whole day. I was terribly afraid lest I should discover that my inspiration had left Faye, and suddenly I was seized with the idea that I had forgotten to write out the song of the helmsman in the first act although, as a matter of fact, I could not remember having composed it at all, as I had in reality only just written the lyrics. I succeeded and was pleased with the result. The same thing occurred with the spinner's song, and when I had written out these two pieces, and, on further reflection, could not help admitting that they had really only taken shape in my mind at that moment, I was quite delirious with joy at the discovery. In seven weeks the whole of the music of the fly and her hollander, except the orchestration, was finished. Thereupon followed a general revival in our circle. My exuberant good spirits astonished every one, and my Avenary's relations in particular thought I must really be prospering, as I was such good company. I resumed my long walks in the woods of Mewden, frequently even consenting to help Minna gather mushrooms which, unfortunately, were for her the chief charm of our woodland retreat. Though it filled our landlord with terror when he saw us returning with our spoils, as he felt sure we should be poisoned if we ate them, my destiny, which almost invariably laid me into strange adventures, here once more introduced me to the most eccentric character to be found not only in the neighborhood of Mewden, but even in Paris. This was M. Jaden, who, though he was old enough to be able to say that he remembered seeing Madame de Pompadour at Versailles, was still vigorous beyond belief. 
It appeared to be his aim to keep the world in a constant state of conjecture as to his real age. He made everything for himself with his own hands, including even a quantity of wigs of every shade, ranging in the most comic variety from youthful flaxen to the most venerable white, with intermediate shades of gray these he wore alternately, as the fancy pleased him. He dabbled in everything, and I was pleased to find he had a particular fancy for painting. The fact that all the walls of his rooms were hung with the most childish caricatures of animal life, and that he had even embellished the outside of his blinds with the most ridiculous paintings, did not disconcert me in the least. On the contrary, it confirmed my belief that he did not dabble in music, until, to my horror, I discovered that the strangely discordant sounds of a harp which kept reaching my ears from some unknown region were actually proceeding from his basement, where he had two harpsichords of his own invention. He informed me that he had unfortunately neglected playing them for a long time, but that he now meant to begin practicing again assiduously in order to give me pleasure, I succeeded in dissuading him from this, by assuring him that the doctor had forbidden me to listen to the harp, as it was bad for my nerves. His figure as I saw him for the last time remains impressed on my memory, like an apparition from the world of Hoffman's fairy tales. In the late autumn, when we were going back to Paris, he asked us to take with us on our furniture van an enormous stovepipe, of which he promised to relieve us shortly. One very cold day Jagan actually presented himself at our new abode in Paris, in a most preposterous costume of his own manufacture, consisting of very thin lytle out rousers, a very short pal green dress coat with conspicuously long tails, projecting lace shirt frills and cuffs, a very fair wig and a hat so small that it was constantly dropping off. He wore, in addition, a quantity of imitation jewelry, and all this on the undisguised assumption that he could not go about in fashionable Paris dressed as simply as in the country. He had come for the stovepipe. We asked him where the men to carry it were. In reply, he simply smiled and expressed his surprise at our helplessness and thereupon took the enormous stovepipe under his arm and absolutely refused to accept our help when we offered to assist him in carrying it down the stairs. Though this operation, notwithstanding his vaunted skill, occupied him quite half an hour, every one in the house assembled to witness this removal, but he was by no means disconcerted, and managed to get the pipe through the street door, and then tripped gracefully along the pavement with it, and disappeared from our sight. For this short though eventful period, during which I was quite free to give full scope to my inmost thoughts, I indulged in the consolation of purely artistic creations. I can only say that, when it came to an end, I had made such progress that I could look forward with cheerful composure to the much longer period of trouble and distress I felt was in store for me. This, in fact, duly set in, for I had only just completed the last scene when I found that my five hundred francs were coming to an end, and what was left was not sufficient to secure me the necessary peace and freedom from worry for composing the overture. I had to postpone this until my luck should take an other favorable turn, and meanwhile I was forced to engage in the struggle for a bare subsistence, making efforts of all kinds that left me neither leisure nor peace of mind. The concierge from the Rue du Helder brought us the news that the mysterious family to whom we had let our rooms had left, and that we were now once more responsible for the rent. I had to tell him that I would not under any circumstances trouble about the rooms any more, and that the landlord might recoup himself by the sale of the furniture we had left there. This was done at a very heavy loss, and the furniture, the greater part of which was still unpaid for, was sacrificed to pay the rent of a dwelling which we no longer occupied. Under the stress of the most terrible privations, I still endeavored to secure sufficient leisure for working out the orchestration of the score of the fly and her hollander. The rough autumn weather set in at an exceptionally early date, 
people were all leaving their country houses for Paris, and, among them, the Avenaries family. We, however, could not dream of doing so, for we could not even raise the funds for the journey. When M. Jagan expressed his surprise at this, I pretended to be so pressed with work that I could not interrupt it, although I felt the cold that penetrated through the thin walls of the house very severely. So I waited for help from Ernst Kastel, one of my old Königsberg friends, a well toto young merchant, who a short time before had called on us in Newton and treated us to a luxurious repast in Paris, promising at the same time to relieve our necessities as soon as possible by an advance, which we knew was an easy matter to him. By way of cheering us up, Keats came over to us one day, with a large portfolio and a pillow under his arm. He intended to amuse us by working at a large caricature representing myself and my unfortunate adventures in Paris, and the pillow was to enable him, after his labors, to get some rest on our hard couch, which he had noticed had no pillows at the head, knowing that we had a difficulty in procuring fuel. He brought with him some bottles of rum to warm us with punch during the cold evenings. Under these circumstances I read Hoffman's tales to him and my wife. At last I had news from Königsberg, but it only opened my eyes to the fact that the gay young dog had not meant his promise seriously. We now looked forward almost with despair to the chilly mists of approaching winter, but Keats, declaring that it was his place to find help packed up his portfolio, placed it under his arm with the pillow, and went off to Paris. On the next day he returned with two hundred francs, that he had managed to procure by means of generous self asperics We at once set off for Paris, and took a small apartment near our friends. In the back part of No. 14 Rue Jacob, I afterwards heard that shortly after we left it was occupied by Proudhon, we got back to town on 30th October. Our home was exceedingly small and cold, and its chilliness in particular made it very bad for our health. We furnished its cantily with the little we had saved from the wreck of the Rue du Holder, and awaited the results of my efforts towards getting my works accepted and produced in Germany. The first necessity was at all costs to secure peace and quietness for myself for the short time which I should have to devote to the overture of the Flyander Hollander. I told Keats that he would have to procure the money necessary for my household expenses until this work was finished and the full score of the opera sent off, with the aid of a pedantic uncle, who had lived in Paris a long time and who was also a painter, he succeeded in providing me with the necessary assistance, in installments of five or ten francs at a time. During this period I often pointed with cheerful pride to my boots, which became mere travesties of footgear, as the soles eventually disappeared altogether, as long as I was engaged on the Dutchman, and Keats was looking after me, this made no difference for I never went out but when I had dispatched my completed score to the management of the Berlin Court Theatre at the beginning of December, the bitterness of the position could no longer be disguised. It was necessary for me to buckle to and look for help myself. What this meant in Paris I learned just about this time from the hapless fate of the worthy layers, driven by need such as I myself had had to surmount a year before at about the same time, he had been compelled on a broiling hot day in the previous summer to scour the various quarters of the city breathlessly, to get grace for bills he had accepted, and which had fallen due. He foolishly took an iced drink which he hoped would refresh him in his distressing condition, but it immediately made him lose his voice and from that day he was the victim of a hoarseness which with terrific rapidity ripened the seeds of consumption doubtless latent in him, and developed that incurable disease. For months he had been growing weaker and weaker, filling us at last with the gloomiest anxiety. He alone believed the supposed chill would be cured, if he could heat his room better for a time. One day I sought him out in his lodging, where I found him in the ice-cold room, 
huddled up at his writing table and complaining of the difficulty of his work for did it, which was all the more distressing as his employer was pressing him for advances he had made. He declared that if he had not had the consolation in those doleful hours of knowing that I had, at any rate, got my Dutchman finished, and that a prospect of success was thus open to the little circle of friends, his misery would have been hard indeed to bear. Despite my own great trouble, I begged him to share our fire and work in my room. He smiled at my courage in trying to help others, especially as my quarters offered barely space enough for myself and my wife. However, one evening he came to us and silently showed me a letter he had received from Vilman, the Minister of Education at that time, in which the latter expressed in the warmest terms his great regret at having only just learned that so distinguished a scholar whose able and extensive collaboration in Ditto's issue of the Greek classics had made him participate in a work that was the glory of the nation, should be in such bad health and strait and circumstances. Unfortunately, the amount of public money which he had at his disposal at that moment for subsidising literature only allowed of his offering him the sum of five hundred francs, which he enclosed with apologies, asking him to accept it as a recognition of his merits on the part of the French government, and adding that it was his intention to give earnest consideration as to how he might materially improve his position. This filled us with the utmost thankfulness on poor Lair's account, and we looked on the incident almost as a miracle. We could not help assuming, however, that M. Vilman had been influenced by Didit, who had been prompted by his own guilty conscience for his despicable exploitation of Lairs, and by the prospect of thus relieving himself of the responsibility of helping him, at the same time, from similar cases within our knowledge, which were fully confirmed by my own subsequent experience, we were driven to the conclusion that such prompt and considerate sympathy on the part of a minister would have been impossible in Germany. Layers would now have a fire to work by. But alas, our fears as to his declining health could not be allayed. When we left Paris in the following spring, it was the certainty that we should never see our dear friend again that made our parting so painful. In my own great distress, I was again exposed to the annoyance of having to write numerous and paid articles for the abidentized. As my patron, Hofruth Winkler, was still unable to give me any satisfactory account of the fate of my Rienzi in Dresden. In these circumstances I was obliged to consider it a good thing that Halvey's latest opera was at last a success. Schlesinger came to us radiant with joy at the success of Lar Ain de Chypre, and promised me eternal bliss for the piano score and various other arrangements I had made of this new estrage in the sphere of opera. So I was again forced to pay the penalty for composing my own fly and her Hollander by having to sit down and write out arrangements of Halvey's opera. Yet this task no longer weighed on me so heavily. Apart from the well-fenced hope of being at last recalled from my exile in Paris, and thus being able, as I thought, to regard this last struggle with poverty as the decisive one, the arrangement of Halvey's score was far and away a more interesting piece of hackwork than the shameful lay bower I had spent on Donna's Etty's favorita. I paid another visit, the last for a long time to come, to the grand opera to hear this reindy chypre. There was, indeed, much for me to smile at. My eyes were no longer shut to the extreme weakness of this class of work and the caricature of it that was often produced by the method of rendering it. I was sincerely rejoiced to see the better side of Halvey again. I had taken a great fancy to him from the time of his La Juve, and had a very high opinion of his masterly talent. At the request of Schlesinger I also willingly consented to write for his paper a long article on Halvey's latest work, 
In it I laid particular stress on my hope that the French school might not again allow the benefits obtained by studying the German style to be lost by relapsing into the shallowest Italian methods. On that occasion I ventured, by way of encouraging the French school, to point to the peculiar significance of Auber, and particularly to Histum von Portici, drawing attention, on the other hand, to the overloaded melodies of Rossini, which often resembled solfi exercises. In reading over the proof of my article I saw that this passage about Rossini had been left out, and dem. Um, Eduard Manet admitted to me that, in his capacity as editor of a musical paper, he had felt himself bound to suppress it. He considered that if I had any adverse criticism to pass on the composer, I could easily get it published in any other kind of paper, but not in one devoted to the interests of music, simply because such a passage could not be printed there without seeming absurd. It also annoyed him that I had spoken in such high terms of Auber, but he let it stand. I had to listen too much from that quarter which enlightened me forever with regard to the decay of operatic music in particular, and artistic taste in general among Frenchmen of the present day. I also wrote a longer article on the same opera for my precious friend Winkler at Dresden, who was still hesitating about accepting my Rienzi. In doing so, I intentionally made merry over a mishap that had befallen Lackner, the conductor, Kustner, who was theatrical director at Munich at the time, with a view to giving his friend another chance. Ordered a libretto to be written for him by street, George's in Paris, so that, through his paternal care, the highest bliss which a German composer could dream of might be assured to his protégé, well, it turned out that when Halavi's Reign de Chypre appeared, it treated the same subject as Lackner's presumably original work, which had been composed in the meantime. It mattered very little that the libretto was a really good one. The value of the bargain lay in the fact that it was to be glorified by Lackner's music. It appeared, however, that Street George's had, as a matter of fact, to some extent altered the book sent to Munich but only by the omission of several interesting features. The fury of the Munich manager was great, whereupon Street, Georges declared his astonishment that the latter could have imagined he would supply a libretto intended solely for the German stage at the paltry price offered by his German customer. As I had formed my own private opinion as to procuring French librettists for operas, and as nothing in the world would have induced me to set to music even the most effective piece of writing by Scribe or Street, George's, this occurrence delighted me immensely, and in the best of spirits I let myself go on the point for the benefit of the readers of the Abedentized, who, it is to be hoped, did not include my future friend Lackner, in addition, my work on Halavi's opera Rain de Chypre brought me into closer contact with that composer, and was the means of procuring me many an enlivening talk with that peculiarly good-hearted and really unassuming man, whose talent, alas, declined all too soon. Schlesinger, in fact, was exasperated at his incorrigible laziness. Halvey, who had looked through my piano score, contemplated several changes with a view to making it easier, but he did not proceed with them. Schlesinger could not get the proof feshies back. The publication was consequently delayed, and he feared that the popularity of the opera would be over before the work was ready for the public. He urged me to get firm hold of Halvey very early in the morning in his rooms, and compel him to set to work at the alterations in my company. The first time I reached his house at about ten in the morning, I found him just out of bed, and he informed me that he really must have breakfast first. I accepted his invitation and sat down with him to a somewhat luxurious meal. My conversation seemed to appeal to him, but friends came in, and at last Schlesinger among the number, who burst into a fury at not finding him at work on the proofs he regarded as so important. Halvey, however, remained quite unmoved. In the best of good tempers he merely complained of his latest success, because he had never had more peace than of late, 
when his operas, almost without exception, had been failures, and he had not had anything to do with them after the first production. Moreover, he feigned not to understand why this rain de Chypre in particular should have been a success. He declared that Schlesinger had engineered it on purpose to worry him. When he spoke a few words to me in German, one of the visitors was astonished, whereupon Schlesinger said that all Jews could speak German. Thereupon Schlesinger was asked if he also was a Jew. He answered that he had been but had become a Christian for his wife's sake. This freedom of speech was a pleasant surprise to me, because in Germany in such cases we always studiously avoided the point, as discourtous to the person referred to, but as we never got to the proof correcting, Schlesinger made me promise to give Halvey no peace until we had done them. The secret of his indifference to success became clear to me in the course of further conversation, as I learned that he was on the point of making a wealthy marriage. At first I was inclined to think that Halvey was simply a man whose youthful talent was only stimulated to achieve one great success with the object of becoming rich. In his case, however, this was not the only reason, as he was very modest in regard to his own capacity, and had no great opinion of the works of those more fortunate composers who were writing for the French stage at that time. In him I thus, for the first time, met with the frankly expressed admission of disbelief in the value of all our modern creations in this dubious field of art. I have since come to the conclusion that this incredulity, often expressed with much less modesty, justifies the participation of all Jews in our artistic concerns. Only once did Halvey speak to me with real candor, when, on my party departure for Germany, he wished me the success he thought my works deserved. In the year 1860 I saw him again. I had learned that, while the Parisian critics were giving vent to the bitterest condemnation of the concerts I was giving at that time, he had expressed his approval, and this determined me to visit him at the Paul Adil Institute, of which he had for some time been permanent secretary. He seemed particularly eager to learn from my own lips what my new theory about music really was, of which he had heard such wild rumors. For his own part, he said, he had never found anything but music in my music, but with this difference, that mine had generally seemed very good. This gave rise to a lively discussion on my part, to which he good Murphy agreed, once more wishing me success in Paris. This time, however, he did so with less conviction than when he bade me get by for Germany, which I thought was because he doubted whether I could succeed in Paris. From this final visit I carried away a depressing sense of the enervation, both moral and aesthetic, which had overcome one of the last great French musicians. While, on the other hand, I could not help feeling that a tendency to a hypocritical or frankly impudent exploitation of the universal degeneracy marked all who could be designated as Halavi's successors, Throughout this period of constant hack-work my thoughts were entirely bent on my return to Germany, which now presented itself to my mind in a wholly new and ideal light. I endeavored in various ways to secure all that seemed most attractive about the project, or which filled my soul with longing. My intercourse with layers had, on the whole, given a decided spur to my former tendency to grapple seriously with my subjects, a tendency which had been counteracted by closer contact with the theatre. This desire now furnished a basis for closer study of philosophical questions. I had been astonished at times to he reeve in the grave and virtuous layers, openly and quite as a matter of course, give expression to grave doubts concerning our individual survival after death, he declared that in many great men this doubt, even though only tacitly held, had been the real incitement to noble deeds. The natural result of such a belief speedily dawned on me without, however, causing me any serious alarm. 
On the contrary, I found a fascinating stimulus in the fact that boundless regions of meditation and knowledge were thereby opened up which hitherto I had merely skimmed in light-hearted levity. In my renewed attempts to study the Greek classics in the original, I received no encouragement from layers. He dissuaded me from doing so with the well-mean at consolation, that as I could only be born once, and that with music in me I should learn to understand this branch of knowledge without the help of grammar or lexicon, whereas if Greek were to be studied with real enjoyment, it was no joke and would not suffer being relegated to a secondary place. On the other hand, I felt strongly drawn to gain a closer acquaintance of German history than I had secured at school. I had Raumer's history of the Hohenstaufen within easy reach to start upon, all the great figures in this book lived vividly before my eyes. I was particularly captivated by the personality of that gifted emperor Frederiki, whose fortunes aroused my sympathy so keenly that I vainly sought for a fitting artistic setting for them. The fate of his son Manfred, on the other hand, provoked in me an equally well grinsed but more easily combated feeling of opposition. I accordingly made a plan of a great five-act dramatic poem, which should also be perfectly adapted to a musical setting. My impulse to embellish the story with the central figure of romantic significance was prompted by the fact of Manfred's enthusiastic reception in Luceria by the Saracens, who supported him and carried him on from victory to victory till he reached his final triumph. And this, too, in spite of the fact that he had come to them betrayed on every hand, banned by the church, and deserted by all his followers during his flight through Apulia and the Abruzzi, even at this time it delighted me to find in the German mind the capacity of appreciating beyond the narrow bounds of nationality all purely human qualities, in however strange a garb they might be presented for in this I recognized how nearly akin it is to the mind of Greece. In Frederiki I saw this quality in full flower, a fair-haired German of ancient Swabian stock, heir to the Norman realm of Sicily and Naples, who gave the Italian language its first development, and laid a basis for the evolution of knowledge and art where hitherto ecclesiastical fanaticism and feudal brutality had alone contended for power. A monarch who gathered at his court the poets and sages of eastern lands, and surrounded himself with the living products of Arabian and Persian grace and spirit this man I behold betrayed by the Roman clergy to the infidel foe yet ending his crusade to their bitter disappointment by a pact of peace with the sultan from whom he obtained a grant of privileges to christians in palestine such as the bloodiest victory could scarcely have secured in this wonderful emperor who finally under the ban of that same church struggled hopelessly and in vain against the savage bigotry of his age i beheld the german ideal in its highest embodiment my poem was concerned with the fate of his favourite son Manfred. On the death of an elder brother, Frederick's empire had entirely fallen to pieces, and the young Manfred was left under papal suzeration. In nominal possession of the throne of Apulia, we find him at Capua in surroundings, and attended by a court in which the spirit of his great father survives, in a state of almost effeminate degeneration. In despair of ever restoring the imperial power of the Hohenstaufen, he seeks to forget his sadness in romance and song. There now appears upon the scene a young Saracen lady, just arrived from the East, who, by appealing to the alliance between East and West concluded by Manfred's noble father, conjures the desponding son to maintain his imperial heritage. She acts the part of an inspired prophetess, and though the prince is quickly filled with love for her, she succeeds in keeping him at a respectful distance. By a skillfully contrived flight she snatches him, not only from the pursuit of rebellious Apulian nobles, but also from the papal ban which is threatening to depose him from his throne, accompanied only by a few faithful followers. 
She guides him through mountain fastnesses, where one night the wearied sun beholds the spirit of Fred Ricky, passing with feudal or a through the Abruzzi, and beckoning him on to Luceria, to this district situated in the Papal States. Frederick had, by a peaceful compact, transplanted the remnant of his Saracen retainers, who had previously been wreaking terrible havoc in the mountains of Sicily, to the great annoyance of the Pope. He had handed the town over to them in Feesmapal, thus securing for himself a band of faithful allies in the heart of an ever Trewerkis and hostile country. Fathima, as my heroine is called, has prepared through the instrumentality of trusty friends, a reception for Manfred in this place. When the papal governor has been expelled by a revolution, he slips through the gateway into the town, is recognized by the whole population as the son of their beloved emperor, and, amid wildest enthusiasm, is placed at their head to lead them against the enemies of their departed benefactor, in the meantime, while Manfred is marching on from victory to victory in his reconquest of the whole kingdom of Apulia, the tragic center of my action still continues to be the unvoiced longing of the lovelorn victor for the marvelous heroine. She is the child of the great emperor's love for a noble Saracen maiden. Her mother, on her deathbed, had sent her to Manfred foretelling that she would work wonders for his glory provided she never yielded to his passion. Whether Fathima was to know that she was his sister I left undecided in framing my plot. Meanwhile, she is careful to show herself to him only at critical moments, and then always in such a way as to remain imparkable. When at last she witnesses the completion of her task in his coronation at Naples, she determines, in obedience to her vow, to slip away secretly from the newly anointed king, that she may meditate in the solitude of her distant home upon the success of her enterprise. The Saracen Nureddin, who had been a companion of her youth, and to whose help she had chiefly owed her success in rescuing Manfred, is to be the sole partner of her flight. To this man, who loves her with passionate ardour, she had been promised in her childhood before her secret departure she pays a last visit to the slumbering king. This rouses her lover's furious jealousy, as he construes her act into a proof of unfaithfulness on the part of his betroth. The last look of farewell which Fathima casts from a distance at the young monarch, on his return from his coronation, inflames the jealous lover to wreak instant vengeance for the supposed outrage upon his hunter. He strikes the prophetess to the earth, whereupon she thanks him with a smile for having delivered her from an unbearable existence. At the sight of her body Manfred realizes that henceforth happiness has deserted him for ever. This theme I had adorned with many gorgeous scenes and complicated situations, so that when I had worked it out I could regard it as a fairly suitable interesting, and effective whole, especially when compared with other Welconner subjects of a similar nature, yet I could never rouse myself to sufficient enthusiasm over it to give my serious attention to its elaboration, especially as another theme now laid its grip upon me. This was suggested to me by a pamphlet on the Veniceberg, which accidentally fell into my hands. If all that I regarded as essentially German had hitherto drawn me with Everensikersing force, and compelled me to its eager pursuit, I here found it suddenly presented to me in the simple outlines of a legend, based upon the old and well Connor ballad of Tannhauser. True, its elements were already familiar to me from Tieck's version in his Fantasus, but his conception of the subject had flung me back into the fantastic regions created in my mind at an earlier period by Hoffman, and I should certainly never have been tempted to extract the framework of a dramatic work from his elaborate story. The point in this popular pamphlet which had so much weight with me was that it brought Tannhauser, if only by a passing hint, into touch with the minstrel's war on the Wartburg, I had some knowledge of this also from Hoffman's account in his Serapusernd, but I felt that the writer had only grasped the old legend in a distorted form. 
and therefore endeavored to gain a closer acquaintance with the true aspect of this attractive story. At this juncture Layers brought me the annual report of the proceedings of the Konigsberg German Society, in which the Wartburg contest was criticized with a fair amount of detail by Lucas. He Rye also found the original text, although I could utilize but little of the real setting for my own purpose. Yet the picture it gave me of Germany in the Middle Ages was so suggestive that I found I had not previously had the smallest conception of what it was like. As a sequel to the Wartburg poem, I also found in the same copy a critical study, Low and Grin, which gave in full detail the main contents of that widespread epic. Thus a whole new world was open to me and though as yet I had not found the form in which I might cope with low and grin, yet this image also lived imperishably within me, when, therefore, I afterwards made a close acquaintance with the intricacies of this legend. I could visualize the figure of the hero with a distinctness sequel to that of my conception of Tannhauser at this time. Under these influences my longing for a speedy return to Germany grew ever more intense, for there I hoped to earn a new home for myself where I could enjoy a leisure for creative work. But it was not yet possible even to think of occupying myself with such grateful tasks. The sordid necessities of life still bound me to Paris. While thus employed, I found an opportunity of exerting myself in a way more congenial to my desires. When I was a young man at Prague, I had made the acquaintance of a Jewish musician and composer called Day Swore a man who was not devoid of talent, who in fact achieved a certain reputation, but was chiefly known among his intimates on account of his hypochondria. This man, who was now in flourishing circumstances, was so far patronized by Schlesinger that the latter seriously proposed to help him to a commission for grand opera. De Sauer had come across my poem of the fly and her Hollander, and now insisted that I should draft a similar plot for him, as M. Leon Pillitz the so phantom had already been given to M. Deitch, the letter's musical conductor, to set to music. From this same conductor de Sauer obtained the promise of a light commission, and he now offered me two hundred francs to provide him with a similar plot and one congenial to his hypochondrical temperament. To meet this wish I ransacked my brain for recollections of Hoffman, and quickly decided to work up his Berg work von Fallon. The molding of this fascinating and marvelous material succeeded as admirably as I could wish. De Sauer also felt convinced that the topic was worth his while to set to music. His dismay was accordingly all the greater when Pillet rejected our plot on the ground that the staging would be too difficult, and that the second act especially would entail insurmountable obstacles for the ballet, which had to be given each time. In place of this de Sauer wished me to compose him an oratorio on Mary Magdalene, as on the day that he expressed this wish he appeared to be suffering from acute melancholia, so much so that he declared he had that morning seen his own head lying beside his bed. I thought well not to refuse his request. I asked him, therefore, to give me time, and I regret to say that ever since that day I have continued to take it. It was amid such distractions as these that this winter at length drew to an end, while my prospects of getting to Germany gradually grew more hopeful though with a slowness that sorely tried my patience. I had kept up a continuous correspondence with Dresden respecting Rienzi, and in the worthy course Mr. Fish Arai at last found an honest man who was favorably disposed to me. He sent me reliable and reassuring reports as to the state of my affairs. After receiving news early in January 1842, of renewed delay, I at last heard that by the end of February the work would be ready for performance. I was seriously uneasy at this, as I was afraid of not being able to accomplish the journey by that date. But this news also was soon contradicted, and the honest Fisher informed me that my opera had had to be postponed till the autumn of that year. I realized fully that it would never be performed if I could not be present in person at Dresden, 
when eventually in March Count Redern, the director of the Theater Royal in Berlin, told me that my fly and her hall and her had been accepted for the opera there, I thought I had sufficient treason to return to Germany at all costs as soon as possible. I had already had various experiences as to the views of German managers on this work, relying on the plot, which had pleased the manager of the Paris opera so much. I had sent the libretto in the first instance to my old acquaintance Ringlerth, the director of the Leipzig Theatre, but the man had cherished an undisguised aversion for me since my Liebesbofter, as he could not this time possibly object to any levity in my subject. He now found fault with its gloomy solemnity and refused to accept it. As I had met Councillor Kustner, at that time manager of the Munich Court Theatre, when he was making arrangements about Larain de Chypre in Paris, I now sent him the text of the Dutchman with a similar request. He, too, returned it with the assurance that it was not suited to German stage conditions or to the taste of the German public. As he had ordered a French libretto for Munich, I knew what he meant. When the score was finished, I sent it to Meyer Beer in Berlin with a letter for Count Redern and begged him, as he had been unable to help me to anything in Paris, in spite of his desire to do so, to be kind enough to use his influence in Berlin in favour of my composition, I was genuinely astonished at the truly prompt acceptance of my work two months later, which was accompanied by very gratifying assurances from the Count, and I was delighted to see in it a proof of Meyer Beer's sincere and energetic intervention in my favour. Strange to say, on my return to Germany soon afterwards, I was destined to learn that Count Redern had long since retired from the management of the Berlin Opera House, and that Kustner of Munich had already been appointed his successor. The upshot of this was that Count Redern's consent, though very courteous, could not by any means be taken seriously, as the realization of it depended not on him but on his successor, what the result was remains to be seen. A circumstance that eventually facilitated my long desert return to Germany, which was now justified by my good prospects, was the tardily awakened interest taken in my position by the wealthy members of my family, if did it had had reasons of his own for applying to the minister Vilman for support for layers. So also Avenaries, my brotherly gnaw in Paris, when he heard how I was struggling against poverty, one day took it into his head to surprise me with some quite unexpected help secured by his appeal to my sister Louisa. On 22nd December of the fast warning year 1848, I went home to Minna carrying a goose under my arm, and in the beak of the bird we found a fivered Ronfin note. This note had been given me by Avenaries as the result of a request on my behalf made by my sister Louisa to a friend of hers, a wealthy merchant named Schletter. This welcome addition to our extremely straight and resources might not in itself have been sufficient to put me in an exceedingly good hammer, had I not clearly seen in it the prospect of escaping altogether from my position in Paris as the leading German managers had now consented to the performance of two of my compositions. I thought I might seriously reproach my brotherly gnaw, Friedrich Brockhaus, who had repulsed me the year before when I applied to him in great distress, on the ground that he disapproved of my profession. This time I might be more successful in securing the wherewithal for my return. I was not mistaken, and when the time came I was supplied from this source with the necessary traveling expenses. With these prospects, and my position thus improved, I found myself spending the second half of the winter 1840 in Forcia in high spirits, and affording constant entertainment to the small circle of friends which my relationship to Avenaries had created around me. Min and I frequently spent our evenings with this family and others, amongst whom I have pleasant recollections of a certain Herr Kahn, the head of a private school, and his wife. I contributed so greatly to the success of their little sirees, and was always so willing to improvise dances on the piano for them to dance to, 
that I soon ran the risk of enjoying an almost burdensome popularity. At length the hour struck for my deliverance. The day came on which, as I devoutly hoped, I might turn my back on Paris forever. It was the 7th of April, and Paris was already gay with the first luxuriant buddings of spring. In front of our windows, which all the winter had looked upon a bleak and desolate garden, the trees were burgeoning, and the birds sang. Our emotion at parting from our dear friends Anders, Layers, and Keats, however, was great, almost overwhelming. The first seemed already doomed to an early death, for his health was exceedingly bad, and he was advanced in years. About Layers' condition, as I have already said, there could no longer be any doubt, and it was dreadful, after so short an experience as the two and a half years which I had spent in Paris, to see the ravages that want had wrought among good, noble, and sometimes even distinguished men, Keats, for whose future I was concerned, less on grounds of health than of morals, touched our hearts once more by his boundless and almost childlike good chair, fan sighing, for instance, that I might not have enough money for the journey, he forced me, in spite of all resistance, to accept another Pfeifferkant piece, which was about all that remained of his own fortune at the moment. He also stuffed a packet of good French snuff for me into the pocket of the coach, in which we at last rumbled through the boulevards to the barriers, which we passed but were unable to see this time, because our eyes were blinded with tears, Party. The journey from Paris to Dresden at that time took five days and nights. On the German frontier, near Forbach, we met with stormy weather and snow, a greeting which seemed inhospitable after the spring we had already enjoyed in Paris. And, indeed, as we continued our journey through our native land once more, we found much to dishearten us, and I could not help thinking that the Frenchmen who on leaving Germany breathed more freely on reaching French soil, and unbut and their coats, as though passing from winter into summer, were not so very foolish after all, seeing that we, for our part, were now compelled to seek protection against this conspicuous change of temperature by being very careful to put on sufficient clothing. The unkindness of the elements became perfect torture when, later on, between Frankfurt and Leipzig, we were swept into the stream of visitors to the great Easter fair. The pressure on the mail quacks was so great that for two days and a night, amid ceaseless storm, snow, and rain, we were continually changing from one wretched substitute to another thus turning our journey into an adventure of almost the same type as our former voyage at sea. One solitary flash of brightness was afforded by our view of the Wartburg, which we passed during the only sunlit hour of this journey. The sight of this mountain fastness, which, from the fold aside, is clearly visible for a long time, affected me deeply. A neighboring ridge further on I at once Chris and the Horselberg, and as we drove through the valley, pictured to myself the scenery for the third act of Meitenhauser, this scene remained so vividly in my mind that long afterwards I was able to give Despolik, the Parisian sepinator, exact details when he was working out the scenery under my direction. If I had already been impressed by the significance of the fact that my first journey through the German Rhine district, so famous in legend, should have been made on my way home from Paris. It seemed an even more ominous coincidence that my first sight of Wartburg, which was so rich in historical and mythical associations, should come just at this moment. The view so warmed my heart against wind and weather, Jews and the Leipzig fair, that in the end I arrived, on 12th April 1842, safe and sound, with my poor, battered, half Risnin wife, in that self-same city of Dresden which I had last seen on the occasion of my set separation from my Minna, and my departure for my northern place of exile, we put up at the Stadt Gotha Inn, 
the city in which such momentous years of my childhood and boyhood had been spent seemed cold and dead beneath the influences of the wild gloomy weather indeed everything there that could remind me of my youth seemed dead no hospitable house received us we found my wife's parents living in cramped and dingy lodgings in very strait and circumstances and were obliged at once to look about for a small abode for ourselves this we found in the top for gaze for twenty own marks a month after paying the necessary business visits in connection with Renzi and making arrangements for Minna during my brief absence, I set out on 15th April direct for Leipzig, where I saw my mother and family for the first time in six years. During this period, which had been so eventful for my own life, my mother had undergone a great change in her domestic position through the death of Rosalie, she was living in a pleasant roomy flat near the Brockhaus family, where she was free from all those household cares to which, owing to her large family, she had devoted so many years of anxious thought. Her bustling energy, which had almost amounted to hardness, had entirely given place to a natural cheerfulness and interest in the family prosperity of her married daughters, for the blissful calm of this happy old age she was mainly indebted to the affectionate care of her son in wall friedrich brockhaus to whom i expressed my heartfelt thanks for his goodness she was exceedingly astonished and pleased to see me unexpectedly enter her room any bitterness that ever existed between us had utterly vanished and her only complaint was that she could not put me up in her house instead of my brother julius the unfortunate goldsmith who had none of the qualities that could make him a suitable companion for her she was full of hope for the success of my undertaking and felt this confidence strengthened by the favourable prophecy which our dear rosalie had made about me shortly before her sad death for the present however i only stayed a few days in leipzig as I had first to visit Berlin in order to make definite arrangements with Count Redern for the performance of the fly and her Hollander. As I have already observed, I was here at once destined to learn that the Count was on the point of retiring from the directorship, and he accordingly referred me for all further decisions to the new director, Kustner, who had not yet arrived in Berlin. I now suddenly realized what this strange circumstance meant and knew that so far as the berlin negotiations went i might as well have remained in paris this impression was in the main confirmed by a visit to meyer beer who i found regarded my coming to berlin as over hasty nevertheless he behaved in a kind and friendly manner only regretting that he was just on the point of going away a state in which i always found him whenever i visited him again in berlin Mendelssohn was also in the capital about this time, having been appointed one of the general musical directors to the King of Prussia. I also sought him out, having been previously introduced to him in Leipzig. He informed me that he did not believe his work would prosper in Berlin, and that he would rather go back to Leipzig. I made no inquiry about the fate of the score of my great symphony performed at Leipzig in earlier days which i had more or less forced upon him so many years ago on the other hand he did not betray to me any signs of remembering that strange offering in the midst of the lavish comforts of his home he struck me as cold yet it was not so much that he repelled me as that i recoiled from him i also paid a visit to relit to whom i had a letter of introduction from his trusty publisher my brother lino brockhaus here it was not so much smug ease that I encountered. I doubtless felt repulsed more by the fact that he showed no inclination whatever to interest himself in my affairs. I grew very low-spirited in Berlin. I could almost have wished Commissioner Surf back again. Miserable as had been the time I had spent here years before, I had then, at any rate, met one man, who, for all the bluntness of his exterior, had treated me with true friendliness and consideration in vain did i try to call to mind the berlin through whose streets i had walked with all the ardour of youth by the side of lob 
after my acquaintance with London and still more with Paris, this city, with its sordid spaces and pretensions to greatness, depressed me deeply, and I breathed a hope that, should no luck crown my life, it might at least be spent in Paris rather than in Berlin. On my return from this wholly fruitless expedition, I first went to Leipzig for a few days, where, on this occasion, I stayed with my brotherly na, Hermann Brockhaus, who was now professor of Oriental languages at the university. His family had been increased by the birth of two daughters, and the atmosphere of unruffled content illuminated by mental activity and a quiet but vivid interest in all things relating to the higher aspects of life greatly moved my homeless and vagabond soul. One evening, after my sister had seen to her children, whom she had brought up very well, and had sent them with gentle words to bed, we gathered in the large richly stocked library for our evening meal and a long confidential chat. He wry broke out into a violent fit of weeping, and it seemed as though the tender sister, who five years before had known me during the bitterest straits of my early married life in Dresden, now really understood me at the express suggestion of my brotherly no Herman. My family tendered me a loan to help me to tide over the time of waiting for the performance of my Rienzi in Dresden. This, they said, they regarded merely as a duty, and assured me that I need have no hesitation whatever in accepting it. It consisted of a sum of six hundred marks, which was to be paid me in monthly installments for six months. As I had no prospect of being able to reply on any other source of income, there was every chance of Minna's talent for management being put severely to the test. If this were to carry us through, it could be done, however, and I was able to return to Dresden with a great sense of relief. While I was staying with my relatives, I played and sang them the fly and her Hollander for the first time connectedly, and seemed to arouse considerable interest by my performance. For when, later on, my sister Louisa heard the Opry in Dresden, she complained that much of the effect previously produced by my rendering did not come back to her. I also sought out my old friend Appel again. The poor man had gone stone blind, but he astonished me by his cheerians and contentment, and thereby once and for all deprived me of any reason for pitying him, as he declared that he knew the blue coat I was wearing very well though it was really a brown one. I thought it best not to argue the point, and I left Leipzig in a state of wonder at finding everyone there so happy and contented. When I reached Dresden, on 22nd April, I found occasion to grapple more vigorously with my lot. He Rai was enlivened by closer intercourse with the people on whom I had to rely for a successful production of Rienzi, it is true that the results of my interviews with Luttakow, the general manager, and Reisiger, the musical conductor, left me cold and incredulous. Both were sincerely astonished at my arrival in Dresden, and the same might even be said of my frequent correspondent and patron, Hofrath Winkler, who also would have preferred my remaining in Paris. But, as has been my constant experience both before and since, Help and encouragement have always come to me from humbler and never from the more exalted ranks of life. So, in this case, too, I met my first agreeable sensation in the overwhelmingly cordial reception I received from the old course Mr. Wilhelm Fischer. I had had no previous acquaintance with him, yet he was the only person who had taken the trouble to read my score carefully and had not only conceived serious hopes for the success of my opera, but had worked energetically to secure its being accepted and practiced. The moment I entered his room and told him my name, he rushed to embrace me with a loud cry, and in a second I was translated to an atmosphere of hope. Besides this man, I met in the actor Ferdinand Hine and his family another sure foundation for hearty and, indeed, deepertude friendship. It is true that I had known him from childhood, for at that time he was one of the few young people whom my stepfather Geyer liked to see about him. 
in addition to a fairly decided talent for drawing. It was chiefly his pleasant social gifts that had won him an entrance into our more intimate family circle. As he was very small and slight, my stepfather nicknamed him Davidic, and under this appellation he used to take part with great affability and good humor in our little festivities, and above all in our friendly excursions into the neighboring country, in which, as I mentioned in its place, even Karl Marie of von Weber used to join. Belonging to the good old school, he had become a useful, if not prominent, member of the Dresden stage. He possessed all the knowledge and qualities for a good stage manager, but never succeeded in inducing the committee to give him that appointment. It was only as a designer of costumes that he found further scope for his talents, and in this capacity he was included in the consultations over the staging of Rienzi. Thus it came about that he had the opportunity of bussying himself with the work of a member now grown to man's estate of the very family with whom he had spent such pleasant days in his youth he greeted me at once as a child of the house and we two homeless creatures found in our memories of this long lost home the first common basis to our friendship we generally spent our evenings with old fisher at hines where amid hopeful conversation we regaled ourselves on potatoes and herrings of which the meal chiefly consisted. Schroeder Verden was away on a holiday Tichikst, who was also on the point of going away. I had just time to see, and with him I went quickly through a part of his role in Rienzi. His brisk and lively nature, his glorious voice and great musical talent, gave special weight to his encouraging assurance that he delighted in the role of Rienzi, Hein also told me that the mere prospect of having many new costumes, and especially new silver armor, had inspired Tichikst with the liveliest desire to play this part, so that I might rely on him under any circumstances. Thus I could at once give closer attention to the preparations for practice, which was fixed to begin in the late summer. After the principal singers had returned from their holiday, I had to make special efforts to pacify my friend Fisher by my readiness to abbreviate the score, which was excessively lengthy. His intentions in the matter were so honest that I gladly sat down with him to the wearisome task. I played and sang my score to the astonished man on an old grand piano in the rear seamwab of the court theatre with such frantic vigour that, although he did not mind if the instrument came to grief, he grew concerned about my chest. Finally, amid hearty laughter, he ceased to argue about cutting down passages. As precisely where he thought something might be omitted, I proved to him with headlong eloquence that it was precisely here that the main point lay. He plunged with me head over heels into the vast chaos of sound, against which he could raise no objection, beyond the testimony of his watch, whose correctness I also ended by disputing, as Sopsi lighter fetly flung him the big pantomime and most of the ballet in the second act, whereby I reckoned we might save a whole half the Thus, thank goodness, the whole monster was at last handed over to the clerks to make a fair copy of, and the rest was left for time to accomplish. We next discussed what we should do in the summer, and I decided upon a stay of several months at Toplitz, the scene of my first youthful flights, whose fine air in baths, I hoped, would also benefit Minna's health. But before we could carry out this intention, I had to pay several more visits to Leipzig to settle the fate of my Dutchman. On 5th May, I proceeded thither to have an interview with Kustner, the new director of the Berlin Opera, who I had been told had just arrived there. He was now placed in the awkward position of being about to produce in Berlin the very opera which he had before declined in Munich, as it had been accepted by his predecessor in office. He promised me to consider what steps he would take in this predicament, in order to learn the result of Kustner's deliberations. I determined, on 2nd June, to seek him out, and this time in Berlin itself, 
but at Leipzig I found a letter in which he begged me to wait patiently a little longer for his final verdict. I took advantage of being in the neighborhood of Hal to pay a visit to my eldest brother Albert. I was very much grieved and depressed to find the poor fellow, whom I must give the credit of having the greatest perseverance and a quite remarkable talent for dramatic song, living in the unworthy and mean circumstances which the Hal Theatre offered to him and his family, the realization of conditions into which I myself had once nearly sunk now filled me with indescribable abhorrence. Still more harrowing was it to hear my brother speak of this state in tones which showed, alas, only too plainly the hopeless submission with which he had already resigned himself to its horrors. The only consolation I could find was the personality and childlike nature of his stepdaughter Johanna, who was then fifteen, and who sang me Spar's Rose. We bis do so shone with great expression and in a voice of an extraordinarily beautiful quality. Then I returned to Dresden, and at last, in wonderful weather, undertook the pleasant journey to Toplitz with Minna and one of her sisters. Reaching that place on 9th June, where we took up our quarters at a second souls in the Ike at Schonau, here we were soon joined by my mother, who paid her usual yearly visit to the warm baths all the more gladly this time because she knew she would find me there. If she had before had any prejudice against Minna because of my premature marriage to her, a closer acquaintance with her domestic gifts soon changed it into respect, and she quickly learned to love the partner of my doleful days in Paris. Although my mother's vagaries demanded no small consideration, yet what particularly delighted me about her was the astonishing vious avity of her almost childlike imagination, a faculty she retained to such a degree that one morning she complained that my relation of the Tannhauser legend on the previous evening had given her a whole night of pleasant but most tiring sleep slins. By dint of appealing letters to Schletter, a wealthy patron of art in Leipzig, I managed to do something for Keats, who had remained behind in misery in Paris, and also to provide Minna with medical treatment. I also succeeded to a certain extent in Amelia writing my own woeful financial position. Scarcely were these tasks accomplished when I started off in my old boyish way on a ramble of several days on foot through the Bohemian mountains in order that I might mentally work out my plan of the Veniceburg amid the pleasant associations of such a trip, he right took the fancy of engaging quarters in Ossig on the romantic Shrexintens, where for several days I occupied the little public room, in which straw was laid down for me to sleep on at night. I found recreation in daily ascents of the Wastre, the highest peak in the neighborhood, and so keenly did the fantastic solitude quicken my youthful spirit, that I clambered about the ruins of the Shrexentence the whole of one moonlit night, wrapped only in a blanket in order myself to provide the ghost that was lacking, and delighted myself with the hope of scaring some passing wafer, sir. He ride rue up in my piscite bought the detailed plan of a three topra on the Veniceburg, and subsequently carried out the composition of this work in strict accordance with the sketch I then made. One day, when climbing the Wastre, I was astonished, on turning the corner of a valley, to hear a merry dance tune whistled by a gothard perched up on a crag. I seemed immediately to stand among the chorus of pilgrims filing past the gothard in the valley, but I could not afterwards recall the gothard's tune so I was obliged to help myself out of the matter in the usual way. Enriched by these spoils, I returned to Toplitz in a wonderfully cheerful frame of mind and robust health, but on receiving the interesting news that Tichik and Schroeder Verden were on the point of returning, I was impelled to set off once more for Dresden. I took this step not so much to avoid missing any of the early rehearsals of Rienzi, as because I wanted to prevent the management replacing it by something else. I left Minna for a time with my mother, and reached Dresden on 18th July. I hired a small lodging in a queer house, 
since pulled down facing the Maximilian Avenue, and entered into a fairly lively intercourse with our operatic stars who had just returned. My old enthusiasm for Schroeder Verden revived when I saw her again more frequently in opera. Strange was the effect produced upon me when I heard her for the first time in Gretry's Blobbert, for I could not help remembering that this was the first opera I had ever seen. I had been taken to it as a boy of five also in Dresden, and I still retained my wondrous first impressions of it. All my earliest childish memories were revived, and I recollected how frequently and with what emphasis I had myself sung Bluebard's song. Ha, die falsch, die thur often, to the amusement of the whole house, with a paper helmet of my own making on my head. My friend Hein still remembered it well. In other respects, the operatic performances were not such as to impress me very favorably. I particularly missed the rolling sound of the fully equipped Parisian orchestra of string instruments. I also noticed that, when opening the fine new theater, they had quite forgotten to increase the number of these instruments in proportion to the enlarged space. In this, as well as in the general equipment of the stage, which was materially deficient in many respects, I was impressed by the sense of a certain meanness about theatrical enterprise in Germany, which became most noticeable when reproductions were given, often with wretched translations of the text of the Paris opera repertoire. If even in Paris my dissatisfaction with this treatment of opera had been great, the feeling which once drove me thither from the German theatres now returned with redoubled energy. I actually felt degraded again, and nourished within my breast a contempt so deep that for a time I could hardly endure the thought of signing a lasting contract, even with one of the most upoted of German opera houses but sadly wondered what steps I could take to hold my ground between disgust and desire in this strange world. Nothing but the sympathy inspired by communion with persons endowed with exceptional gifts enabled me to triumph over my scruples. This statement applies above all to my great ideal, Schroeder Verden, in whose artistic triumphs it had once been my most burning desire to be associated it is true that many years had elapsed since my first youthful impressions of her were formed. As regards her looks, the verdict which, in the following winter, was sent to Paris by Berlioz during his stay in Dresden, was so far correct that her somewhat maternal stoutness was unsuited to youthful parts, especially in male attire, which, as in Rienzi, made to great a demand upon the imagination. Her voice, which in point of quality had never been an exceptionally good medium for song, often landed her in difficulties, and in particular she was forced, when singing, to drag the time a little all through. But her achievements were less hampered now by these material hindrances than by the fact that her repertoire consisted of a limited number of leading parts which she had sung so frequently that a certain monotony in the conscious calculation of effect often developed into a mannerism which, from her tendency to exaggeration, was at times almost painful. Although these defects could not escape me, yet I, more than any one, was especially qualified to overlook such minor weaknesses, and realize with enthusiasm the incomparable greatness of her performances, Indeed, it only needed the stimulus of excitement, which this actress's exceptionally eventful life still procured, fully to restore the creative power of her prime, a fact of which I was subsequently to receive striking demonstrations. But I was seriously troubled and depressed at seeing how strong was the disintegrating effect of theatrical life upon the character of this singer who had originally been endowed with such great and noble qualities, from the very mouth through which the great actresses inspired musical utterances reached me, I was compelled to hear at other times very similar language to that in which, with but few exceptions, nearly all heroines of the stage indulge, the possession of a naturally fine voice, or even mere physical advantages, 
which might place her rivals on the same footing as herself in public favour, was more than she could endure, and so far was she from acquiring the dignified resignation worthy of a great artist, that her jealousy increased to a painful extent as years went on. I noticed this all the more because I had reason to suffer from it, a fact which caused me even greater trouble, however, was that she did not grasp music easily, and the study of a new part involved difficulties which meant many a painful hour for the composer who had to make her master his work. Her difficulty in learning new parts, and particularly that of Adriano in Rienzi, entailed disappointments for her which caused me a good deal of trouble. If, in her case, I had to handle a great and sensitive nature very tenderly, I had, on the other hand, a very easy task with Tichikst, with his childish limitations and superficial but exceptionally brilliant talents. He did not trouble to learn his parts by heart, as he was so musical that he could sing the most difficult music at sight, and thought all further study needless, whereas with most other singers the work consisted in mastering the score. Hence, if he sang through a part at rehearsals often enough to impress it on his memory, the rest, that is to say, everything pertaining to vocal art and dramatic delivery, would follow naturally. In this way he picked up any clerical errors there might be in the libretto, and that with such incorrigible pertinacity that he uttered the wrong words with just the same expression as if they were correct, he waved aside good Murphy any expectations or hints as to the sense with the remark, Ah, that will be all right soon. And, in fact, I very soon resigned myself and quite gave up trying to get the singer to use his intelligence in the interpretation of the part of the hero, for which I was very agreeably compensated by the light-hearted enthusiasm with which he flung himself into his congenial role and the irresistible effect of his brilliant voice, with the exception of these two actors who played the leading parts. I had only very moderate material at my disposal, but there was plenty of good will, and I had recourse to an ingenious device to induce Reisiger the conductor to hold frequent piano rehearsals. He had complained to me of the difficulty he had always found in securing a well-written libretto, and thought it was very sensible of me to have acquired the habit of writing my own. In his youth he had unfortunately neglected to do this for himself, and yet this was all he lacked to make a successful dramatic composer. I feel bound to confess that he possessed a good deal of melody, but this, he added, did not seem sufficient to inspire the singers with the requisite enthusiasm. His experience was that Schroeder Verden in his Adele de Foy's, would render very inferiorly the same final passage with which, in Bellini's Romeo and Juliet, she would put the audience into an ecstasy. The reason for this, he presumed, must lie in the subjectator. I at once promised him that I would supply him with a libretto in which he would be able to introduce these and similar melodies to the greatest advantage. To this he gladly agreed, and I therefore set aside for versification. As a suitable text for Reisiger, my ho he brought, founded on Koenig's romance, which I had once before submitted to scribe, I promised to bring Reisiger a page of verse for every piano rehearsal, and this I faithfully did until the whole book was done. I was much surprised to learn some time later that Reisiger had had a new libretto written for him by an actor named Kreeve. This was called The Wreck of the Medusa. I then learned that the wife of the conductor, who was a suspicious woman, had been filled with the greatest concern at my readiness to give up a libretto to her husband. They both thought the book was good and full of striking effects, but they suspected some sort of trap in the background, to escape from which they must certainly exercise the greatest caution. The result was that I regained possession of my libretto and was able later on, to help my old friend Kittle with it in Prague. He set it to music of his own, and entitled it Die Franzo in Vornitz. I heard that it was frequently performed in Prague with great success. 
though I never saw it myself, and I was also told at the same time by a local critic that this text was a proof of my real aptitude as a librettist, and that it was a mistake for me to devote myself to composition. As regards Meitenhauser, on the other hand, Lobb used to declare it was a misfortune that I had not got an experienced dramatist to supply me with a decent text for my music. For the time being, however, this work of versification had the desired result, and Reisiger kept steadily to the study of Rienzi, but what encouraged him even more than my verses was the growing interest of the singers, and above all the genuine enthusiasm of Tichikstein. This man, who had been so ready to leave the delights of the theater piano for a shooting party, now looked upon the rehearsals of Rienzi as a genuine treat. He always attended them with radiant eyes and boisterous good humor. I soon felt myself in a state of constant exhilaration. Favurite passages were greeted with acclamation by the singers at every rehearsal, and a concerted number of the third finale which unfortunately had afterwards to be omitted owing to its length, actually became on that occasion a source of profit to me, for Tichikst maintained that this B minor was solely that something ought to be paid for it every time, and he put down a silver penny, inviting the others to do the same, to which they all responded merrily. From that day forward, whenever we came to this passage at rehearsals, the cry was raised, here comes the silver penny part, and Schroeder Verden, as she took out her purse, remarked that these rehearsals would ruin her. This gratuity was conscientiously handed to me each time, and no one suspected that these contributions, which were given as a joke, were often a very welcome help towards defraying the cost of our daily food. For Minna had returned from Toplitz at the beginning of August, accompanied by my mother, we lived very frugally in chilly lodgings, hopefully awaiting the tardy day of our deliverance. The months of August and September passed, in preparation for my work amid frequent disturbances caused by the fluctuating and scanty repertoire of a German opera house, and not until October did the combined rehearsals assume such a character as to promise the certainty of a speedy production. From the very beginning of the general rehearsals with the orchestra we all shared the conviction that the opera would, without doubt, be a great success. Finally, the full-dress rehearsals produced a perfectly intoxicating effect when we tried the first scene of the second act with the scenery complete, and the messengers of peace entered, there was a general outburst of emotion, and even Schroeder Verden, who was bitterly prejudiced against her part, as it was not the role of the heroine, could only answer my questions in a voice stifled with tears. I believe the whole theatrical body, down to its humblest officials, loved me as though I were a real prodigy, and I am probably not far wrong in saying that much of this arose from sympathy and lively fellow-filing for a young man, whose exceptional difficulties were not unknown to them and who now suddenly stepped out of perfect obscurity into Splendour. During the interval at the full-dress rehearsal, while other members had dispersed to revive their jaded nerves with lunch, I remained seated on a pile of boards on the stage, in order that no one might realize that I was in the quandary of being unable to obtain similar refreshment. An invul a Italian singer, who was taking a small part in the opera, seemed to notice this, and kindly brought me a glass of wine and a piece of bread. I was sorry that I was obliged to deprive him of even his small part in the course of the year, for its loss provoked such ill treatment from his wife, that by conjugal tyranny he was driven into the ranks of my enemies, when, after my flight from Dresden in 1849, I learned that I had been denounced to the police by this same singer for supposed complicity in the rising which took place in that town. I bethought me of this breakfast during the Rienzi rehearsal, and felt I was being punished for my ingratitude, for I knew I was guilty of having brought him into trouble with his wife. The frame of mind in which I looked forward to the first performance of my work was a unique experience which I have never felt either before or since. 
my kind sister Clara fully shared my feelings. She had been living a wretched middle-class life at Chemnitz, which, just about this time, she had left to come and share my fate in Dresden. The poor woman, whose undoubted artistic gifts had faded so early, was laboriously dragging out a commonplace bourgeois existence as a wife and mother. But now, under the influence of my growing success, she began joyously to breathe a new life. She and I and the worthy course Mr. Fisher used to spend our evenings with the Hine family, still over potatoes and herrings, and often in a wonderfully elated frame of mind. The evening before our first performance I was able to crown our happiness by myself ladling out a bowl of punch. With mingled tears and laughter we skipped about like happy children, and then in sleep prepared ourselves for the triumphant day to which we looked forward with such confidence, although on the morning of 20th October, 1842 I had resolved not to disturb any of my singers by a visit. Yet I happened to come across one of them, a stiff Philistine called Riss, who was playing a minor bass part in a dull but respectable way. The day was rather cool, but wonderfully bright and sunshiny. After the gloomy weather we had just been having, without a word this curious creature saluted me and then remained standing, as though bewitched. He simply gazed into my face with wonder and rapture, in order to find out, so he at last managed to tell me in strange confusion, how a man looked who that very day was to face such an exceptional fate. I smiled and reflected that it was indeed a day of crisis, and promised him that I would soon drink a glass with him. At the Stadthamburg Inn of the excellent wine he had recommended to me with so much agitation, no subsequent experience of mine can be compared with the sensations which marked the day of the first production of Rienzi. At all the first performances of my works in later days, I have been so absorbed by an only too well-founded anxiety as to their success, that I could neither enjoy the opera nor form many real estimate of its reception by the public. As for my subsequent experiences at the general rehearsal of Tristan under Solden, this took place under such exceptional circumstances, and its effect upon me differed so fundamentally from that produced by the first performance of Rienzi, that no comparison can possibly be drawn between the two. The immediate success of Rienzi was no doubt assured beforehand, but the emphatic way in which the audience declared their appreciation was thus far exceptional that in cities like Dresden the spectators are never in a position to decide conclusively upon a work of importance on the first night, and consequently assume an attitude of chilling restraint towards the works of unknown authors. But this was in the nature of things. An exceptional case, for the numerous staff of the theatre and the body of musicians had inundated the city beforehand with such glowing reports of my opera that the whole population awaited the promised miracle in feverish expectation. I sat with Minna, my sister Clara, and the Hind family in a pit box, and when I tried to recall my condition during that evening, I can only picture it with all the paraphernalia of a dream, of real pleasure or agitation I felt none at all. I seemed to stand quite aloof from my work, whereas the sight of the thickly crowded auditorium agitated me so much that I was unable even to glance at the body of the audience, whose presence merely affected me like some natural phenomenon shinding like a continuous downpour of rain from which I sought shelter in the farthest corner of my box as under a protecting roof. I was quite unconscious of applause, and when at the end of the acts I was tempestuously called for, I had every time to be forcibly reminded by Hein and driven on to the stage. On the other hand, one great anxiety filled me with growing alarm. I noticed that the first two acts had taken as long as the whole of Freischist. For instance, on account of its warlike calls to arms, the third act begins with an exceptional uproar, and when at its close the clock pointed to ten, which meant that the performance had already lasted full four hours, I became perfectly desperate. 
The fact that after this act also I was again loudly called I regarded merely as a final courtesy on the part of the audience, who wished to signify that they had had quite enough for one evening and would now leave the house in a body, as we had still two acts before us, I thought it settled that we should not be able to finish the piece and apologist for my lack of wisdom in not having previously effected the necessary curtailments. Now, thanks to my folly, I found myself in the underhoff predicament of being unable to finish an opera, otherwise extremely well received, simply because it was absurdly long. I could only explain the undiminished zeal of the singers, and particularly of Tichikst, who seemed to grow lustier and cheerier the longer it lasted, as an amiable trick to conceal from me the inevitable catastrophe, but my astonishment at finding the audience still there in full muster, even in the last act it wards midnight filled me with unbounded perplexity, I could no longer trust my eyes or ears, and regarded the whole events of the evening as a nightmare. It was past midnight when, for the last time, I had to obey the thunderous calls of the audience, side by side with my trusty singers. My feeling of desperation at the unparalleled length of my opera was augmented by the temper of my relatives, whom I saw for a short time after the performance. Friedrich Brockhaus and his family had come over with some friends from Leipzig and had invited us to the inn, hoping to celebrate an agreeable success over a pleasant supper and possibly to drink my health, but on arriving kitchen and cellar were closed, and every one was so worn out that nothing was to be heard but outcries at the unparalleled case of an opera lasting from six o'clock till past twelve. No further remarks were exchanged, and we stole away feeling quite stupefied. About eight the next morning I put in an appearance at the clerk's office, in order that in case there should be a second performance I might arrange the necessary curtailment of the parts. If, during the previous summer, I had contested every beat with the faithful course Mr. Fisher and proved them all to be indispensable, I was now possessed by a blind rage for striking out. There was not a single part of my score which seemed any longer in a ceaseferish the audience had been made to swallow the previous evening now appeared but a chaos of sheer impossibilities, each and all of which might be omitted without the slightest damage or risk of being unintelligible. My one thought now was how to reduce my convolution of monstrosities to decent limits. By dint of unsparing and ruthless abbreviations handed over to the copyist, I hoped to avert a catastrophe, for I expected nothing less than that the general manager, together with the city and the theatre, would that very day give me to understand that such a thing as the performance of my last of the tribunes might perhaps be permitted once as a curiosity, but not oftener. All day long, therefore, I carefully avoided going near the theatre, so as to give time for my heroic abbreviations to do their salutary work, and for news of them to spread through the city, but at midday I looked in again upon the copyists, to assure myself that all had been duly performed as I had ordered. I then learned that Tichikst had also been there, and, after inspecting the omissions that I had arranged, had forbidden their being carried out. Fisher, the course mister, also wished to speak to me about them. Work was suspended, and I foresaw great confusion. I could not understand what it all meant, and feared mischief if the arduous task were delayed. At length, towards evening, I sought out Tichikst at the theatre. Without giving him a chance to speak, I brusquely asked him why he had interrupted the copyist's work. In a half-choked voice, he curtly and defiantly rejoined, I will have none of my part cut out, it is too heavenly. I stared at him blankly, and then felt as though I had been suddenly bewitched. Such an underhoff testimony to my success could not but shake me out of my strange anxiety. Others joined him, Fisher radiant with delight and bubbling with laughter. Every one spoke of the enthusiastic emotion which thrilled the whole city. Next came a letter of thanks from the commissioner acknowledging my splendid work. 
Nothing now remained for me but to embrace Ditch Extent Fisher and go on my way to inform Minna and Clara Helm Atters stood after a few days' rest for the actors. The second performance took place on 22nd October, but with various curtailments, for which I had great difficulty in obtaining Tichix's consent, although it was still of much more than average length. I heard no particular complaints, and at last adopted Tichix's view that, if he could stand it, so could the audience. For six performances, therefore, all of which continued to receive a similar avalanche of applause, I let the matter run its course. My opera, however, had also excited interest among the elder princesses of the royal family. They thought its exhausting length a drawback, but were nevertheless unwilling to miss any of it. Latakau consequently proposed that I should give the piece at full length, but half of it at a time on to successive evenings. This suited me very well, and after an interval of a few weeks we announced Strenzi's greatness for the first day, and his fall for the second. The first evening we gave two acts, and on the second three, and for the latter I composed a special introductory prelude. This met with the entire approval of our August patrons, and especially of the two eldest princesses, Amelie and Augusta. The public, on the contrary, simply regarded this in the light of now being asked to pay two entrance fees for one opera, and pronounced the new arrangement a decided fraud. Its annoyance at the change was so great that it actually threatened to be fatal to the attendance, and after three performances of the divided Renzi, the management was obliged to go back to the old arrangement, which I willingly made possible by introducing my cuttings again. From this time forward the piece used to fill the house to overflowing as often as it could be presented, and the permanence of its success became still more obvious when I began to realize the envy it drew upon me from many different quarters. My first experience of this was truly painful, and came from the hands of the poet. Julius Mosen, on the very day after the first performance, when I first reached Dresden in the summer I had sought him out, and, having a really high opinion of his talent, our intercourse soon became more intimate and was the means of giving me much pleasure and instruction. He had shown me a volume of his plays, which on the whole appealed to me exceptionally. Among these was a tragedy, Colorinzi, dealing with the same subject as my opera, and in a manner partly new to me and which I thought effective. With reference to this poem, I had begged him to take no notice of my libretto, as in the quality of its poetry it could not possibly bear comparison with his own, and it cost him little sacrifice to grant the request. It happened that just before the first performance of my Renzi, he had produced in Dresden Bernhard von Weimar, one of his least happy pieces, the result of which had brought him little pleasure. Dramatically, it was a thing with no life in it, aiming only at political harangue, and had shared the inevitable fate of all such aberrations. He had therefore awaited the appearance of my Renzi with some vexation, and confessed to me his bitter chagrin at not being able to procure the acceptance of his tragedy of the same name in Dresden. This, he presumed, arose from its somewhat pronounced political tendency which, certainly in a spoken play on a similar subject, would be more noticeable than in an opera, where from the very start no one pays any heed to the words. I had genially confirmed him in this depreciation of the subject matter in opera, and was therefore the more startled when, on finding him at my sister Louise's the day after the first performance, he straightway overwhelmed me with a scornful outburst of irritation at my success but he found in me a strange sense of the essential unreality in opry of such a subject as that which I had just illustrated with so much success in Renzi, so that, oppressed by a secret sense of shame, I had no serious rejoinder to offer to his candidly poisonous abuse. My line of defense was not yet sufficiently clear in my own mind to be available offhand nor was it yet backed by so obvious a product of my own peculiar genius that I could venture to quote it. 
Moreover, my first impulse was only one of pity for the unlucky playwright, which I felt all the more constrained to express, because his burst of fury gave me the inward satisfaction of knowing that he recognized my great success, of which I was not yet quite clear myself, but this first performance of Renzi did far more than this. It gave occasion for controversy and made an ever widened breach between myself and the newspaper critics. Herr Karl Bank, who for some time had been the chief musical critic in Dresden, had been known to me before at Magdeburg, where he once visited me and listened with delight to my playing of several fairly long passages from my Liebesbofter. When we met again in Dresden, this man could not forgive me for having been unable to procure him tickets for the first performance of Rienzi. The same thing happened with a certain Herr Julius Schladebach, who likewise settled in Dresden about that time as a critic. Though I was always anxious to be gracious to everybody, yet I felt just then an invincible repugnance for showing special deference to any man because he was a critic. As time went on, I carried this rule to the point of almost systematic crudeness, and was consequently all my life through the victim of unprecedented persecution from the press. As yet, however, this ill will had not become pronounced, for at that time journalism had not begun to give itself airs in Dresden. There were so few contributions sent from there to the outside press that our artistic doings excited very little note as elsewhere a fact which was certainly not without its disadvantages for me. Thus, for the present, the unpleasant side of my success scarcely affected me at all, and for a brief space I felt myself, for the first and only time in my life, so pleasantly borne along on the breath of general goodwill, that all my former troubles seemed amply requited, for further and quite unexpected fruits of my success now appeared with astonishing rapidity though not so much in the form of material profit, which for the present resolved itself into nine hundred marks, paid me by the general board as an exceptional fee instead of the usual twenty gold on Lewis, nor did I dare to cherish the hope of selling my work at Vadingeshi to a publisher until it had been performed in some other important towns. But fate willed it that by the sudden death of Rostrelli, Royal Director of Music, which occurred shortly after the first production of Rienzi, an office should unexpectedly become vacant, for the filling of which all eyes at once turned to me. While the negotiations over this matter were slowly proceeding, the General Board gave proof in another direction of an almost passionate interest in my talents. They insisted that the first performance of the fly in her hall and her should on no account be conceded to the Berlin Opera but reserved as an hunter for Dresden. As the Berlin authorities raised no obstacle, I very gladly handed over my latest work also to the Dresden theatre, if in this I had to dispense with Tichix's assistance, as there was no leading tenor part in the play. I could count all the more surely on the helpful cooperation of Schroeder Verden, to whom a worthier task was assigned in the leading female part than that which she had had in Rienzi, I was glad to be able thus to rely entirely upon her, as she had grown strangely out of humor with me, owing to her scanty share in the success of Rienzi. The completeness of my faith in her I proved with an exaggeration by no means advantageous to my own work. By simply forcing the leading male part on Walker, a once capable but now somewhat delicate baritone, he was in every respect wholly unsuited to the task, and only accepted it with unfeigned hesitation. On submitting my play to my adored prima donna, I was much relieved to find that its poetry made a special appeal to her, thanks to the genuine personal interest awakened in me under very peculiar circumstances by the character and fate of this exceptional woman. Our study of the part of Senta which often brought us into close contact, became one of the most thrilling and momentously instructive periods of my life. It is true that the great actress, especially when under the influence of her famous mother, Sophie Schroeder, who was just then with her on a visit, 
showed undisguised vexation at my having composed so brilliant a work as Rienzi for Dresden without having specifically reserved the principal part for her. Yet the magnanimity of her disposition triumphed even over this selfish impulse. She loudly proclaimed me a genius, and honored me with that special confidence which, she said, none but a genius should enjoy. But when she invited me to become both the accomplice and adviser in her really dreadful love affairs, this confidence certainly began to have its risky side. Nevertheless, there were at first occasions on which she openly proclaimed herself before all the world as my friend, making most flattering distinctions in my favour. First of all, I had to accompany her on a trip to Leipzig, where she was giving a concert for her mother's benefit, which she thought to make particularly attractive by including in its program to selections from Re in Shy Aria of Adriano and the Hero's Prayer, the latter sung by Tichikst, and both under my personal conductorship. Mendelssohn, who was also on very friendly terms with her, had been enticed to this concert to and produced his overture to Rui Blas. Then quite new, it was during the too busy days spent on this occasion in Leipzig that I first came into close contact with him, all my previous knowledge of him having been limited to a few rare and altogether profitals as visits. At the house of my brotherly Na, Fritz Brockhaus, he and Devriant gave us a good deal of music, he playing her accompaniment to a number of Schubert's songs, I here became conscious of the peculiar unrest and excitement with which this master of music, who, though still young, had already reached the zenith of his fame and life's work, observed or rather watched me. I could see clearly that he thought but little of a success in opera, and that merely in Dresden. Doubtless I seemed in his eyes one of a class of musicians to whom he attached no value and with whom he proposed to have no intercourse. Nevertheless, my success had certain characteristic features, which gave it a more or less alarming aspect. Mendelssohn's most ardent desire for a long time past had been to write a successful opera, and it was possible he now felt annoyed that, before he had succeeded in doing so, a triumph of this nature should suddenly be thrust into his face with blunt brutality, and based upon a style of music which he might feel justified in regarding as poor, he probably found it no less exasperating that Devriant, whose gifts he acknowledged, and who was his own devoted admirer, should now so openly and loudly sound my praises. These thoughts were dimly shaping themselves in my mind, when Mendelssohn, by a very remarkable statement, drove me almost with violence, to adopt this interpretation, on our way home together, after the joint concert rehearsal, I was talking very warmly on the subject of music, although by no means a talkative man. He suddenly interrupted me with curiously hasty excitement by the assertion that music had but one great fault, namely, that more than any other art it stimulated not only our good, but also our evil qualities, such, for instance, as jealousy, I blushed with shame to have to apply this speech to his own feelings towards me, for I was profoundly conscious of my innocence of ever having dreamed, even in the remotest degree, of placing my own talents or performances as a musician in comparison with his. Yet, strange to say, at this very concert he showed himself in a light by no means calculated to place him beyond all possibility of comparison with myself. A rendering of his Hebrides overture would have placed him so immeasurably above my two operatic airs, that all shyness at having to stand beside him would have been spared me, as the gulf between our two productions was impassable, but in his choice of the Rui Blas overture he appears to have been prompted by a desire to place himself on this occasion so close to the operatic style that its effectiveness might be reflected upon his own work. The overture was evidently calculated for a Parisian audience, and the astonishment Mendelssohn caused by appearing in such a connection was shown by Robert Schumann in his own ungainly fashion at its close. 
approaching the musician in the orchestra, he blandly, and with a genial smile, expressed his admiration of the brilliant orchestral piece just played. But in the interests of veracity, let me not forget that neither he nor I scored the real success of that evening. We were both wholly eclipsed by the tremendous effect produced by the gray hydra Sophie Schroeder in a recitation of Berger's Lenore. While the daughter had been taunted in the newspapers with unfairly employing all sorts of musical attractions to cozen a benefit concert out of the music lovers of Leipzig for a mother who never had anything to do with that art, we, who were there as her musical aiders and abettors, had to stand like so many idle conjurers, or, while this aged and almost toothless dame declaimed Berger's poem with truly terrifying beauty and grandeur. This episode, like so much else that I saw during these few days, gave me abundant food for thought and meditation. A second excursion, also undertaken with Devriant, took me in the December of that year to Berlin, where the singer had been invited to appear at a grand state concert. I for my part wanted an interview with director Kustner about the fly and her Hollander. Although I arrived at no definite result regarding my own personal business, this short visit to Berlin was memorable for my meeting with Franz Liszt, which afterwards proved of great importance. It took place under singular circumstances, which placed both him and me in a situation of peculiar embarrassment, brought about in the most wanton fashion by Devriant's exasperating caprice. I had already told my patroness the story of my earlier meeting with Liszt during that fateful second winter of my stay in Paris, when I had at last been driven to be grateful for Schlesinger's hackwork. I one day received word from Laub, who always bore me in mind, that F. Liszt was coming to Paris. He had mentioned and recommended me to him when he was in Germany, and advised me to lose no time in looking him up as he was generous, and would certainly find means of helping me. As soon as I heard that he had really arrived, I presented myself at the hotel to see him. It was early in the morning. On my entrance I found several strange gentlemen waiting in the drug room, where, after some time, we were joined by List himself, pleasant and affable, and wearing his indoor coat. The conversation was carried on in French, and turned upon his experiences during his last professional journey in Hungary. As I was unable to take part, on account of the language, I listened for some time, feeling heartily bored, until at last he asked me pleasantly what he could do for me. He seemed unable to recall Laubey's recommendation, and all the answer I could give was that I desired to make his acquaintance. To this he had evidently no objection and informed me he would take care to have a ticket sent me for his great matinee, which was to take place shortly. My sole attempt to introduce an artistic theme of conversation was a question as to whether he knew Lowe's or Klingage as well as Schubert's. His reply in the negative frustrated this somewhat awkward attempt, and I ended my visit by giving him my address. Thither his secretary, Baloney, presently sent me, with a few polite words, a card of admission to a concert to be given entirely by the master himself in the sale errored, I duly wended my way to the overcrowded hall, and betled the platform on which the grand piano stood, closely beleaguered by the cream of Parisian female society, and witnessed their enthusiastic ovations of this virtuoso, who was at that time the wonder of the world. Moreover, I heard several of his most brilliant pieces, such as variations on Robert Lediable, but carried away with me no real impression beyond that of being stunned. This took place just at the time when I abandoned a path which had been contrary to my truer nature, and had led me astray, and on which I now emphatically turned my back in silent bitterness. I was therefore in no fitting mood for a just appreciation of this prodigy who at that time was shining in the blazing light of day, but from whom I had turned my face to the night. I went to see List no more. As already mentioned, I had given to Evriant a bare outline of this story, 
but she had noted it with particular attention, for I happened to have touched her weak point of professional jealousy, as Liszt had also been commanded by the King of Prussia to appear at the Grand State Concert at Berlin. It so happened that the first time they met Liszt questioned her with great interest about the success of Rienzi. She thereupon observed that the composer of that opera was an altogether unknown man, and proceeded with curious malice to taunt him with his apparent lack of penetration, as proved by the fact that the said composer, who now so keenly excited his interest, was the very same poor musician whom he had lately turned away so contemptuously in Paris. All this she told me with an air of triumph, which distressed me very much, and I at once set to work to correct the false impression conveyed by my former account. As we were still debating this point in her room, we were startled by hearing from the next the famous bass part in the revenge air from Don Anna, rapidly executed in octaves on the piano. That's Liszt himself, she cried. Liszt then entered the room to fetch her for the rehearsal. To my great embarrassment she introduced me to him with malicious delight as the composer of Rienzi, the man whose acquaintance he now wished to make after having previously shown him the door in his glorious Paris. My solemn asseverations that my patroness no doubt only in fun was deliberately distorting my account of my former visit to him, apparently pacified him so far as I was concerned, and, on the other hand, he had no doubt already formed his own opinion of the impulsive singer. He certainly regretted that he could not remember my visit in Paris, but it nevertheless shocked and alarmed him to learn that any one should have had reason to complain of such treatment at his hands. The hearty sincerity of Liszt's simple words to me about this misunderstanding, as contrasted with the strangely passionate trailery of the incorrigible lady, made a most pleasing and captivating impression upon me. The whole bearing of the man and the way in which he tried to ward off the pitiless scorn of her attacks was something new to me, and gave me a deep insight into his character, so firm in its amiability and boundless good air. Finally, she teased him about the doctor's degree which had just been conferred on him by the University of Königsberg, and pretended to mistake him for a chemist. At last he stretched himself out flat on the floor, and implored her mercy, declaring himself quite defenseless against the storm of her invective then turning to me with a hearty assurance that he would make it his business to hear Rienzi, and would in any case endeavour to give me a better opinion of himself than his evil star had hitherto permitted, we parted for that occasion. The almost naive simplicity and natural ends of his every phrase and word, and particularly his emphatic manner, left a most profound impression upon me. No one could fail to be equally affected by these qualities, and I now realized for the first time the almost magic power exerted by Liszt over all who came in close contact with him, and saw how erroneous had been my former opinion as to its cause. These two excursions to Leipzig and Berlin found but brief interruptions of the period devoted at home to our study of the fly and her Hollander. It was therefore of paramount importance to me to maintain Schroeder Witteren's keen interest in her part, since, in view of the weakness of the rest of the cast, I was convinced that it was from her alone I could expect any adequate interpretation of the spirit of my work. The part of Senta was essentially suited to her, and there were just at that moment peculiar circumstances in her life which brought her naturally emotional temperament to a high pitch of tension. I was amazed when she confided to me that she was on the point of breaking off a regular liaison of many years standing, to form in passionate haste another much less desirable one. The forsaken lover, who was tenderly devoted to her, was a young lieutenant in the Royal Guards, and the son of Muller, the ex minciter of education, her new choice, whose acquaintance she had formed on a recent visit to Berlin, was Herr von Munchausen. He was a tall, slim young man, and her predilection for him was easily explained when I became more closely acquainted with her love affairs. 
it seemed to me that the best of all of her confidence on me in this matter arose from her guilty conscience. She was aware that Muller, whom I liked on account of his excellent disposition, had loved her with the earnestness of a first love, and also that she was now betraying him in the most faithless way on a trivial pretext. She must have known that her new lover was entirely unworthy of her, and that his intentions were frivolous and selfish. She knew, too, that no one, and certainly none of her older friends who knew her best, would approve of her behavior. She told me candidly that she had felt impelled to confide in me because I was a genius, and would understand the demands of her temperament. I hardly knew what to think. I was repelled alike by her passion and the circumstances attending it. But to my astonishment I had to confess that the infatuation so repulsive to me, held this strange woman in so powerful a grasp that I could not refuse her a certain amount of pity, nay, even real sympathy. She was pale and distraught, ate hardly anything, and her faculties were subjected to a strain so extraordinary that I thought she would not escape a serious, perhaps a fatal illness. Sleep had long since deserted her, and whenever I brought her my unlucky fly and her hollander, her looks so alarmed me that the proposed rehearsal was the last thing I thought of. But in this matter she insisted she made me sit down at the piano, and then plunged into the study of her role as if it were a matter of life and death. She found the actual learning of the part very difficult and it was only by repeated and persevering rehearsal that she mastered her task. She would sing for hours at a time with such passion that I often sprang up in terror and begged her to spare herself. Then she would point smiling to her chest and expand the muscles of her still magnificent person to assure me that she was doing herself no harm. Her voice really acquired at that time a youthful freshness and power of endurance. I had to confess that which often astonished me. This infatuation for an insight nobody was very much to the advantage of my sentence. Her cur under this intense strain was so great that, as time pressed, she consented to have the general rehearsal on the very day of the first performance, and a delay which would have been greatly to my disadvantage was thus avoided. The performance took place on 2nd January, in the year 1840. Her its result was extremely instructive to me, and led to the turntrignut of my career. The illvices of the performance taught me how much care and forethought were essential to secure the adequate dramatic interpretation of my latest works. I realized that I had more or less believed that my score would explain itself, and that my singers would arrive at the right interpretation of their own accord. My good old friend walked her, who at the time of Henriette's Antig's first success was a Favurite barber of Seville, had from the first discreetly thought otherwise. Unfortunately, even Schroeder Verdon only saw when the rehearsals were too far advanced how utterly incapable Walker was of realizing the horror and supreme suffering of my mariner. His distressing corpulence, his broad fat face, the extraordinary movements of his arms and legs, which he managed to make look like mere stumps, drove my passionate scented to despair. At one rehearsal, when in the great scene in Act T, she comes to him in the guise of a guardy, an angel, to bring the message of salvation. She broke off to whisper despairingly in my ear, How can I say it when I look into those beady eyes? Good God, Wagner, what a muddle you have made. I consoled her as well as I could, and secretly placed my dependence on Herr von Munchausen, who promised faithfully to sit that evening in the front row of the stalls, so that Devrian's sighs must fall on him, and the magnificent performance of my great artist, although she stood horribly alone on the stage, did succeed in rousing enthusiasm in the second act. The first act offered the audience nothing but a dull conversation between Herr Walker and the Herr Riss who had invited me to an excellent glass of wine on the first night of Rienzi, and in the third the loud estraging of the orchestra did not rouse the sea from its dead calm nor the phantom ship in its cautious rocking. 
the audience fell to wondering how I could have produced this crude, me gray, and gloomy work after Reemsey, in every act of which incident abounded, and Tichix shone in an endless variety of costumes, as Schroeder Verd soon left Dresden for a considerable time. The fly and her Hollander saw only four performances, at which the diminishing audiences made it plain that I had not pleased Dresden taste with it. The management was compelled to revive Reemsey in order to maintain my prestige, and the triumph of this opera compared with the failure of the Dutchman gave me food for reflection. I had to admit, with some misgivings, that the success of my Reemsey was not entirely due to the cast and staging. Although I was fully alive to the defects from which the fly and her hall and her suffered in this respect, although Walker was far from realizing my conception of the fly and her hall and her I could not conceal from myself the fact that Tichixt was quite as far removed from the ideal Reemsey. His abominable errors and deficiencies in his presentation of the part had never escaped me. He had never been able to lay aside his brilliant and heroic lead in Tigger manners in order to render that gloomy demonic strain in Reemsey's temperament on which I had laid unmistakable stress at the critical points of the drama. In the fourth act, after the pronouncement of the curse, he fell on his knees in the most melancholy fashion and abandoned himself to bewailing his fate in piteous tones. When I suggested to him that Reemsey, though inwardly despairing, must take up an attitude of statuesque firmness before the world. He pointed out to me the great popularity which the end of this very act had won as interpreted by himself, with an intimation that he intended making no change in it, and when I considered the real causes of the success of Reemsey, I found that it rested on the brilliant and extraordinarily fresh voice of the soaring, happy singer, in the refreshing effect of the chorus and the gay movement and coloring on the stage. I received a still more convincing proof of this when we divided the opera into two, and found that the second part, which was the more important from both the dramatic and the musical point of view, was noticeably less well attended than the first, for the very obvious reason, as I thought, that the ballet occurred in the first part. My brother Julius, who had come over from Leipzig for one of the performances of Rienzi, gave me a still more naive testimony as to the real point of interest in the opera. I was sitting with him in an open box, in full sight of the audience, and had therefore begged him to desist from giving any applause, even if directed only to the efforts of the singers. He restrained himself all through the evening, but his enthusiasm at a certain figure of the ballet was too much for him, and he clapped loudly to the great amusement of the audience, telling me that he could not hold himself in any longer. Curiously enough, this same ballet secured for Rienzi, which was otherwise received with indifference, the enduring preference of the present King of Prussia. Footnote William I, who many years afterwards ordered the revival of this opera although it had utterly failed in arousing public interest by its merits as a drama, I found, when I had to be present later on at a representation of the same opera at Darmstadt, that while wholesale cuts had to be made in its best parts, it had been found necessary to expand the ballets by additions and repetitions. This ballet music, which I had put together with contemptuous haste at Riga in a few days without any inspiration, seemed to me, moreover, so strikingly weak that I was thoroughly ashamed of it even in those days at Dresden, when I had found myself compelled to suppress its best feature, the tragic pantomime. Further, the resources of the ballet in Dresden did not even admit of the execution of my stage directions for the combat in the arena, nor for the very significant round dances both admirably carried out at a later date in Berlin, I had to be content with the humiliating substitution of a long, foolish step dance by two insignificant dancers, which was ended by a company of soldiers marching on, bearing their shields on high so as to form a roof and remind the audience of the Roman testude so, then the ballamators with his assistant in Fleskelhord tights, 
leapt on to the shields and turned somersaults, a proceeding which they thought was reminiscent of the gladiat aerial games. It was at this point that the house was always moved to resounding applause, and I had to own that this moment marked the climax of my success. I thus had my doubts as to the intrinsic divergence between my inner aims and my outward success. At the same time a decisive and fatal change in my fortunes was brought about by my acceptance of the conductorship at Dresden, under circumstances as perplexing in their way as those preceding my marriage. I had met the negotiations which led up to this appointment with a hesitation and a coolness by no means affected. I felt nothing but scorn for theatrical life, a scorn that was by no means lessened by a closer acquaintance with the apparently distinguished ruling body of a court theatre, the splendors of which only conceal, with arrogant ignorance, the humiliating conditions appertaining to it and to the modern theatre in general. I saw every noble impulse stifled in those occupied with theatrical matters, and a combination of the vainest and most frivolous interests maintained by a ridiculously rigid and bureaucratic system, I was now fully convinced that the necessity of handling the business of the theatre would be the most distasteful thing I could imagine. Now that, through Rastrelli's death, the temptation to be false to my inner conviction came to me in Dresden, I explained to my old and trusted friends that I did not think I should accept the vacant post, but everything calculated to shake human resolution combined against this decision. The prospect of securing the means of livelihood through a permanent position with a fixed salary was an irresistible attraction. I combated the temptation by reminding myself of my success as an operatic composer, which might reasonably be expected to bring in enough to supply my moderate requirements in a lodging of two rooms, where I could proceed undisturbed with fresh compositions. I was told in answer to this that my work itself would be better served by a fixed position without arduous duties. As for a whole year since the completion of the fly and her hollander, I had not, under existing circumstances, found any leisure at all for composition, I still remained convinced that Rastrelli's post of musical director, in subordination to the conductor, was unworthy of me, and I declined to entertain the proposal, thus leaving the management to look elsewhere for someone to fill the vacancy. There was therefore no further question of this particular post, but I was then informed that the death of Morlachi had left vacant a court conductorship and it was thought that the king would be willing to offer me the post. My wife was very much excited at this prospect, for in Germany the greatest value is laid on these court appointments, which are tenable for life, and the dazzling respectability pertaining to them is held out to German musicians as the acme of earthly happiness. The offer opened up for us in many directions the prospect of friendly relations in a society which had hitherto been outside our experience. Domestic comfort and social prestige were very alluring to the homeless wanderers who, in bygone days of misery, had often longed for the comfort and security of an assured and permanent position such as was now open to them under the august protection of the court. The influence of Caroline von Weber did much in the long run to weaken my opposition. I was often at her house, and took great pleasure in her society, which brought back to my mind very vividly the personality of my still dearly beloved master. She begged me with really touching tenderness not to withstand this obvious command of fate, and asserted her right to ask me to settle in Dresden to fill the place left sadly empty by her husband's death. Just think, she said, how can I look Weber in the face again when I join him if I have to tell him that the work for which he made such devoted sacrifices in Dresden is neglected? Just imagine my feelings when I see that indolent Reisiger stand in my noble Weber's place, and when I hear his operas produced more mechanically every year. If you loved Weber, you owe it to his memory to step into his place and to continue his work. 
As an experienced woman of the world, she also pointed out energetically and prudently the practical side of the matter, impressing on me the duty of thinking of my wife, who would, in case of my death, be sufficiently provided for if I accepted the post, the promptings of affection, prudence, and good sense, however, had less weight with me than the enthusiastic conviction, never at any period of my life entirely destroyed, that wherever fate laid me, whether to Dresden or elsewhere, I should find the opportunity which would convert my dreams into reality through currents set in motion by some change in the everyday order of events. All that was needed for this was the advent of an ardent and aspiring soul who, with good luck to back him, might make up for lost time, and by his ennobling influence achieve the deliverance of art from her shameful bonds. The wonderful and rapid change which had taken place in my fortunes could not fail to encourage such a hope, and I was seduced on perceiving the marked alteration that had taken place in the whole attitude of Lutakow, the general director, towards me. This strange individual showed me a kindlines of which no one would hitherto have thought him capable, and that he was prompted by a genuine feeling of personal benevolence towards me I could not help being absolutely convinced, even at the time of my subsequent ceaseless differences with him. Nevertheless, the decision came as a kind of surprise. On 2 February 1840 her I was very politely invited to the director's office, and there met the general staff of the Royal Orchestra, in whose presence let a cow through the medium of my nevator bogrant friend Winkler, solemnly read out to me a royal rescript appointing me forth with conductor to his majesty, with a life salary of 4,500 marks a year. Let a cow followed the reading of this document by a more or less ceremonious speech, in which he assumed that I should gratefully accept the king's favour. At this polite ceremony it did not escape my notice that all possibility of future negotiations over the figure of the salary was cut off. On the other hand, a substantial exemption in my favour, the omission of the condition enforced Stephen on Weber in his time, of serving a year's probation under the title of mere musical director, was calculated to secure my unconditional acceptance. My new colleagues congratulated me, and Lutakow accompanied me with the politest phrases to my own door, where I fell into the arms of my poor wife, who was giddy with delight. Therefore I fully realized that I must put the best face I could on the matter, and unless I wished to give Enderhoff offense, I must even congratulate myself on my appointment as royal conductor, a few days after taking the oath as a servant of the king in solemn session, and undergoing the ceremony of presentation to the assembled orchestra by means of an enthusiastic speech from the general director, I was summoned to an audience with his majesty, when I saw the features of the kind, courteous, and homely monarch, I involuntarily thought of my youthful attempt at a political overture on the theme of freed recund freiheit, our somewhat embarrassed conversation brightened with the king's expression of his satisfaction with those two of my operas which had been performed in Dresden. He expressed with polite hesitation his feeling that if my operas left anything to be desired, it was a clearer definition of the various characters in my musical dramas. He thought the interest in the persons was overpowered by the elemental forces figuring beside theme in Heinze the mob, in the fly and her hall under the sea, I thought I understood his meaning perfectly, and this proof of his sincere sympathy and original judgment pleased me very much. He also made his excuses in advance for a possible rare attendance at my operas on his part. His sole reason for this being that he had a peculiar aversion from Thetragang, as the result of one of the rules of his early training, under which he and his brother John who had acquired a similar aversion, were for a long time compelled regularly to attend the theatre, when he, to tell the truth, would often have preferred to be left alone to follow his own pursuits independent of etiquette. As a characteristic instance of the courtier spirit, 
I afterwards learned that Lutakow, who had had to wait for me in the anteroom during this audience, had been very much put out by its long duration. In the whole course of my life I was only admitted twice more to personal intercourse and speech with the good king. The first occasion was when I presented him with the dedication copy of the P.N.O. Fort's Corps of my Rienzi, and the second was after my very successful arrangement and performance of the Iphigenia in Aulis, by Gluck, of whose operas he was particularly fond. When he stopped me in the public promenade and congratulated me on my work, that first audience with the king marked the zenith of my hastily adopted career at Dresden. Thenceforward anxiety reasserted itself in manifold ways. I very quickly realized the difficulties of my material situation, since it soon became evident that the advantage won by new exertions and my present appointment bore no proportion to the heavy sacrifices and obligations which I incurred as soon as I entered on an independent career. The young musical director of Riga, long since forgotten, suddenly reappeared in an astonishing reincarnation as royal conductor to the king of Saxony. The first of fruits of the universal estimate of my good fortune took the shape of pressing creditors and threats of prosecution. Next followed demands from the Königsberg tradesmen, from whom I had escaped from Riga by means of that horribly wretched and miserable flight. I also heard from people in the most distant parts, who thought they had some claim on me, dating even from my student, nay, my school days, until at last I cried out in my astonishment that I expected to receive a bill next from the nurse who had suckled me. All this did not amount to any very large sum, and I merely mention it because of the illgeniter rumors which, I learned years later, had been spread abroad about the extent of my debts at that time. Out of three thousand marks, borrowed at interest from Schroeder Verden, I not only paid these debts, but also fully compensated the sacrifices which Keats had made on my behalf, without ever expecting any return in the days of my poverty in Paris. I was, moreover, able to be of practical use to him, but where was I to find even this sum? As my distress had hitherto been so great that I was obliged to urge Schroeder Verden to hurry on the rehearsals of the Flyander Hollander by pointing out to her the enormous importance to me of the fee for the performance, I had no allowance for the expenses of my establishment in Dresden, though it had to be suitable for my position as royal conductor, nor even for the purchase of a ridiculous and expensive court uniform so that there would have been no possibility of my making a start at all, as I had no private means, unless I borrowed money at interest. But no one who knew of the extraordinary success of Rienzi at Dresden could help believing in an immediate and remunerative rage for my operas on the German stage. My own relatives, even the prudent Ottilie, were so convinced of it that they thought I might safely count on at least doubling my salary by the receipts from my operas. At the very beginning the prospects did indeed seem bright. The score of my fly and her hollander was ordered by the Royal Theatre at Castle and by the Riga Theatre, which I had known so well in the old days, because they were anxious to perform something of mine at an early date, and had heard that this opera was on a smaller scale, and made smaller demands on the stage management. Then Rienzi, in May 1840 her I heard good reports of the success of the performances from both those places. But this was all for the time being, and a whole year went by without the smallest inquiry for any of my scores. An attempt was made to secure me some benefit by the publication of the P. N. O. Fort's Corps of the Fly and her Hollander, as I wanted to reserve Rienzi, after the successes it had gained, as useful capital for a more favorable opportunity, but the plan was spoiled by the opposition of Messrs. Hartel of Leipzig, who, although ready enough to publish my opera, would only do so on the condition that I abstained from asking any payment for it. So I had, for the present, to content myself with the moral satisfaction of my successes, 
of which my unmistakable popularity with the Dresden public, and the respect and attention paid to me, formed part. But even in this respect my utopia and reams were destined to be disturbed. I think that my appearance at Dresden marked the beginning of a new era in journalism and criticism, which found food for its hitherto but slightly developed vitality in its vexation at my success. The two gentlemen I have already mentioned, C. Bank and J. Schladebach, had, as I now know, first taken up their regular abode in Dresden at that time. I know that when difficulties were raised about the permanence of Bank's appointment, they were waived owing to the testimonials and recommendation of my present colleague Greisiger. The success of my Rienzi had been the source of great annoyance to these gentlemen, who were now established as musical critics to the Dresden press, because I made no effort to win their favour. They were not ill-placed, therefore, to find an opportunity of pouring out the vitriol of their hatred over the universally popular young musician who had won the sympathy of the kindly public, partly on account of the poverty and ill look which had hitherto been his lot. The need for any kind of human consideration had suddenly vanished with my and Derhoff appointment to the royal conductorship. Now all was well with me to well, in fact, and envy found its congenial food, this provided a perfectly clear and comprehensible point of attack, and soon there spread through the German press, in the columns given to Dresden News, an estimate of me which has never fundamentally changed, except in one point to this day, this single modification, which was purely temporary and confined to papers of one political color, occurred on my first settlement as a political refugee in Switzerland but lasted only until, through Liszt's exertions, my operas began to be produced all over Germany. In spite of my exile, the orders from two theaters, immediately after the Dresden performance, for one of my scores, were merely due to the fact that up to that time the activity of my journalistic critics was still limited. I put down the cessation of all inquiries, certainly not without due justification, mainly to the effect of the false and calumnious reports in the papers. My old friend Lobb tried, indeed, to undertake my defense in the press. On New Year's Day, 1840, her he resumed the editorship of the Zeitung für die Elegant Welt, and asked me to provide him with a biographical notice of myself for the first number. It evidently gave him great pleasure to present me thus in triumph to the literary world, and in order to give the subject more prominence he added a supplement to that number in the shape of a lithograph reproduction of my portrait by Keats. But after a time even he became anxious and confused in his judgment of my works. When he saw the systematic and increasingly virulent detraction, depreciation, and scorn to which they were subjected, he confessed to me later that he had never imagined such a desperate position as mine against the united forces of journalism could possibly exist, and when he heard my view of the question, he smiled and gave me his blessing, as though I were a lost soul. Moreover, a change was observable in the attitude of those immediately connected with me in my work, and this provided very acceptable material for the journalistic campaign. I had been led, though by no ambitious impulse, to ask to be allowed to conduct the performances of my own works. I found that at every performance of Rienzi Reisiger became more negligent in his conducting, and that the whole production was slipping back into the old familiar, expressionless, and humdrum performance, and as my appointment was already mooted, I had asked permission to conduct the sixth performance of my work in person, I conducted without having held a single rehearsal, and without any previous experience, at the head of the Dresden Orchestra. The performance went splendidly singers and orchestra were inspired with new life, and everybody was obliged to admit that this was the finest performance of Rienzi that had yet been given. The rehearsing and conducting of the fly and her hall and her were willingly handed over to me, because Reisiger was overwhelmed with work in consequence of the death of the musical director, 
Rostrelli. In addition to this, I was asked to conduct Weber's Urinth by way of providing a direct proof of my capacity to interpret scores other than my own. Apparently everybody was pleased, and it was the tone of this performance that made Weber's widow so anxious that I should accept the Dresden conductorship. She declared that for the first time since her husband's death she had heard his work correctly interpreted, both in expression and time. Thereupon, Reisiger, who would have preferred to have a musical director under him, but had received instead a colleague an equal footing, felt himself aggrieved by my appointment, though his own indolence would have inclined him to the side of peace and a good understanding with me. His ambitious wife took care to stir up his fear of me. This never led to an openly hostile attitude on his part, but I noticed certain indiscretions in the press from that time onwards, which showed me that the friendliness of my colleague, who never talked to me without first embracing me, was not of the most honorable type. I also received a quite unexpected proof that I had attracted the bitter envy of another man whose sentiments I had no reason to suspect. This was Karl Lipinski, a celebrated violinist in his day, who had for many years led the Dresden Orchestra. He was a man of ardent temperament and original talent, but of incredible vanity which his emotional, suspicious polished temperament rendered dangerous. I always found him annoying, because, however, inspiring and instructive his playing was as to the technical execution of the violinists. He was certainly ill-fitted to be the leader of a first school's orchestra. This extraordinary person tried to justify director Lutakow's praise of his playing, which could always be heard above the rest of the orchestra. He came in a little before the other violins. He was a leader in a double sense, as he was always a little ahead, he acted in much the same way with regard to expression, marking his slight variations in the piano passages with fanatical precision. It was useless to talk to him about it, as nothing but the most skillful flattery had any effect on him. So I had to endure it as best I could, and to think out ways and means of diminishing its ill effects on the orchestral performances as a whole by having recourse to the most polite serp meluxionzel. Even so, he could not endure the higher estimation in which the performances of the orchestra under my conductorship were held, because he thought that the playing of an orchestra in which he was the leader must invariably be excellent, whoever stood at the conductor's desk. Now it happened as is always the case when a new man with fresh ideas is installed in office, that the members of the orchestra came to me with the most varied suggestions for improvements which had hitherto been neglected. And Lipinski, who was already annoyed about this, turned a certain case of this kind to a peculiarly treacherous use. One of the oldest contrabassists had died, Lipinski urged me to arrange that the post should not be filled in the usual way by promotion from the ranks of our own orchestra, but should be given, on his recommendation, to a distinguished and skillful contrasibist from Darmstadt named Muller, when the musician whose rights of seniority were thus threatened, appealed to me, I kept my promise to Lipinski, explained my views about the abuses of promotion by seniority, and declared that, in accordance with my sworn oath to the king, I held it my paramount duty to consider the maintenance of the artistic interests of the institution before everything else. I then found to my great astonishment, though it was foolish of me to be surprised, that the whole of the orchestra turned upon me as one man, and when the occasion arose for a discussion between Lipinski and myself as to his own numerous grievances, he actually accused me of having threatened, by my remarks in the contrasibist's case, to undermine the wells of bestial rights of the members of the orchestra, whose welfare it was my duty to protect. Lut a cow, who was on the point of absenting himself from Dresden for some time, was extremely uneasy, as Reisiger was away on his holiday, at leaving musical affairs in such a dangerous state of unrest the deceit and impudence of which I had been the victim was a revelation to me, 
and I gathered from this experience the calm sense necessary to set the harassed director at ease by the most conclusive assurances that I understood the people with whom I had to deal, and would act accordingly. I faithfully kept my word, and never again came into collision either with Lipinski or any other member of the orchestra. On the contrary, all the musicians were soon so firmly attached to me that I could always pride myself on their devotion. From that day forward, however, one thing at least was certain, namely, that I should not die as conductor at Dresden. My post and my work at Dresden thenceforward became a burden, of which the occasionally excellent results of my efforts made me all the more sensible. My position at Dresden, however, brought me one friend whose intimate relations with me long survived our artistic collaboration in Dresden. A musical director was assigned to each conductor. He had to be a musician of repute, a hard worker, adaptable, and, above all, a Catholic, for the two conductors were Protestants, a cause of much annoyance to the clergy of the Catholic cathedral. Numerous positions in which had to be filled from the orchestra. August Strockel, a nephew of Hummel, who sent in his application for this position from Weimar, furnished evidence of his suitability under all these heads. He belonged to an old Bavarian family. His father was a singer and had sung the part of Floriston at the time of the first production of Beethoven's Fidelio and had himself remained on terms on close intimacy with the master. Many details about whose life have been preserved through his care. His subsequent position as a teacher of singing led him to take up theatrical management, and he introduced German opera to the Parisians with so much success that the credit for the popularity of Fidelio and der Freischist with French audiences, to whom these works were quite unknown, must be awarded to his admirable enterprise, which was also responsible for Schroeder Vitterin's debut in Paris. August Strockel, his son, who was still a young man, by helping his father in these and similar undertakings, had gained practical experience as a musician, as his father's business had for some time even extended to England. August had won practical knowledge of all sorts by contact with many men and things, and in addition had learned French and English, but music had remained his chosen vocation, and his great natural talent justified the highest hopes of success. He was an excellent pianist, read scores with the utmost ease, possessed an exceptionally fine ear, and had indeed every qualification for a practical musician. As a composer he was actuated not so much by a strong impulse to create, as the desire to show what he was capable of. The success at which he aimed was to gain the reputation of a clever operatic composer rather than recognition as a distinguished musician, and he hoped to obtain his end by the production of popular works. Actuated by this modest ambition, he had completed an opera, Farinelli, for which he had also written the libretto, with no other aspiration than that of attaining the same reputation as his brother Lenol Lortzing. He brought this score to me, and begged meat was his first visit before he had heard one of my operas in Dresdento play him something from Rienzi and the Fly and her Hollander. His frank, agreeable personality induced me to try and meet his wishes as far as I could and I am convinced that I soon made such a great and unexpectedly powerful impression on him that from that moment he determined not to bother me further with the score of his opera. It was not until we had become more intimate and had discovered mutual personal interests that the desire of turning his work to account induced him to ask me to show my practical friendship by turning my attention to his score, I made various suggestions as to how it might be improved, but he was soon so hopelessly disgusted with his own work that he put it absolutely aside, and never again felt seriously moved to undertake a similar task. On making a closer acquaintance with my completed operas and plans for new works, he declared to me that he felt it his vocation to play the part of spectator, to be my faithful helper and the interpreter of my new ideas and, as far as in him lay, 
to remove entirely and at all events to relieve me as far as possible from all the unpleasantnesses of my official position and of my dealings with the outside world. He wished, he said, to avoid placing himself in the ridiculous position of composing operas of his own while living on terms of close friendship with me. Nevertheless, I tried to urge him to turn his own talent to account, and to this end called his attention to several plots which I wished him to work out. Among these was the idea contained in a small French drama entitled Cromwell's Daughter, which was subsequently used as the subject for a sentimental pastoral romance, and for the elaboration of which I presented him with an exhaustive plan, but in the end all my efforts remained fruitless, and it became evident that his productive talent was feeble. This perhaps arose partly from his extremely needy and trying domestic circumstances, which were such that the poor fellow wore himself out to support his wife and numerous growing children. Indeed, he claimed my help and sympathy in quite another fashion than by arousing my interest in his artistic development. He was unusually clear-headed and possessed a rare capacity for teaching and educating himself in every branch of knowledge and experience. He was, moreover, so genuinely true and good-hearted that he soon became my intimate friend and comrade. He was, and continued to be, the only person who really appreciated the singular nature of my position towards the surrounding world, and with whom I could fully and sincerely discuss the cares and sorrows arising therefrom. What dreadful trials and experiences, what painful anxieties our common fate was to bring upon us, will soon be seen. The earlier period of my establishment in Dresden brought me also another devoted and lifelong friend. Though his qualities were such that he exerted a less decisive influence upon my career, this was a young physician named Anton Pusin Eli, who lived near me. He seized the occasion of a serenade sung in honor of my thirtieth birthday by the Dresden Glee Club to express to me personally his hearty and sincere attachment. We soon entered upon a quiet friendship from which we derived a mutual benefit. He became my attentive family doctor, and during my residence in Dresden, marked as it was by accumulating difficulties, he had abundant opportunities of helping me, his financial position was very good, and his ready self aspherics enabled him to give me substantial succor and bound me to him by many heartfelt obligations. A further development of my association with Dresden Buddy was provided by the kindly advances of Chamberlain von Conneret's family. His wife, Marie von Conneret Sneefink, was a friend of Countess Ida Han Han, and expressed her appreciation of my success as a composer with great warmth, I might almost say with enthusiasm. I was often invited to their house, and seemed likely, through this family, to be brought into touch with the higher aristocracy of Dresden. I merely succeeded in touching the fringe, however, as we really had nothing in common. True, I here made the acquaintance of Countess Rossi, the famous Sontag by whom, to my genuine astonishment, I was most heartily greeted and I thereby obtained the right of afterwards approaching her in Berlin with a certain degree of familiarity. The curious way in which I was disillusioned about this lady on that occasion will be related in due course. I would only mention here that, through my earlier experiences of the world, I had become fairly impervious to deception and my desire for closer acquaintance with these circles speedily gave way to a complete hopelessness and an entire lack of ease in their sphere of life. Although the Conneritz couple remained friendly during the whole of my prolonged sojourn in Dresden, yet the connection had not the least influence either upon my development or my position. Only once, on the occasion of a quarrel between Lutakow and myself, the former observed that Frau von Conneritz, by her unmessered praises, had turned my head and made me forget my position towards him. But in making this taunt he forgot that, 
If any woman in the higher ranks of Dresden society had exerted a real and invigorating influence upon my inward pride, that woman was his own wife, Ida von Lutekown E. von Noblesorf. The power which this cultured, gentle, and distinguished lady exercised over my life was of a kind I now experienced for the first time and might have become of great importance had I been favored with more frequent and intimate intercourse. But it was less her position as wife of the general director than her constant ill health and my own peculiar unwillingness to appear obtrusive, that hindered our meeting except at rare intervals. My recollections of her merge somewhat in my memory with those of my own sister Rosalie, I remember the tender ambition which inspired me to win the encouraging sympathy of this sensitive woman, who was painfully wasting away amid the caressed surroundings. My earliest hope for the fulfillment of this ambition arose from her appreciation of my fly and her hollander, in spite of the fact that, following close upon Rienzi, it had so puzzled the Dresden public. In this way she was the first, so to speak, who swam against the tide and met me upon my new path. So deeply was I touched by this conquest that, when I afterwards published the opera, I dedicated it to her. In the account of my later years in Dresden, I shall have more to record of the warm sympathy for my new development and dearest artistic aims for which I was indebted to her. But of real intercourse we had none and the character of my Dresden life was not affected by this acquaintance, otherwise so important in itself. On the other hand, my theatrical acquaintances thrust themselves with irresistible importance to be into the wide foreground of my life, and in fact, after my brilliant successes, I was still restricted to the same limited and familiar sphere in which I had prepared myself for these triumphs, Indeed, the only one who joined my old friends Hein and Gaffer Fisher was Tichix, with his strange domestic circle. Any one who lived in Dresden at that time and chanced to know the court lithographer, first and now, will be astonished to hear that, without really being aware of it myself, I entered into a familiarity that was to prove a lasting one with this man who was an intimate friend of Tichix's. The importance of this singular connection may be judged from the fact that my complete withdrawal from him coincided exactly with the collapse of my civic position in Dresden. My good Hefford acceptance of election to the musical committee of the Dresden Glee Club also brought me further chance acquaintances. This club consisted of a limited number of young merchants and officials, who had more taste for any kind of convivial entertainment than for music but it was sedulously kept together by a remarkable and ambitious man, Professor Lowe, who nursed it with special objects in view, for the attainment of which he felt the need of an authority such as I possessed at that time in Dresden. Among other aims, he was particularly and chiefly concerned in arranging for the transfer of Weber's remains from London to Dresden. As this project was one which interested me also, I lent him my support though he was in reality merely following the voice of personal ambition, he furthermore desired, as head of the Glee Clubwick, by the way, from the point of view of music was quite worthless to invite all the male choral unions of Saxony to a great gala performance in Dresden. A committee was appointed for the execution of this plan, and as things soon became pretty warm, Lowe turned it into a regular revolutionary tribunal, over which, as the great day of triumph approached, he presided day and night without resting, and by his furious he learned from me the nickname of Robespierre. In spite of the fact that I had been placed at the head of this enterprise, I luckily managed to evade his terrorism, as I was fully occupied with a great composition promised for the festival. The task had been assigned to me of writing an important piece for male voices only, which, if possible, should occupy half an hour, I reflected that the tiresome monotony of male singing, which even the orchestra could only enliven to a slight extent, can only be endured by the introduction of dramatic themes. I therefore designed a great choral scene, 
selecting the apostoclip Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost as its subject, I completely avoided any real solos, but worked out the whole in such a way that it should be executed by detached choral masses according to requirement. Out of this compositioner owes my Liebesmull der Apostel love feast of the Apostles, which has recently been performed in various places, as I was obliged at all costs to finish it within a limited time. I do not mind including this in the list of my uninspired compositions, but I was not displeased with it when it was done, more especially when it was played at the rehearsals given by the Dresden Choral Societies under my personal supervision, when, therefore, twelve hundred singers from all parts of Saxony gathered around me in the Frauing Kreins. Where the performance took place, I was astonished at the comparatively feeble effect produced upon my ear by this colossal human angle of sounds. The conclusion at which I arrived was that these enormous choral undertakings are folly, and I never again felt inclined to repeat the experiment. It was with much difficulty that I shook myself free of the Dresden Glee Club and I only succeeded in doing so by introducing to Professor Lowe another ambitious man in the person of Herr Ferdinand Hiller. My most glorious exploit in connection with this association was the transfer of Weber's ashes, of which I will speak later on, though it occurred at an earlier date. I will only refer now to another commissioned composition which, as royal bandmaster, I was officially commanded to produce. On the 7th of June of this year, 1840, her the statue of King Frederick Augustus by Rachel was unveiled in the Dresden's winger footnote. This is the name by which the famous Dresden art galleries are known, editor, with all due pomp and ceremony. In honor of this event, I, in collaboration with Mendelssohn, was commanded to compose a festal song and to conduct the gala performance I had written a simple song for male voices of modest design, whereas to Mendelssohn had been assigned the more complicated task of interweaving the national anthem The English God Save the King, which in Saxony is called Heil dir im Rotten's Ranksin to the male chorus he had to compose. This he had effected by an artistic work in counterpoint, so arranged that from the first eight beats of his original melody the brass instruments simultaneously played the Anglo-Saxon popular air. My simpler song seems to have sounded very well from a distance, whereas I understood that Mendelssohn's daring combination quite missed its effect, because no one could understand why the vocalists did not sing the same air as the wind instruments were playing. Nevertheless, Mendelssohn, who was present, left me a written expression of thanks for the pains I had taken in the production of his composition. I also received a gold snuff-box from the Grand Gala Committee, presumably meant as a reward for my male chorus. But the hunting scene which was engraved on the top was so badly done that I found, to my surprise, that in several places the metal was cut through. Amid all the distractions of this new and very different mode of life, I diligently strove to concentrate and steel my soul against these influences, bearing in mind my experiences of success in the past. By May of my thirtieth year I had finished my poem Der Venisberg, The Mount of Venus. As I called Tannhauser at that time, I had not yet by any means gained any real knowledge of mediaevali poetry. The classical side of the poetry of the Middle Ages had so far only faintly dawned upon me, partly from my youthful recollections, and partly from the brief acquaintance I had made with it through Lair's instruction in Paris. Now that I was secure in the possession of a royal appointment that would last my lifetime, the establishment of a permanent domestic hearth began to assume great importance for I hoped it would enable me to take up my serious studies once more, and in such a way as to make them productive and tame, which my theatrical life and the miseries of my years in Paris had rendered impossible. My hope of being able to do this was strengthened by the character of my official employment, which was never very arduous, and,
and in which I met with exceptional consideration from the general management, though I had only held my appointment for a few months. Yet I was given a holiday this first summer, which I spent in a second visit to Toplitz, a place which I had grown to like, and whither I had sent on my wife in advance. Keenly indeed did I appreciate the change in my position since the preceding year. I could now engage for spacious and well-appointed rooms in the same house the I had shown how I had before lived in such straight and unfrugal circumstances. I invited my sister Clara to pay us a visit, and also my good mother, whose gout necessitated her taking the toplets baths every year. I also seized the opportunity of drinking the mineral waters, which I hoped might have a beneficial effect on the gastric troubles from which I had suffered ever since my vicissitudes in Paris. Unfortunately, the attempted cure had a contrary effect, and when I complained of the painful irritation produced, I learned that my constitution was not adapted for water cures. In fact, on my morning promenade, and while drinking my water, I had been observed to race through the shady alleys of the adjacent Thurn Gardens, and it was pointed out to me that such a cure could only be properly wrought by leisurely calm and easy sauntering. It was also remarked that I usually carried about a fairly stout volume, and that, armed with this and my bottle of mineral water, I used to take rest in lonely places. This book was J. Grimm's German Mythology. All who know the work can understand how the unusual wealth of its contents, gathered from every side and meant almost exclusively for the student, would react upon me, whose mind was everywhere seeking for something definite and distinct, formed from the scanty fragments of a perished world, of which scarcely any monuments remained recognizable and intact. I here found a heter a genius building, which at first glance seemed but a rugged rock clothed in straggling brambles. Nothing was finished, only here and there could the slightest resemblance to an architectican line be traced, so that I often felt tempted to relinquish the thankless task of trying to build from such materials. And yet I was enchained by a wondrous magic. The baldest legend spoke to me of its ancient home and soon my whole imagination thrilled with images. Long, loathed forms for which I had sought so eagerly shaped themselves ever more and more clearly into realities that lived again. There rose up soon before my mind a whole world of figures, which revealed themselves as so strangely plastic and primitive, that, when I saw them clearly before me and heard their voices in my heart, I could not account for the almost tangible familiarity and assurance of their demeanor. The effect they produced upon the inner state of my soul I can only describe as an entire rebirth, just as we feel a tender joy over a child's first bright smile of recognition. So now my own eyes flashed with rapture as I saw a world, revealed, as it were, by miracle, in which I had hitherto moved blindly as the babe in its mother's womb. But the result of this reading did not at first do much to help me in my purpose of composing part of the Tannhauser music. I had had a piano put in my room at the Ike, and though I smashed all its strings, nothing satisfactory would emerge. With much pain and toy lice catched the first outlines of my music for the Venisberg, as fortunately I already had its theme in my mind. Meanwhile, I was very much troubled by excitability and rushes of blood to the brain. I imagined I was ill and lay for whole days in bed, where I read Grimm's German legends or tried to master the disagreeable mythology. It was quite a relief when I hit upon the happy thought of freeing myself from the torments of my condition by an excursion to Prague. Meanwhile, I had already ascended Mount Miloche once with my wife, and in her company I now made the journey to Prague in an open carriage. There I stayed once more at my favorite inn. The black horse met my friend Kittle, who had now grown fat and rotund, made various excursions, reveled in the curious antiquities of the old city, and learned to my joy that the two lovely friends of my youth 
Jenny and August Pachta had been happily married to members of the highest aristocracy, thereupon, having reassured myself that everything was in the best possible order, I returned to Dresden and resumed my functions as musical conductor to the King of Saxony. We now set to work on the preparations and furnishing of a roomy and well-situated house in the Austrlie, with an outlook upon the Zwinger. Everything was good and substantial, as is only right for a man of thirty who is settling down at last for the whole of his life. As I had not received any subsidy towards this outlay, I had naturally to raise the money by loan, but I could look forward to a certain harvest from my operatic successes in Dresden, and what was more natural than for me to expect soon to earn more than enough. The three most valued treasures which adorned my house were a concert grand piano by Breitkopf and Hartel, which I had bought with much pride, a stately Rittingsk now in possession of Otto Kummer, the chamber miscasartist and the Tickpolgate by Cornelius for the Nibelogen. In a handsome Gothic frame, the only object which has remained faithful to me to the present day. But the thing which above all else made my house seem homelike and attractive was the presence of a library, which I procured in accordance with a systematic plan laid down by my proposed line of study. On the failure of my Dresden career, this library passed in a curious way into the possession of Herr Heinrich Brockhaus, to whom at that time I owed fifteen hundred marks, and who took it as security for the amount. My wife knew nothing at the time of this obligation, and I never afterwards succeeded in recovering this characteristic collection from his hands. Upon its shelves, old German literature was especially well represented and also the closely related work of the German Middle Ages, including many a costly volume as, for instance, the rare old work Romans Dead Aus Paris. Beside these stood many excellent historical works on the Middle Ages, as well as on the German people in general. At the same time I made provision for the potical and classical literature of all times and languages. Among these were the Italian poets, Shakespeare and the French writers, of whose language I had a passable knowledge. All these I acquired in the original, hoping some day to find time to master their neglected tongues. As for the Greek and Roman classics, I had to content myself with standard German translations. Indeed, on looking once more into my home or whom I secured in the original Greek, he soon recognized that I should be presuming on more leisure than my conductorship was likely to leave me, if I hoped to find time for regaining my lost knowledge of that language. Moreover, I provided most thoroughly for a study of universal history, and to this end did not fail to equip myself with the most voluminous works. Thus armed, I thought I could bid defiance to all the trials which I clearly foresaw would inevitably accompany my calling and position, in hopes, therefore, of long and peaceable enjoyment of this hard reigned home. I entered into possession with the best of spirits in October of this year, 1840, her, and though my conductor's quarters were by no means magnificent, they were stately and substantial. The first leisure in my new home which I could snatch from the claims of my profession and my favorite studies was devoted to the composition of Tannhauser, the first act of which was completed in January of the new year. I have no recollections of any importance regarding my activities in Dresden during this winter. The only memorable events were to enterprises which took me away from home, the first to Berlin early in the year for the production of my fly and her Hollander, and the other in March to Hamburg for Rienzi. Of these the former made the greater impression upon my mind. The manager of the Berlin theatre, Kustner, quite took me by surprise when he announced the first performance of the fly and her Hollander for an early date, as the opera house had been burnt down only about a year before, and could not possibly have been rebuilt. It had not occurred to me to remind them about the production of my opera. It had been performed in Dresden with very poor scenic accessories, 
and knowing how important a careful and artistic execution of the difficult scenery was for my dramatic sea caps, I had relied implicitly on the admirable management and staging capacities of the Berlin Opera House. Consequently, I was very much annoyed that the Berlin manager should select my opera as a stopgap to be produced at the Comedy Theatre, which was being used as a temporary opera house. All remonstrances proved useless, for I learned that they were not merely thinking about rehearsing the work, but that it was already actually being rehearsed, and would be produced in a few days. It was obvious that this arrangement meant that my opera was to be condemned to quite a short run in their repertoire, as it was not to be expected that they would remount it when the new opera house was opened. On the other hand, they tried to appease me by saying that this first production of the Fly and Her Hollander was to be associated with a special engagement of Schroeder Verden, which was to begin in Berlin immediately. They naturally thought I should be delighted to see the great actress in my own work, but this only confirmed me in the suspicion that this opera was simply wanted as a makeshift for the duration of Schroeder Vitterin's visit. They were evidently in a dilemma with regard to her repertoire, which consisted mainly of so-called grand operation as Meyer Bidsent exclusively for the opera house, and which were being specially reserved for the brilliant future of the new building. I therefore realized beforehand that my fly and her hall and her was to be relegated to the category of conductor's operas, and would meet with the usual predestined fate of such productions. The whole treatment meted out to me and my works all pointed in the same direction, but in consideration of the expected cooperation of Schroeder Verd and I fought against these vexatious premonitions, and set out for Berlin to do all I could for the success of my opera. I saw at once that my presence was very necessary. I found the conductor's desk occupied by a man calling himself Conductor Henning or Henniger, an official who had won promotion from the ranks of ordinary musicians by an upright observance of the laws of seniority, but who knew precious little about conducting an orchestra at all, and about my opera had not the faintest glimmer of an idea. I took my seat at the desk, and conducted one full rehearsal and two performances, in neither of which, however, did Schroeder Verden take part. Although I found much to complain of in the weakness of the string instruments and the consequent mean sound of the orchestra, yet I was well satisfied with the actors both as regards their capacity and their zeal. The careful staging, moreover, which under the supervision of the really gifted stage manager, Bloom, and with the cooperation of his skillful and ingenious mechanics, was truly excellent, gave me a most pleasant surprise. I was now very curious to learn what effect these pleasing and encouraging preparations would have upon the Berlin public when the full performance took place. My experiences on this point were very curious. Apparently the only thing that interested the large audience was to discover my weak points. During the first act the prevalent opinion seemed to be that I belonged to the category of bores, not a single hand was moved, and I was afterwards informed that this was fortunate, as the slightest attempt at applause would have been ascribed to a paid clack, and would have been energetically opposed. Kustner alone assured me that the composure with which, on the close of this act, I quitted my desk and appeared before the curtain, had filled him with wonder, considering this entire absence Colvy as it appears to have been wafal applause, but so long as I myself felt content with the execution, I was not disposed to let the public apathy discourage me, knowing, as I did, that the crucial test was in the second act. It lay, therefore, much nearer my heart to do all I could for the success of this than to inquire into the reasons for this attitude on the part of the Berlin public, and here the ice was really broken at last. The audience seemed to abandon all idea of finding a proper niche for me, and allowed itself to be carried away into giving vent to applause, which at last grew into the most boisterous enthusiasm. At the close of the act, amid a storm of shouts, 
I led forward my singers on to the stage for the customary vows of thanks, as the third act was too short to be tedious, and as the scenic effects were both new and impressive, we could not help hoping that we had won a veritable triumph, especially as renewed outbursts of applause marked the end of the performance. Mendelssohn, who happened at that time to be in Berlin, with Meyer Beer, on business relating to the general musical conductorship, was present in a stage box during this performance. He followed its progress with a pale face, and afterwards came and murmured to me in a weary tone of voice, Well, I should think you are satisfied now. I met him several times during my brief stay in Berlin, and also spent an evening with him listening to various pieces of chamber miscus, but never did another word concerning the fly and her hollander pass his lips. Beyond inquiries as to the second performance, and as to whether Devriant or someone else would appear in it, I heard, moreover, that he had responded with equal indifference to the earnest warmth of my allusions to his own music for the Midsummer Night's Dream, which was being frequently played at that time, and which I had heard for the first time. The only thing he discussed with any detail was the actor Gern, who was playing in Zettel, and who he considered was overcating his part. A few days later came a second performance with the same cast. My experiences on this evening were even more startling than on the former. Evidently the first night had won me a few friends, who were again present, for they began to applaud after the overture. But others responded with hisses, and for the rest of the evening no one again ventured to applaud. My old friend Hein had arrived in the meantime from Dresden, sent by our own board of directors to study the scenic arrangements of the Midsummer Night's Dream for our theatre. He was present at this second performance, and had persuaded me to accept the invitation from one of his Berlin relatives to have supper after the performance in a Winneborunter den Linden. Very weary, I followed him to a nasty and badly lighted house, where I gulped down the wine with hasty ill humor to warm myself, and listened to the embarrassed conversation of my goodnet heart friend and his companion, whilst I turned over the day's papers. I now had ample leisure to read the criticisms they contained on the first performance of my fly and her hollander. A terrible spasm cut my heart as I realized the contemptible tone and unparalleled shamelessness of their raging ignorance regarding my own name and work. Our Berlin friend and host, a thorough Philistine, said that he had known how things would go in the theater that night. After having read these criticisms in the morning, the people of Berlin, he added, wait to hear what Relit and his mates have to say and then they know how to behave. The good fellow was anxious to cheer me up, and ordered one wine after another. Hein hunted up his reminiscences of our merry Rienzi times in Dresden, until at last the pair conducted me, staggering along in an addled condition, to my hotel. It was already midnight. As I was being lighted by the waiter through its gloomy corridors to my room, a gentleman in black, with a pale, refined face, came forward and said he would like to speak to me. He informed me that he had waited there since the close of the play, and, as he was determined to see me, had stopped till now. I excused myself on the ground of being quite unfit for business, and added that, although not exactly inclined to merriment, I had, as he might perceive, somewhat foolishly drunk a little too much wine. This I said in a stammering voice, but my strange visitor seemed only the more unwilling to be repulsed. He accompanied me to my room, declaring that it was all the more imperative for him to speak with me. We seated ourselves in the cold room by the meagre light of a single candle, and then he began to talk. In flowing and impressive language he related that he had been present at the performance that night of my fly and her hollander and could well conceive the humor in which the evening's experiences had left me. For this very reason he felt that nothing should hinder him from speaking to me that night, and telling me that in the fly and her hollander I had produced an unrevolved masterpiece. Moreover, 
the acquaintance he had made with this work had awakened in him a new and unforeseen hope for the future of German art, and that it would be a great pity if I yielded to any sense of discouragement as the result of the unworthy reception accorded to it by the Berlin public. My hair began to stand on end. One of Hoffman's fantastic creations had entered bodily into my life. I could find nothing to say except to inquire the name of my visitor, at which he seemed surprised as I had talked with him the day before at Mendelssohn's house. He said that my conversation and manner had created such an impression upon him there, and had filled him with such sudden regret at not having sufficiently overcome his dislike for Opry in general, to be present at the first performance, that he had at once resolved not to miss the second. His name, he added, was Professor Warder. That was no use to me, I said. He must write his name down. Getting paper and ink, he did as I desired, and we parted. I flung myself unconsciously on the bed for a deep and invigorating sleep. Next morning I was fresh and well. I paid a farewell call on Schroeder Vedrant who promised me to do all she could for the fly and her Hollander as soon as possible drew my fee of a hundred ducats, and set off for home. On my way through Leipzig I utilized my ducats for the repayment of sundry advances made me by my relatives during the earlier and poverty-stricken period of my sojourn in Dresden, and then continued my journey to recuperate among my books and meditate upon the deep impression made on me by Werder's midnight visit. Before the end of this winter I received a genuine invitation to Hamburg for the performance of Rienzi. The enterprising director, Herr Cornet, through whom it came, confessed that he had many difficulties to contend against in the management of his theatre, and was in need of a great success. This, after the reception with which it had met in Dresden, he thought he could secure by the production of Rienzi, I accordingly betook myself thither in the month of March. The journey at that time was not an easy one, as after Hanover one had to proceed by mail quack, and the crossing of the Elbe, which was full of floating ice, was a risky business, owing to a great fire that had recently broken out. The town of Hamburg was in process of being rebuilt, and there were still many wide spaces encumbered with ruins. Cold weather and an ever-gloomy sky make my recollections of my somewhat prolonged sojourn in this town anything but agreeable. I was tormented to such an extent by having to rehearse with bad material, fit only for the poorest theatrical trumpery, that, worn out and exposed to constant colds, I spent most of my leisure time in the solitude of my in-chamber, my earlier experiences of a large and badly managed theatres came back to me afresh. I was particularly depressed when I realized that I had made myself an unconscious accomplice of Director Cornet's basest interests. His one aim was to create a sensation, which he thought should be of great service to me also, and not only did he put me off with a smaller fee, but even suggested that it should be paid by gradual installments the dignity of scenic decoration of which he had not the smallest idea was completely sacrificed to the most ridiculous and tawdry show winses he imagined that pageantry was all that was really needed to secure my success so he hunted out all the old fairy belter costumes from his stock and fancied that if they only looked gay enough and if plenty of people were bustling about on the stage i ought to be satisfied but the most sorry item of all was the singer he provided for the tighter low. He was a man of the name of Werda, an elderly, flabby and voiceless tenor, who sang Rienzi with the expression of a level Reichel vino. For instance, in the Sam Aniba, he was so dreadful that I conceived the idea of making the capital tumble down in the second act, so as to bury him sooner in its ruins a plan which would have cut out several of the processions, which were so dear to the heart of the director. I found my one ray of light in a lady singer, who delighted me with the fire with which she played the part of Adriano. This was a madame, Faringer, 
who was afterwards engaged by List for the role of Ortrud in the production of Lowe and Grin at Weimar, but by that time her powers had greatly deteriorated. Nothing could be more depressing than my connection with this opera under such dismal circumstances. And yet there were no outward signs of failure. The manager hoped in any case to keep Rienzi in his repertoire until Tichixt was able to come to Hamburg and give the people of that town a true idea of the play. This actually took place in the following summer. My discouragement and ill humor did not escape the notice of Herr Cornet, and discovering that I wished to present my wife with a parrot, he managed to procure a very fine bird, which he gave me as a parting gift. I carried it with me in its narrow cage on my melancholy journey home, and was touched to find that it quickly repaid my care and became very much attached to me. Minna greeted me with great joy when she saw this beautiful gray parrot, for she regarded it as a self-evident proof that I should do something in life. We already had a pretty little dog, born on the day of the first Trinzi rehearsal in Dresden, which, owing to its passionate devotion to myself, was much petted by all who knew me and visited my house during those years. This sociable bird, which had no vices and was an apt scholar, now formed an addition to our household, and the pair did much to brighten our dwelling in the absence of children. My wife soon taught the bird snatches of songs from Rienzi, with which it would good-naturedly greet me from a distance when it heard me coming up the stairs, and thus at last my domestic hearth seemed to be established with every possible prospect of a comfortable competency. No further excursions for the performance of any of my operas took place, for the simple reason that no such performances were given. As I saw, it was quite clear that the diffusion of my works through the theatrical world would be a very slow business. I concluded that this was probably due to the fact that no adaptations of them for the piano existed. I therefore thought that I should do well to press forward such an issue at all costs, and in order to secure the expected profits, I hit upon the idea of publishing at my own expense. I accordingly made arrangements with F. Messer, the court musicator, who had hitherto not got beyond the publication of a valse, and signed an agreement with him for his firm to appear as the nominal publishers on the understanding that they should receive a commission of 10 per cent, whilst I provided the necessary capital, as there were two operas to be issued, including Rienzi, a work of exceptional bulk. It was not likely that these publications would prove very profitable unless, in addition to the usual piano selections, I also published adaptations, such as the music without words, for duet or solo, for this a fairly large capital was necessary. I also needed funds for the repayment of the loans already mentioned, and for the settlement of old debts, as well as to pay off the remaining expenses of my house for inciting. I was therefore obliged to try and procure much larger sums. I laid my project and its motive before Schroeder Verden, who had just returned to Dresden at Easter, 1844, to fulfill a fresh engagement. She believed in the future of my works, recognized the peculiarity of my position, as well as the correctness of my calculations and declared her willingness to provide the necessary capital for the publication of my operas, refusing to consider the act as one involving any sacrifice on her part. This money she proposed to get by selling out her investments in polished state bonds, and I was to pay the customary rate of interest. The thing was so easily done, and seemed so much a matter of course, that I at once made all needful arrangements with my Leipzig printer, and set to work on the publication of my operas, when the amount of work delivered brought with it a demand for considerable payments on account. I approached my friend for a first advance, and he Rye became confronted with a new phase of that famous lady's life, which placed me in a position which proved as disastrous as it was unexpected. After having broken away from the unlucky Herr von Munchhausen some time previously, and returned, as it appeared, with penitential ardour to her former connection with my friend. 
Herman Muller, it now turned out that she had found no real satisfaction in this fresh relationship. On the contrary, the star of her being, whom she had so long and ardently desired, had now at last arisen in the person of another lieutenant of the guards, with a vehemence which made light of her treachery to her old friend. She elected this slim young man, whose moral and intellectual weaknesses were patent to every eye, as the chosen keystone of her life's love. He took the good luck that befell him so seriously, that he would brook no jesting, and at once laid hands on the fortune of his future wife, as he considered that it was disadvantageous and insecurely invested, and thought that he knew of much more profitable ways of employing it, my friend therefore explained, with much pain and evident embarrassment, that she had renounced all control over her capital, and was unable to keep her promise to me. Owing to this I entered upon a series of entanglements and troubles which henceforth dominated my life and plunged me into sorrows that left their dismal mark on all my subsequent enterprises. It was clear that I could not now abandon the proposed plan of publication. The only satisfactory solution of my perplexed deity was to be found in the execution of my project and the success which I hoped would attend it. I was compelled, therefore, to turn all my energies to the raising of the money wherewith to publish my two operas, to which in all probability Tannhauser would shortly have to be added, I first applied to my friends, and in some cases had to pay exorbitant rates of interest, even for short terms. For the present these details are sufficient to prepare the reader for the catastrophe towards which I was now inevitably drifting. The hopelessness of my position did not at first reveal itself, there seemed no reason to despair of the eventual spread of my operatic works among the theatres in Germany, though my experience of them indicated that the process would be slow. In spite of the depressing experiences in Berlin and Hamburg, there were many encouraging signs to be seen. Above all, Rienzi maintained its position in favour of the people of Dresden, a place which undoubtedly occupied a position of great importance especially during the summer months, when so many strangers from all parts of the world pass through it. My opera, which was not to be heard anywhere else, was in great request both among the Germans and other visitors, and was always received with marked approbation, which surprised me very much. Thus a performance of Rienzi, especially in summer, became quite a Dionysi unrevelry, whose effect upon me could not fail to be encouraging. On one occasion Liszt was among the number of these visitors. As Rienzi did not happen to be in the repertoire when he arrived, he induced the management at his earnest request to arrange a special performance. I met him between the acts in Tichix's dressing room, and was heartily encouraged and touched by his almost enthusiastic appreciation, expressed in his most emphatic manner, the kind of life to which Liszt was at that time condemned, and which bound him to a perpetual environment of distracting and exciting elements, debarred us from all more intimate and fruitful intercourse. Yet from this time onward I continued to receive constant testimonies of the profound and lasting impression I had made upon him, as well as of his sympathetic remembrance of me from various parts of the world wherever his triumphal progress led him people chiefly of the upper classes came to dresden for the purpose of hearing rienzi they had been so interested by liszt's reports of my work and by his playing of various selections from it that they all came expecting something of unparalleled importance besides these indications of liszt's enthusiastic and friendly sympathy other deeply touching testimonies appeared from different quarters. The startling beginning made by Werder, on the occasion of his midnight visit after the second performance of the Fly and Er Hollander in Berlin, was shortly afterwards followed by a similarly unsolicited approach in the form of an effusive letter from an equally unknown personage. Olwino Frommen, who afterwards became my faithful friend, after my departure from Berlin she heard Schroeder Verdant Weiss in the fly at her Hollander, 
and the letter in which she described the effect produced upon her by my work conveyed to me for the first time the vigorous and profound sentiments of a deep and confident recognition such as seldom falls to the lot of even the greatest master and cannot fail to exercise a weighty influence on his mind and spirit which long for self-confidence i have no very vivid recollections of my own doings during this first year of my position as conductor in a sphere of action which gradually grew more and more familiar for the anniversary of my appointment and to some extent as a personal recognition i was commissioned to procure gluck's armida this we performed in march eighteen forty her with the cooperation of schroeder verden just before her temporary departure from dresden great importance was attached to this production because at the same moment meyer beer was inaugurating his general archipper in berlin by a performance of the same work indeed it was in berlin that the extraordinary respect entertained for such a commemoration of gluck had its origin i was told that meyer beer went to relit with the score of armida in order to obtain hints as to its correct interpretation as not long afterwards i also heard a strange story of two silver candlesticks wherewith the famous composer was said to have enlightened the no less famous critic when showing him the score of his feldelager in schlesien i decided to attach no great importance to the instructions he might have received but rather to help myself by a careful handling of this difficult score and by introducing some softness into it through modulating the variations in tone as much as possible i had the gratification later of receiving an exceedingly warm appreciation of my rendering from herr edward devriant a great gluck connoisseur after hearing this opera as presented by us and comparing it with the berlin performance he heartily praised the tenderly modulated character of our rendering of certain parts, which, he said, had been given in Berlin with the Correst's bluntness. He mentioned, as a striking instance of this, a brief chorus in C major of male and female nymphs in the third act. By the introduction of a more moderate tempo and very soft piano, I had tried to free this from the original coursons with which Devriant had heard it rendered in Berlin Parisian with traditional fidelity, my most innocent device, and one which I frequently adopted, for disguising the irritating stiffness or the orchestral movement in the original, was a careful modification of the basso conteono, which was taken uninterruptedly in common time this i felt obliged to remedy partly by legato playing and partly by pizzicato our management were lavish in their expenditure on externals especially decoration and as a spectacular opera the piece drew fairly large houses thus earning me the reputation of being a very suitable conductor for gluck and one who was in close sympathy with him this result was the more conspicuous from the fact that Iphigenia in Taurus, which is a far superior work, and in which Devriant's interpretation of the Titerlo was admirable, had been performed to empty houses. I had to live upon this reputation for a long time, as it often happened that I was compelled to give inferior performances of repertoire pieces, including Mozart's operas, the mediocrity of these was particularly disappointing to those who, after my success in Armide, had expected a great deal from my rendering of these pieces, and were much disappointed in consequence. Even sympathetic hearers sought to explain their disappointment on the ground that I did not appreciate Mozart and could not understand him, but they failed to realize how impossible it was for me, as a mere conductor, to exercise any real influence on such desultory performances, which were merely given as stopgaps, and often without rehearsal. Indeed, in this matter I often found myself in a false position, which, as I was powerless to remedy it, contributed not a little to render unbearable both my new office and my dependence upon the meanest motives of a paltry theatrical routine already overweighted with the cares of business this in fact became worse than i had expected in spite of my previous knowledge of the precariences of such a life 
my colleague Greisiger, to whom from time to time I poured out my woes regarding the scant attention given by the general management to our demands for the maintenance of correct representations in the realm of opera, comforted me by saying that I, like himself, would sooner or later relinquish all these fads and submit to the inevitable fate of a conductor. Thereupon he proudly smote his stomach and hoped that I might soon be able to boast of one as round as his own. I received further provocation for my growing dislike of these jogurat methods from a closer acquaintance with the spirit in which even eminent conductors undertook the reproduction of our masterpieces. During this first year Mendelssohn was invited to conduct his street, Paul for one of the Palm Sunday concerts in the Dresden Chapel, which was famous at that time. The knowledge I thus acquired of this work, under such favorable circumstances, pleased me so much that I made a fresh attempt to approach the composer with sincere and friendly motives, but a remarkable conversation which I had with him on the evening of this performance quickly and strangely repelled my impulse. After the oratorio Reisiger was to produce Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, I had noticed in the preceding rehearsal that Keisiger had fallen into the error of all the ordinary conductors of this work by taking the tempo di minuto of the third movement at a meaningless waltz time whereby not only does the whole piece lose its imposing character, but the trio is rendered absolutely ridiculous by the impossibility of the violoncino part being interpreted at such a speed. I had called Reisiger's attention to this defect, and he acquiesced in my opinion, promising to take the part in question at true minuto tempo. I related this to Mendelssohn when he was resting after his own performance in the box beside me. Listening to the symphony, he too acknowledged that I was right, and thought that it ought to be played as I said, and now the third movement began. Reisiger, who, it is true, did not possess the needful power suddenly to impress so momentous a change of time upon his orchestra with success, followed the usual custom and took the tempo di minuto in the same old waltz time. Just as I was about to express my anger, Mendelssohn gave me a friendly nod, as though he thought that this was what I wanted, and that I had understood the music in this way. I was so amazed by this complete absence of feeling on the part of the famous musician, that I was struck dumb, and thenceforth my own particular opinion of Mendelssohn gradually matured, an opinion which was afterwards confirmed by R. Schumann. The latter, in expressing the sincere pleasure he had felt on listening to the time at which I had taken the first movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, told me that he had been compelled to hear it year after year taken by Mendelssohn at a perfectly distracting speed, amid my yearning anxiety to exert some influence upon the spirit in which our noblest masterpieces were executed. I had to struggle against the profound dissatisfaction I felt with my employment on the ordinary theater repertoire. It was not until Palm Sunday of the year 1844, just after my dispiriting expedition to Hamburg, that my desire to conduct the pastoral symphony was satisfied, but many faults still remained unremedied and for the removal of these I had to adopt indirect methods which gave me much trouble. For instance, at these famous concerts the arrangement of the orchestra, the members of which were seated in a long, thin, semicircular row round the chorus of singers, was so inconceivably stupid that it required the explanation given by Reisiger to make me understand such folly. He told me that all these arrangements dated from the time of the late conductor Morlacci, who, as an Italian composer of operas, had no true realization of the importance of the orchestra or of its necessities. When, therefore, I asked why they had permitted him to meddle with things he did not understand, I learned that the preference shown to this Italian, both by the court and the general management, even in opposition to Karl Marie von Weber, had always been absolute and brooked no contradiction, 
I was warned that even now we should experience great difficulty in ridding ourselves of these inherited vices, because the opinion still prevailed in the highest circles that he must have understood best what he was about. Once more my childish memories of the Unixas are only flashed through my mind, and I remembered the warning of Weber's widow as to the significance of my succession to her husband's post of conductor in Dresden. But, in spite of all this, our performance of the pastoral symphony succeeded beyond expectation, and the incomparable and wonderfully stimulating enjoyment, which I was in future to derive from my intercourse with Beethoven's works, now first enabled me to realize his prolific strength. Cockle shared in this enjoyment with heartfelt sympathy. He supported me with eye and ear at every rehearsal, always stood by my side, and was at one with me both in his appreciation and his aims. After this encouraging success I was to receive the gratification of another triumph in the summer, which, although it was of no particular moment from the musical point of view, was of great social importance. The King of Saxony, towards whom, as I have already said, I had felt warmly drawn when he was Prince Friedrich, was expected home from a long visit to England. The reports received of his stay there had greatly rejoiced my patriotic soul, while this homely monarch, who shrank from all pomp and noisy demonstration, was in England, it happened that the Tsar Nicholas arrived quite unexpectedly on a visit to the Queen. In his hunter great festivities and military reviews were held, in which our king, much against his will, was obliged to participate, and he was consequently compelled to receive the enthusiastic acclamations of the English crowd who were most demonstrative in showing their preference for him. As compared with the unpopular's art, this preference was also reflected in the newspapers, so that a flattering incense floated over from England to our little Saxony which filled us all with a peculiar pride in our king. While I was in this mood, which absorbed me completely, I learned that preparations were being made in Leipzig for a special welcome to the king on his return which was to be further dignified by a musical festival in the directing of which Mendelssohn was to take part. I made inquiries as to what was going to be done in Dresden, and learned that the king did not propose to call there at all, but was going direct to his summer residence at Pilnitz. A moment's reflection showed me that this would only further my desire of preparing a pleasant and hearty reception for his majesty, as I was a servant of the crown. Any attempt on my part to render an act of homage in Dresden might have had the appearance of an official parade which would not be admissible. I seized the idea, therefore, of hurriedly collecting together all who could either play or sing, so that we might perform a reception song hastily composed in honor of the event. The obstacle to my plan was that my director Lutakow was away at one of his country seats. To come to an understanding with my colleague Reisiger would, moreover, have involved delay and given the enterprise the very aspect of an official ovation which I wished to avoid, as no time was to be lost. If anything worthy of the occasion was to be done as the king was due to arrive in a few days he availed myself of my position as conductor of the glee club, and summoned all its singers and instrumentalists to my aid. In addition to these, I invited the members of our theatrical company, and also those of the orchestra, to join us. This done, I drove quickly to Pilnitz to arrange matters with the Lord Chamberlain, whom I found favorably disposed towards my project. The only leisure I could snatch for composing the verses of my song and setting them to music was during the rapid drive there and back for by the time I reached home I had to have everything ready for the copyist and lithographer, the agreeable sensation of rushing through the warm summer air and lovely country, coupled with the sincere affection with which I was inspired for our German prince, and which had prompted my effort, elated me, and worked me up to a high pitch of tension, in which I now formed a clear conception of the lyrical outlines of the Tannhauser march, 
which first saw the light of day on the occasion of this royal welcome I soon afterwards developed this theme, and thus produced the march which became the most popular of the melodies I had hitherto composed. On the next day it had to be tried over with a hundred and twenty instrumentalists and three hundred singers. I had taken the liberty of inviting them to meet me on the stage of the court theatre, where everything went off capitally. Every one was delighted, and I not the least so when a messenger arrived from the director, who had just returned to town, requesting an immediate interview, Little Shaw was enraged beyond measure at my high-handed proceedings in this matter, of which he had been informed by our good friend Reisiger. If his baronial coronet had been on his head during this interview, it would assuredly have tumbled off. The fact that I should have conducted my negotiations in person with the court officials, and could report that my endeavors had met with extraordinarily prompt success, aroused his deepest fury, for the chief importance of his own position consisted in always representing everything which had to be obtained by these means as surrounded by the greatest obstacles, and hedged in by the strictest etiquette. I offered to cancel everything, but that only embarrassed him the more. I thereupon asked him what he wanted me to do, if the plan was still to be carried out. On this point he seemed uncertain, but thought I had shown a great lack of fellow-filing in having not only ignored him, but Reisiger as well. I answered that I was perfectly ready to hand over my composition and the conducting of the piece to Reisiger, but he could not swallow this, as he really had an exceedingly poor opinion of Reisiger, of which I was very well aware. His real grievance was that I had arranged the whole business with the Lord Chamberlain, Herr von Reisenstein, who was his personal enemy, and he added that I could form no conception of the rudeness he had been obliged to endure from the hands of this official. This outburst of confidence made it easier for me to exhibit an almost sincere emotion, to which he responded by a shrug of the shoulders meaning that he must resign himself to a disagreeable necessity, but my project was even more seriously threatened by the wretched weather than by this storm with the director, for it rained all day in torrents. If it lasted, which it seemed only too likely to do, I could hardly start on the special boat at five o'clock in the morning, as proposed, with my hundreds of helpers, to give an early morning concert at Pilnitz, two hours away. I anticipated such a disaster with genuine dismay, but Rockle consoled me by saying that I could rely upon it that we should have glorious weather the next day. For I was lucky, this belief in my luck has followed me ever since, even down to my latest days and amid the great misfortunes which have so often hampered my enterprises. I have felt as if this statement were a wicked insult to fate, but this time, at least, my friend was right. The 12th of August, 1844, was from sunrise till late at night the most perfect summer day that I can remember in my whole life. The sensation of blissful content with which I saw my light-hearted legion of gaily dressed bandsmen and singers gathering through the auspicious morning mists on board our steamer swelled my breast with a fervent faith in my lucky star. By my friendly impetuosity I had succeeded in overcoming Reisiger's smoldering resentment, and had persuaded him to share the honor of our undertaking by conducting the performance of my composition himself. When we arrived at the spot, everything went off splendidly. The king and royal family were visibly touched, and in the evil times that followed the Queen of Saxony spoke of this occasion. I am told, with peculiar emotion, as the fairest day of her life. After Reisiger had wielded his baton with great dignity, and I had sung with the tenors in the choir, we two conductors were summoned to the presence of the royal family. The king warmly expressed his thanks, while the queen paid us the high compliment of saying that I composed very well and that Reisiger conducted very well. His Majesty asked us to repeat the last three stanzas only, as owing to a painful ulcerated tooth, he could not remain much longer out of doors, 
I rapidly devised a combined evolution, the remarkably successful execution of which I am very proud. Even to this day, I had the entire song repeated, but in accordance with the king's wish, only one verse was sung in our original crescent formation. At the beginning of the second verse, I made my four hundred and disciplined bandsmen and singers file off in a march through the garden, which, as they gradually receded, was so arranged that the final notes could only reach the royal ear as an echoing dream song. Thanks to my unexampled activity and ever-present help, this retreat was so steadily carried out that not the slightest faltering was perceptible either in time or delivery. And the whole might have been taken for a carefully rehearsed theatrical manoeuvre. On reaching the castle court, we found that, by the queen's kindly forethought, an ample breakfast had been provided for our party on the lawn, where the tables were already spread. We often saw our royal hostess herself busily supervising the attendants, or moving with excited delight about the windows and corridors of the castle. Every eye beamed rapture to my soul. As the successful author of the general happiness, and I almost felt amid the glories of that day as though the millennium had been proclaimed. After roaming in a body through the lovely grounds of the castle, and not omitting to pay a visit to the Kepgoran, which had been so dear to me in my youth, we returned late at night and in the highest spirits to Dresden. Next morning, I was again summoned to the presence of the director. But a change had come over him during the night, as I began to offer my apologies for the anxiety I had caused him. The tall, thin man with the hard, dry face seized me by the hand and addressed me with a rapturous expression, which I am sure no one else ever saw on his face. He told me to say no more about these anxieties. I was a great man, and soon no one would know anything about him. Whereas I should be universally admired and loved, I was deeply moved and wished only to express my embarrassment at so unexpected an outburst. When he kindly interrupted me and sought an escape from his own emotion in good Hefford confidences, he referred with a smile to the self denial which had yielded the place of Hunter on so extraordinary an occasion to an undeserving man like Reisiger. When I assured him that this act had afforded me the liveliest satisfaction, and that I had myself persuaded my colleague to take the baton, he confessed that at last he began to understand me, but failed altogether to comprehend how the other could accept a position to which he had no right. Lutakow's altered attitude towards me was such that for some time our intercourse on matters of business assumed an almost confidential tone, but. Unfortunately, in course of time, things changed for the worse, so that our relationship became one of open enmity. Nevertheless, a certain peculiar tenderness towards me on the part of this singular man was always clearly perceptible. Indeed, I might almost say that much of his subsequent abuse of me sounded more like the strangely perverted plaints of all of that met with no response. For my holiday this year, I went. Early in September, to Fisher's Vineyard near Loschwitz, not far from the famous Feireldatter Vineyard, where, somewhat late in the year, I rented a summer residence, where, under the kindly and strengthening stimulus of six weeks of open ray life, I composed my music for the second act of Tannhauser, which I completed by the 15th of October. During this period, a performance of Rienzi was given before an audience of no ordinary importance. For this event, I went up to town. Spontini, Meyerbeer, and General Luff, the composer of the Russian national anthem, were seated together in a stage box. I sought no opportunity of learning the impression made by my opera upon these learned judges and magnates of the musical world. It was enough for me to have the complacent satisfaction of knowing that they had heard my off repatriated work performed before a crowded house and amid overwhelming applause. I was delighted at the close of the opera to have my little dog Peps, which had run after me all the way from the country, brought to me and without waiting to greet the European celebrities, 
I drove off with it at once to our quiet vineyard, where Minna was greatly relieved to recover her little pet, which for hours she had believed to be lost. He Rye also received a visit from Order, the man whose friendship I had made in Berlin under such dramatic circumstances, but this time he appeared in ordinary human guise, beneath the kindly light of heaven by which we disputed in a friendly way concerning the true worth of the fly and her hollander, my mind having somewhat turned against this work since Stanhauser had got into my head. It certainly seemed odd to find myself contradicted on this point by my friend, and to receive instruction from him on the significance of my own work. When we returned to our winter quarters I tried to avoid allowing so lengthy an interval to elapse between the composition of the second and third acts as had separated that of the first and second. In spite of many absorbing engagements I succeeded in my aim by carefully cultivating a habit of taking solitary walks, and thanks to their soothing influence over me, I managed to finish the music of Actiwi by the twentieth of December, that is to say, before the end of the year. During this period my time was otherwise very seriously occupied by a visit paid us by Spontini with reference to a proposed presentation of his Vestalin, the preparation for which had just begun. The singular episodes and characteristic features of the intercourse which I thus gained with this eminent and hurry-headed master are still so vividly imprinted on my memory that they seem worthy of a place in this record, since, with the cooperation of Schroederverden, we could, on the whole, rely upon an admirable presentation of the opera. I had inspired Luttakow with the idea of inviting Spontini to undertake the personal superintendent of his justly famous work. He had just left Berlin forever, after enduring great humiliation there, and such an invitation at this moment would be a well-mighted proof of respect. This was accordingly sent, and as I had myself been entrusted with the conductorship of the opera, I was given the singular task of deciding this point with the master. My letter, it appears, although written in French, inspired him with a high opinion of my zeal for the enterprise, and in a gracious reply he informed me what his special wishes were regarding the arrangements to be made for his collaboration, as far as the vocalists were concerned, and seeing that a Schroeder Verden was among the number, he frankly expressed his satisfaction. As for chorus and ballet, he took it for granted that nothing would be lacking to the dignity of the performance. And finally, as regarded the orchestra, he expected that this also would be sure to please him, as he presumed it contained the necessary complement of excellent instruments which, to use his own words, he hoped would furnish the performance with twelve good contrabass. Letout Garni D. Dow's bonds contrabsays. This phrase bowled me over, for the proportion thus bluntly stated in figures gave me so logical a conception of his exalted expectations, that I hurried away at once to the director to warn him that the enterprise on which we had embarked would not, after all, prove as easy as we thought. His alarm was great and he said that some plan must at once be devised for breaking off the engagement. When Schroeder Verden heard of our dilemma, knowing Spontini well, she laughed as though she would never stop at the ingenuous impudence with which we had issued our invitation, a trifling indisposition from which she then suffered provided a reasonable excuse for a delay, more or less prolonged, and this she generously placed at our disposal. Spontini had, in fact, urged us to use all possible dispatch in the execution of our project, for, as he was impatiently awaited in Paris, he could spare us but little time. It fell to my lot to weave the tissue of innocent deceptions by which we hoped to divert the master from a definite acceptance of our invitation. Now we could breathe again, and duly began rehearsing, but on the very day before we proposed to hold our fuldress rehearsal at our leisure, lo and behold, about noon a carriage drove up to my door, in which, clad in a long blue coat of pillet lock, sat no other than the haughty master himself, 
whose manners resembled those of a Spanish grandee, all unattended and greatly excited, he entered my room, showed me my letters, and proved from our correspondence that the invitation had not been declined, but that he had in all points accurately complied with our wishes, forgetting for the moment all the possible embarrassments which might arise, in my genuine and delight at beholding the wonderful man before me, and hearing his work conducted by himself, I at once undertook to do everything I possibly could to meet his desires. This declaration I made with the utmost sincerity of zeal. He smiled with almost childlike kindlines on hearing me, and I at once begged him to conduct the rehearsal arranged for the morrow. He thereupon grew suddenly thoughtful, and began to weigh the numerous disadvantages of such an action on his part. So acute did his agitation become that he had the greatest difficulty in expressing himself clearly on any point, and I found it no easy matter to inquire what arrangements on our part would persuade him to undertake the morrow's rehearsal. After a moment's reflection he asked what sort of baton I was accustomed to use when conducting. With my hands I indicated the approximate length and thickness of a medimized wooden rod, such as our choir attendant was in the habit of supplying, freshly covered with white paper. He sighed and asked if I thought it possible to procure him by tomorrow a baton of black ebony, whose very respectable length and thickness he indicated by a gesture and on each end of which a fairly large knob of ivory was to be affixed, I promised to have one prepared for the next rehearsal, which should at least be similar in appearance to what he desired, and another of the specified materials in time for the actual performance. Visibly relieved, he then passed his hand over his brow, and granted me permission to announce his consent to conduct on the following day, after once more strongly enforcing his instructions as to the baton, he went back to his hotel. I seemed to be moving in a dream, and hastened in a whirlwind of excitement to publish the news of what had happened and was to be expected. We were fairly trapped. Schroeder Verden offered to become our scapegoat, while I entered into precise details with the theater carpenter concerning the baton. This turned out so far correct that it possessed the requisite length and breadth, was black in its color, and had two large white knobs. Then came the fateful rehearsal. Spontini was evidently ill at ease on his seat in the orchestra. First of all, he wished to have the oboists placed behind him, as this partial change of position just at that moment would have caused much confusion in the disposition of the orchestra. I promised to effect the alteration after the rehearsal. He said no more, and took up his baton. In a moment I understood why he attached such importance to its form and size. He held it, not as other conductors do, by the end, but gripped it about the middle with his clenched fist, waving it so as to make it evident that he wielded his baton like a field moron's staff, not for beating time, but for command. Confusion arose in the very first scene, which was increased by the fact that the master's instructions, both to orchestra and singers, were rendered almost unintelligible by his confused use of the German language. This much at least we were soon able to grasp, that he was particularly anxious to disabuse us of the idea that this was a foldress rehearsal, and to show us that he was set upon a thorough registry of the opera from the very beginning. Great, indeed, was the despair of my good old course mister and stage manager. Fish were Cho before had enthusiastically advocated the invitation of Spont in Wien. He recognized that the dislocation of our repertoire was now inevitable. This feeling swelled by degrees to open anger, in the blindness of which every fresh suggestion of Spontini's appeared but frivolous fault finding, to which he bluntly responded in the caress's German. After one of the choruses, Spontini beckoned me to his side and whispered, Mais saves us, vos tours ni chantant pas mal. Whereupon Fisher, regarding this with suspicion, shouted out to me in a rage, What does the old hog want now? And I had some trouble to pacify the speedily converted enthusiast, but our most serious delay arose during the first act, 
through the evolutions of a triumphal march, with the most vociferous emphasis the master expressed intense dissatisfaction with the apathetic demeanor of our populace during the procession of Vestal Virgins. He was quite unaware of the fact that, in obedience to our stage manager's instructions, they had fallen on their knees upon the appearance of the priestesses, for he was so excited and withal so terribly short-stighted that nothing which appealed to the eye alone was perceptible to his senses. What he demanded was that the Roman army should manifest its devout respect in more drastic fashion by flinging themselves as one man to the ground and marking this by delivering a crashing blow of their spears on their shields. Endless attempts were made, but someone always clattered either too soon or too late. Then he repeated the action himself several times with his baton on the desk, but all to no purpose the crash was not sufficiently sharp and emphatic. This reminded me of the impression made upon me some years before in Berlin by the wonderful precision and almost alarming effect with which I had seen similar revolutions carried out in the play of Ferdinand Cortez, and I realized that it would require an immediate and tedious accentuatani of our customary softness of action in such many worse before we could meet the fastidious master's requirements. At the end of the first acts, Pontini went on the stage himself in order to give a detailed explanation of his reasons for wishing to defer his opera for a considerable time, so as to prepare by multitude and aza rehearsals for its production in accordance with his taste. He expected to find the actors of the Dresden Court Theatre gathered there to hear him, but the company had already dispersed. Singers and stage manager had hastily scattered in every direction to give vent, each in his own fashion, to the misery of the situation. None but the workmen, lampleitners, and a few of the chorus gathered in a semicircle around Spontini, in order to have a look at that remarkable man, as he held forth with wonderful effect on the requirements of true theatrical art. Turning towards the dismal scene, I gently and respectfully pointed out to Spontini the uselessness of his declamation, and promised that everything should eventually be done precisely as he desired. Finally, I succeeded in extricating him from the and ignified position in which, to my horror, he had been placed by telling him that Herr Edward Devriant, who had seen the Vestalin in Berlin, and carried every detail of the performance in his mind, should personally drill our chorus and supers into a becoming solemnity during the reception of the Vestals. This pacified him, and we proceeded to settle on a plan for a series of rehearsals according to his wishes. But, in spite of all this, I was the only person to whom this strange turn of affairs was not unwelcome, for through the burlesque extravagances of Spontini, and notwithstanding his extraordinary eccentricities, which, however, I learned in time to understand, I could perceive the miraculous energy with which he pursued and attained an ideal of theatrical art such as in our days had become almost unknown. We began, therefore, with a pianoforte rehearsal, at which the master made a point of telling the singers what he wanted. He did not tell us anything new. However, for he said little about the details of the rendering. On the other hand, he expatiated upon the general interpretation, and I noticed that in doing this, he had accustomed himself to make the most decided allowances for the great singers, especially Schroeder Verden and Tichikst. The only thing he did was to forbid the latter to use the word brought bride with which Lichenes had to address Julia in the German translation. This word sounded horrible in his ears, and he could not understand how anybody could set such a vulgar sound as that to music. He gave a long lecture, however, to the somewhat coarse and less talented singer who took the part of the high priest, and explained to him how to understand and interpret this character from the dialogue in recitative between him and Horaspis, he told him that he must understand that the whole thing was based upon priestcraft and superstition. Pontifex must make it clear that he does not fear his antagonist at the head of the Roman army, because, should the worst come to the worst, 
He has his machines ready, which, if necessary, will miraculously rekindle the dead fire of Vesta. In this way, even though Julia should escape the sacrifice, the power of the priesthood would still be unassailable. During one of the rehearsals I asked Pontini why he, who, as a rule, made such very effective use of the trombone, should have left it entirely out in the magnificent triumphal march of the first act. Very much astonished he asked tests QG Nipas D trombones. I showed him the printed score, and he then asked me to add the trombones to the march, so that, if possible, they might be used at the next rehearsal. He also said G intended ans votorinzi on instrument, Q vu appels bass to bajin e vopas banner set instrument deal orchestry. Fates menun party pour la vestal. It gave me great pleasure to perform this task for him with all the care and good judgment I could dispose of. When at the rehearsal he heard the effect for the first time, he threw me a really grateful glance, and so much appreciated the really simple additions I had made to his score, that a little later on he wrote me a very friendly letter from Paris in which he asked me kindly to send him the extra instrumental parts I had prepared for him. His pride would not allow him, however, to ask out right for something for which I alone had been responsible. So he wrote Ivonovit sumi un partition de trombones pour l'homme arche trium hol pet de la bastut patel quail ite executit sous ma direction addressed. Apart from this, I also showed how greatly I respected him, in the eagerness with which, at his special request, I regrouped all the instruments in the orchestra. He was forced to this request more by habit than by principle, and how very important it seemed to him not to make the slightest change in his customary arrangements, was proved to me when he explained his method of conducting. He conducted the orchestra, so he said, only with his eyes my left eye is the first violin, my right eye the second, and if the eye is to have power, one must not wear glasses as so many bad conductors do, even if one is short stighted I, he admitted confidentially, cannot see twelve inches in front of me, but all the same I can make them play as I want, merely by fixing them with my eye. In some respects, the arbitrary way in which he used to arrange his orchestra was really very irrational. From his old days in Paris, he had retained the habit of placing the two oboists immediately behind him, and although this was a fad which owed its origin to a mere accident, it was one to which he always adhered. The consequence was that these players had to avert the mouthpiece of their instruments from the audience and our excellent oboist was so angry about this arrangement that it was only by dint of great diplomacy that I succeeded in pacifying him. Apart from this, Spontini's method was based upon the absolutely correct system which even at the present time is misunderstood by some German orchestras of spreading the string quartet over the whole orchestra. This system further consisted in preventing the brass and percussion instruments from culminating in one point and drowning each other by dividing them on both sides, and by placing the more delicate wind instruments at a judicious distance from each other, thus forming a chain between the violins. Even some great and celebrated orchestras of the present day still retain the custom of dividing the mass of instruments into two halves. The string and the wind instruments, an arrangement that denotes roughness and a lack of understanding of the sound of the orchestra, which ought to blend harmoniously and be well balanced, I was very glad to have the chance of introducing this excellent improvement in Dresden for now that Spontini himself had initiated it. It was an easy matter to get the king's command to let the alteration stand. Nothing remained after Spontini's departure but to modify and correct certain eccentricities and arbitrary features in his arrangements. And from that moment I attained a high level of success with my orchestra, with all the peculiarities he showed at rehearsals. 
This exceptional man fascinated both musicians and singers to such an extent that the production attracted quite an unusual amount of attention. Very characteristic was the energy with which he insisted on exceptionally sharp rhythmic accents. Through his association with the Berlin Orchestra he had acquired the habit of marking the note that he wished to be brought out with the word dies this, which at first was quite incomprehensible to me. The great singer Tichikst, who had a positive genius for rhythm, was highly pleased by this, for he also had acquired the habit of compelling the chorus to great precision in very important entries, and maintained that if one only accentuated the first note properly, the rest followed as a matter of course. On the whole, therefore, a spirit of devotion to the master gradually pervaded the orchestra. The violas alone bore him a grudge for a while, and for this reason, in the accompaniment of the lugubrious Conti Lena of Julia at the end of the second act, he would not put up with the way in which the violas played the horribly sentimental accompaniment. Suddenly turning towards them, he called in a sepulchral tone, Are the violas dying, the two pale and incurably melancholy old men who held on tenaciously to their posts in the orchestra, notwithstanding their right to a pension, stared at Spontini with real fright, reading a threat in his words, and I had to explain Spontini's wish in sober language in order to call them back to life. On the stage hair, Edward Devriant helped very materially in bringing about wonderfully distinct ensembles. He also knew how to gratify a certain wish of Spontini's, which threw us all into tremendous confusion. In accordance with the cuts adopted by all the German theatres, we too ended the opera with the fiery duet, supported by the chorus, between Lichenes and Julia after their rescue. The master, however, insisted on adding a lively chorus and ballet to the finale. According to the antiquated method of ending common to French opera Syria, he was absolutely against finishing his work with a dismal churchyard episode. Consequently, the whole scene had to be altered. Venus was to shine resplendent in a rose bower, and the Longhofsern lovers were to be wedded at her altar, amid lively dancing and singing by Rose Bedict's priests and priestesses. We performed it like this, but unluckily not with the success we had all hoped for. In the course of the production, which was proceeding with wonderful accuracy and verve, we came across a difficulty with regard to the principal part for which none of us had been prepared. Our great Schroeder Verden was obviously no longer of an age to give the desired effect as the youngest of the Vestal Virgins. She had acquired matronly contours, and her age was moreover accentuated by the extremely girlish young high priests with whom she had to act, and whose youth it was difficult to dissimulate. This was my niece, Johanna Wagner, who, because of her marvelous voice and great talent as an actress, made everyone in the audience long to see the parts of the two women reversed. Schroeder Verden, who was well aware of this fact, tried by every effective means in her power to overcome her most difficult position. This effort, however, resulted not infrequently in great exaggeration and straining of the voice and in one very important place her part was sadly overacted, when, after the great trio in the second act, she had to gasp the words, a wrist fry he is free, and to move away from her rescued lover towards the front of the stage. She made the mistake of speaking the words instead of singing them. She had often proved the effect of a decisive word duttered with an exaggerated and yet careful imitation of the ordinary accents of the spoken language. By exciting the audience's wildest enthusiasm when she almost whispered the words, Not chine and shrit undo bis tot, just one more step and thou art dead, infidelia, this terrific effect which I too had felt was produced by the shock like unto the blow of an executioner's axe which I received on suddenly coming down from the ideal sphere to which music itself can exalt the most awful situations, to the naked surface of dreadful reality. 
This sensation was due simply to the knowledge of the utmost height of the sublime, and the memory of the impression I received laid me to call that particular moment the moment of lightning, for it was as if two different worlds that meet, and yet are divided, were suddenly illumined and revealed as by a flash. Thoroughly to understand such a moment, and not to treat it wrongly, was the whole secret, and this I fully realized on that day from the absolute failure on the great singer's part to produce the right effect. The toneless, hoarse way in which she uttered the words was like throwing cold water over the audience and myself, and not one of those present could see any more in the incident than a botched theatrical effect. It is possible that the public had expected too much, for they were curious to see spontane conduct and the prices had been raised accordingly. It may also have been that the whole style of the work, with its antiquated French plot, seemed rather obsolete in spite of the majestic beauty of the musicor, perhaps, the very tame and left the same cold impression as Devriant's dramatic failure. In any case there was no real enthusiasm, and the only sign of approval was a rather lukewarm call for the celebrated master who, covered with numerous decorations, made a sad impression on me as he bowed his thanks to the audience for their very moderate applause. Nobody was less blind to the somewhat disappointing result than Spontini himself. He decided, however, to defy fate, and to this end had recourse to means which he had often employed in Berlin in order to get packed houses for his operatic productions. Thus, he always gave Sunday performances, for experience had taught him that he could always have a full house on that day, as the next Sunday on which his Vestalin was to be produced was still some time ahead. His prolonged stay gave us several more chances of enjoying his interesting company. I have such a vivid recollection of the hours spent with him either at Madame Devriant's or at my house, that I shall be pleased to quote a few reminiscences I shall never forget it dinner at Schroeder Vitterin's house at which we had a charming conversation with Spontini and his wife a sister of the celebrated pianoforte maker. Erred. Spontini generally lists and deferential to what the others had to say, his attitude being that of a man who expected to be asked for his opinion. When he did speak in the end it was with a sort of rhetorical solemnity, in sharp and precise sentences, categorical and well accentuated, which forbade contradiction from the outset. Herr Ferdinand Hiller was among the invited guests, and he began to speak about Liszt. After some time Spontini gave his opinion in his characteristic fashion, but in a spirit which showed only too clearly that from the heights of his Berlin throne he had not judged the affairs of the world either with impartiality or good will, while he was laying down the law in this style he could not brook any interruption. When, therefore, during the dessert, the general conversation became livelier, and Madame Devriant happened to laugh with her neighbour at the table in the middle of a long harangue of Spontini's, he shot an extremely angry glance at his wife, Madame Devriant apologized for her at once by saying that it was she, Madame Devriant, who had been laughing about some lines on a bonbony air. Whereupon Spontini retorted, Portent Jesus, Circus est mafem quius est ICA rire. Jean e vopas culon redevant moi. Jean e regime moi, hymelis arios. In spite of that, he sometimes succeeded in being jovial. For instance, it amused him to set us all wondering at the way in which he crunched enormous lumps of sugar with his marvelous teeth. After dinner, when we drew our chairs closer together, he usually became very excited. As far as he was capable of affection, he seemed really to like me. He declared openly that he loved me, and said that he would prove this best by trying to keep me from the misfortune of proceeding in my career as a dramatic composer. He said he knew it would be difficult to convince me of the value of this friendly service, but as he felt it his sacred duty to look after my happiness in this particular line, he was prepared to stay in Dresden for another half a year. 
during which period he suggested that we should produce his other operas, and especially Agnes von Hohenstaufen, under his direction, to explain his views about the fatal mistake of trying to succeed as a dramatic composer after Spontini, he began by praising me in these terms, Quan G. Intenda Votorinzi G. Dit, Sest an Ham D. Gini, Mais D. G. Illa Plus Fate Quile Ni Pute Fair, in order to show me what he meant by this paradox, he proceeded as follows Apers Gluck Sest Moi Qui I Fate La Grand Revolution Avec La Vestal, G. Introduit La Vorholt de Los Ex The Suspension of the Sixth Dans La Harmone Ray at La Grosse Case Dans L'Orchestre, Avec Court as G. Fate Un Pas D Plus En Avant, Puis G. Fate Toi Pas Avec Olympic. Normanel Alcidoret out C A Q G fate dans les premiers temps Berlin G voulez livre C taint de urbs oxyanalis Mais de poise G fate sent pas en avant avec Agnes de Hohenstaufen who G imagine unemployed deal orchestry rempel act in perfatement lore since then he had tried his hand at a new work Les Athenians the crown prince now king of Prussia footnote William the first had urged him to finish this work, and to testify to the truth of his words, he took several letters which he had received from this monarch out of his piscite butt, and handed them to us for inspection, not until he had insisted upon our reading them carefully through did he continue by saying that, in spite of this flattering invitation, he had given up the idea of setting this excellent subject to music, because he felt sure he could never surpass his Agnes von Hohenstaufen, nor invent anything new. In conclusion, he said, or, comment vowels vu quiquant puis inventor quel chose de nouveau, moi's pontini declarant ni pouvoir en aucune fake and surpasser messieurs precedents. D'autre partetent avise, q de poise la vestal il ni appointi te écrit you note qui ni fut volley de mes partitions. To prove that this assertion was not merely talk, but that it was based on scientific investigations, he quoted his wife, who was supposed to have read with him an elaborate discussion on the subject by a celebrated member of the French Academy, and he added that the essay in question had, for some mysterious reason, never been printed. In this very important and scientific treatise it was proved that without Spontini's invention of the suspension of the sixth in his Vestalin, the whole of modern melody would not have existed, and that any and every form of melody that had been used since had been borrowed from his compositions. I was thunderstruck, but hoped all the same to bring the inexorable master to a better frame of mind especially in regard to certain reservations he had made, I acknowledged that the academician in question was right in many ways, but I asked him if he did not believe that if somebody brought him a dramatic poem full of an absolutely new and hitherto unknown spirit, it would not inspire him to invent new musical combinations. With a ring of compassion in his voice, he replied that my question was wholly mistaken, in what would the novelty consist? Dan's La Vestal G. Compose on Sujet Romain. Dan's Ferd in Antcourt as on Sujet Espignascalamation. Dan's Olympic on Sujet Grecomesidinci. En fin Dan's Agnes D. Hohenstaufen on Sujet Talamond. Tout le reste neve aut rien. He hoped that I was not thinking of the so called romantic style of La With such childish stuff, no serious man could have anything to do. For art was a serious thing, and he had exhausted serious art. And, after all, what nation could produce the composer who could surpass him? Surely not the Italians, whom he characterized simply as cockins. Certainly not the French, who had only imitated the Italians. Nor the Germans, who would never get beyond their childhood in music, and who, if they had ever possessed any talent, had had it all spoiled for them by the Jews. Oh, croce musi il y avait de les pour l'alame lors g ties emperor de la musica Berlin, mais de poise cule roi de prussa livre sa musico de sordocacy ain par les du juf serents quile attires.
Tau Tespira State Perdu. Our charming hostess now thought it time to change the subject and to divert the master's thoughts. The theater was situated quite near to her house. She invited him to go across with our friend Hein, who was amongst the guests, and to have a look at Antigone, which was then being given, and which was sure to interest him on account of the antique equipment of the stage, which had been carried out according to Semper's excellent plans. At first he wanted to refuse, on the plea that he had seen all this so much better when his Olympia had been performed. After a while he consented, but in a very short time he returned to his original opinion, and, smiling scornfully, assured us that he had seen and heard enough to strengthen him in his verdict. Hein told us that shortly after he and Spontini had taken their seats in the almost empty amphitheater, and as soon as the Bacchus chorus had started, Spontini had said to him, Cess de Lauber Linersing S. Camaby, Alan Zusen, through an open door a streak of light had fallen on a lonely figure behind one of the columns. Hein had recognized Mendelssohn and concluded that he had overheard Spontini's remark. From the master's very excited conversations we soon realized very distinctly that he intended to stay longer in Dresden so as to get all his operas performed. It was Schroeder Vitterin's idea to save Spontini, in his own interest, from the mortifying disappointment of finding all his enthusiastic hopes in regard to a second performance of Vestal and Unfounded, and, if possible, to prevent this second performance during his stay in Dresden. She pretended to be ill, and the director requested me to inform Spontini of the fact that his production would have to be indefinitely postponed. This visit was so distasteful to me that I was glad to make it in Rockle's company. He was also a friend of Spontini's, and his French was, moreover, much better than mine. As we were quite prepared for a bad reception, we were really frightened to enter, Imagine, therefore, our astonishment when we found the master, who had already been informed of the news in a letter from Devriant, in the very brightest spirits. He told us that he had to leave immediately for Paris, and that from there he was to travel to Rome, the Holy Father having commanded him to come in order to receive the title of Count of San Andrea. Then he showed us a second document, in which the king of Denmark was supposed to have raised him to the Danish nobility. This meant, however, only that the title of Ritter of the Elephant Herder had been conferred upon him, and although this was indeed a high hunter, in speaking about it he only mentioned the word Ritter without referring to the particular order, because this seemed to him too ordinary for a person of his dignity. He was, however, childishly pleased over the affair, and felt that he had been miraculously rescued from the narrow sphere of his Dresden Vestal and production to find himself suddenly transported into regions of glory, from which he looked down upon the distressing opera world with sublime self-content. Meanwhile, Rockle and I silently thanked the Holy Father and the King of Denmark from the bottom of our hearts. We bowed an affectionate farewell to the strange master, and to cheer him I promised him seriously to think over his friendly advice with regard to my career as a composer of opera. Later on I heard what Spontini had said about me, on hearing that I had fled from Dresden for political reasons, and had sought refuge in Switzerland. He thought that this was in consequence of my share in a plot of high treason against the King of Saxony, whom he looked upon as my benefactor, because I had been nominated conductor of the royal orchestra, and he expressed his opinion about me by ejaculating in tones of the deepest anguish, quelling gratitude from Berlioz, who was at Spontini's deathbed until the end. I heard that the master had struggled most determinedly against death, and had cried repeatedly, Jean Eva Paz Marier, Jean Eva Paz Marier, when Berlioz tried to comfort him by saying, Comment Pauvs Wick Spencer Maurer Vu, Mon Maitre, Qui eats immortal, Spontini retorted angrily, Ni fates pas di malvasis placentaires, in spite of all the extraordinary experiences I had had with him. 
the news of his death which I received in Zurich, touched me very deeply. Later on I expressed my feelings towards him, and my opinion of him as an artist, in a somewhat condensed form in the Eigenskunch Eiting, and in this article the quality I extolled more particularly in him was that, unlike Meyer Beer, who was then the rage, and the very aged Rossini, he believed absolutely in himself and his art. All the same, and somewhat to my disgust, I could not but see that this belief in himself had deteriorated into a veritable superstition. I do not remember in those days having gone deeply into my feelings about Spontini's exceedingly strange individuality, nor do I recollect having troubled to discover how far they were consistent with the high opinion I formed of him after I had got to know him more intimately. Obviously, I had only seen the caricature of the man, although the tendency towards such plainly overweening self-confidence may, at all events, have manifested itself earlier in life. At the same time, one could trace in all this the influence of the decay of the musical and dramatic life of the period, which Spontini, situated as he was in Berlin, was well able to witness the surprising fact that he saw his chief merit in unincitional details showed plainly that his judgment had become childish. In my opinion, this did not detract from the great value of his works, however much he might exaggerate their value. In a sense, I could justify his boundless self-confidence, which was principally the outcome of the comparison between himself and the great composers who were now replacing him for in my heart of hearts I shared the contempt which he felt for these artists, although I did not dare to say so openly, and thus it came about that, in spite of his many somewhat absurd idiosyncrasies, I learned during this meeting at Dresden to feel a deep sympathy for this man, the like of whom I was never again to meet. Mine next experiences of important musical celebrities of this age were of quite a different character, Amongst the more distinguished of these was Heinrich Marschner, who, as a very young man, had been nominated musical director of the Dresden Orchestra by Weber. After Weber's death he seemed to have hoped that he would take his place entirely, and it was due less to the fact that his talent was still unknown than to his repellent manner that he was disappointed in his expectations. His wife, however, suddenly came into some money and this windfall enabled him to devote all his energies to his work as composer of operas, without being obliged to fill any fixed post. During the wild days of my youth, Marschner lived in Leipzig, where his operas Der Vamper and Templer Unjuden saw their first appearance. My sister Rosalie had once taken me to him in order to hear his opinion about me. He did not treat me uncivilly, but my visit led to nothing. I was also present at the first night of his opera de Faulkner's Brought, which, however, was not a success. Then he went to Hanover. His opera Hans Heiling, which was originally produced in Berlin, I heard for the first time in Würzburg. It showed vacillation in its tendency and a decrease in constructive power. After that he produced several other operas, such as Das Schloss Ametni and Der Babu, which never became popular. He was always neglected by the management at Dresden, as though they bore him some grudge, and only his Templar was played at all often. My colleague, Reisiger, had to conduct this opera, and, as in his absence, I always had to take his place. It also fell to my lot on one occasion to direct a performance of this work. This was during the time that I worked at Meitenhauser. I remember that, although I had often conducted this opera before in Magdeburg. On this occasion the wild nature of the instrumentation and its lack of mastership affected me to such an extent that it literally made me ill, and as soon as he returned, therefore, I implored Dreisiger at any cost to resume the leadership. On the other hand, immediately after my nomination I had started on the production of Hans Heiling, but merely for the sake of the artistic hunter, the insufficient distribution of the parts, however, a difficulty which in those days could not be overcome, made a complete success impossible. In any case, 
though the whole spirit of the work seemed to be terribly old-fashioned. I now heard that Marschner had finished another opera called Adolf von Nassau, and in a criticism of this work, of the genuineness of which I was unable to judge, particular stress was laid upon the patriotic and noble German atmosphere of this new creation. I did my best to make the Dresden Theatre take the initiative, and to urge Luttakow to secure this opera before it was produced elsewhere. Marschner, who did not seem to have been treated with particular consideration by the Hanoveri and Opry authorities, accepted the invitation with great joy, sent his score, and declared himself willing to come to Dresden for the first performance. Luttakow, however, was not anxious to see him take his place at the head of the orchestra, while I also was of the opinion that the too frequent appearance of outside conductors, even if it were for the purpose of conducting their own works, would not only lead to confusion, but might also fail to be as amusing and instructive as Spontini's visit had proved to be. It was therefore decided that I should conduct the new opera myself, and how I live to regret it. The score arrived to a weak plot by Karl Galmick, the composer of the Templar, had written such superficial music that the principal effect lay in a drinking song for a quartet, in which the German Rhine and German wine played the usual stereotyped part peculiar to such male quartets. I lost all courage, but we had to go on with it now, and all I could do was to try by maintaining a grave bearing to make the singers take an interest in their task. This, however, was not easy. To Tichicks and Mitter Wurchers were assigned the two principal male parts. Being both eminently musical, they sang everything at first sight, and after each number looked up at me as if to say, What do you think of it all? I maintained that it was good German music. They must not allow themselves to get confused but all they did was to stare at each other in amazement, not knowing what to make of me. Nevertheless, in the end they could not stand it any longer, and when they saw that I still retained my gravity, they burst into loud laughter, in which I could not help joining. I now had to take them into my confidence, and make them promise to follow my lead and pretend to be serious, for it was impossible to give up the opry at this stage, of the any scholarator singer of the latest style, Medenz Patzer Gentiludo came to us from Hanover, and on whose services Marschner greatly relied, was rather taken with her part chiefly because it gave her the chance of showing brilliancy, and, indeed, there was a finale in which my German master had actually tried to steal a march on Donizetti. The princess had been poisoned by a golden rose, a present from the wicked bishop of Mainz, and had become delirious. Adolf von Nassau, with the knights of the German Empire, swears vengeance, and, accompanied by the chorus, pours out his feelings in a strata of such incredible vulgarity and amateurisms that Donizetti would have thrown it at the head of any of his pupils who had dared to compose such a thing. Marschner now arrived for the dress rehearsal. He was very pleased, and, without compelling me to falsehood, he gave me sufficient opportunities for exercising my powers in the art of concealing my real thoughts. At all events I must have succeeded fairly well, for he had every reason to think himself considerately and kindly treated by me. During the performance the public behaved very much as the singers had done at the rehearsals. We had brought a stillborn child into the world, but Marschner was comforted by the fact that his drinking quartet was in chord. This was reminiscent of one of Becker's songs. See Solen in nicht haben den freien Deutschen Rhein, they shall not have it. Our free German Rhine. After the performance, the composer was my guest at a supper party at which, I am sorry to say, the singers, who had had enough of it, would not attend. Herr Ferdinand Hiller had the presence of mind to insist in his toast to Marschner, that whatever one might say, all stress must be laid on the German master and German art. Strangely enough, Marschner himself contradicted him by saying that there was something wrong with German operatic compositions. 
and that one ought to consider the singers and how to write more brilliantly for their voices than he had succeeded in doing up to the present. Highly gifted as Marshner was, there can be no doubt that the decline of his genius was due partly to a tendency which even in the aging master himself, as he frankly admitted, was effecting an important and most salutary change. In later years I met him once more in Paris at the time of my memorable production of Tannhauser. I did not feel inclined to renew the old relations. For, to tell the truth, I wanted to spare myself the unpleasantness of witnessing the consequences of his change of views, of which we had seen the beginning in Dresden. I learned that he was in a state of almost helpless childishness, and that he was in the hands of a young and ambitious woman who was trying to make a last attempt at conquering Paris for him, among other puff paragraphs calculated to spread Marshner's glory. I read one which said that the Parisians must not believe that I Wagner was representative of German art. No, if only Marshner were given a hearing, it would be discovered that he was beyond a doubt better suited to the French taste than I could ever be. Marshner died before his wife had succeeded in establishing this point, Ferdinand Hiller, on the other hand, who was in Dresden, behaved in a very charming and friendly manner, particularly at this time. Meyerbeer also stayed in the same town from time to time, precisely why nobody knew. Once he had rented a little house for the summer near the Pinrescherche lag, and under a pretty tree in the garden of this place he had had a small piano installed, wherein, in this idyllic retreat, he worked at his Feldelager in Schlesien. He lived in great retirement, and I saw very little of him. Ferdinand Hiller, on the contrary, took a commanding position in the Dresden musical world in so far as this was not already monopolist by the royal orchestra and its masters, and for many years he worked hard for its success, having a little private capital. He established himself comfortably amongst us and was soon known as a delightful host, who kept a pleasant house, which, thanks to his wife's influence, was frequented by a numerous Polish colony. Frau Hiller was indeed an exceptional Jewish woman of Polish origin, and she was perhaps all the more exceptional seeing that she, in company with her husband, had been baptized a Protestant in Italy. Hiller began his career in Dresden with the production of his opera Der Traum und der Christnach. Since the Underhof fact that Rienzi had been able to rouse the Dresden public to lasting enthusiasm, many an opera composer had felt himself drawn towards our Florence on the Elbe, of which Laub once said that as soon as one entered it one felt bound to apologies because one found so many good things there which one promptly forgot the moment one departed. The composer of Der Traum in Der Christnach looked upon this work as a peculiarly German composition. Hiller had set to music a gruesome play by Raupach, Der Muller und Sein Kind the Miller and His Child, in which father and daughter, within but a short space of time, both die of consumption. He declared that he had conceived the dialogue and the music of this opera in what he called the popular style but this work met with the same fate as that which, according to Liszt, befell all his compositions. In spite of his undoubted musical merits, which even Rossini acknowledged, and whether he gave them in French in Paris or in Italian in Italy, it was his sad experience always to see his operas fail. In Germany he had tried the Mendels in his style, and had succeeded in composing an oratorio called Dies Erstorn Jerusalems, which luckily was not taken notice of by the moody feet regung public, and which consequently received the unassailable reputation of being a solid German work. He also took Mendelssohn's place as director of the Leipzig Gewandhaus concerts when the latter was called to Berlin in the capacity of general director. Hiller's evil fortune still pursued him, however, and he was unable to retain his position everybody being given to understand that it was because his wife was not sufficiently acknowledged as concert prima donna. Mendelssohn returned and made Hiller leave, and Hiller boasted of having quarreled with him. 
Dresden and the success of my Rienzi now weighed so much upon his mind that he naturally made another attempt to succeed as an opera composer, owing to his great energy and to his position as son of a rich banker a special attraction even to the director of a court theatre. It happened that he induced them to put aside my poor friend Rockles Farinelli, the production of which had been promised him in favour of his Hiller's own work. Der Traum in der Christnach, he was of the opinion that next to Reisiger and myself, a man of greater musical reputation than Rockel was needed. Lut Akau, however, was quite content to have Reisiger and myself as celebrities, particularly as we got on so well together, and he remained deaf to Hiller's wishes. To me Der Traum in der Christnach was a great nuisance. I had to conduct it a second time, and before an empty house. Hiller now saw that he had been wrong in not taking my advice before, and in not shortening the opera by one act and altering the end, and he now fancied that he was doing me a great favour by at last declaring himself ready to act on my suggestion in the event of another performance of his opera being possible. I really managed to have it played once more. This was, however, to be the last time and Hiller, who had read my book of Tannhauser, thought that I had a great advantage over him in writing my own words. He therefore made me promise to help him with the choice and writing of a subject for his next opera. Shortly afterwards Hiller was present at a performance of Rienzi, which was again given before a crowded and enthusiastic house. When, at the end of the second act, and after frantic recalls from the audience, I left the orchestra in a great state of excitement. Hiller, who was waiting for me in the passage, took the opportunity of adding to his very hasty congratulations. To give my trom once more, I promised him laughingly to do this if I had the chance, but I cannot remember whether it came off or not. While he was waiting for the creation of an entirely new plot for his next opera, Hiller devoted himself to the study of chamber music to which his large and well-franchined's room lent itself most admirably. A beautiful and solemn event added to the seriousness of the mood in which I finished the music to Tannhauser towards the end of the year, and neutralized the more superficial impressions made upon me by the stirring events above described. This was the removal of the remains of Karl Marie Avon Weber from London to Dresden in December, as I have already said, a committee had for years been agitating for this removal. From information given by a certain traveller, it had become known that the insignificant coffin which contained Weber's ashes had been disposed of in such a careless way in a remote corner of street. Paul's, that it was feared it might soon become impossible to identify it. My energetic friend, Professor Lowe, whom I have already mentioned, had availed himself of this information in order to urge the Dresden Glee Club, which constituted his hobby, to take the matter in hand. The concert of male singers arranged to this end had been a fair success financially, and they now wanted to induce the theatre management to make similar efforts. When suddenly they met with serious opposition from this very quarter, the management of the Dresden Theatre told the committee that the king had religious scruples with regard to disturbing the peace of the dead. However much we felt inclined to doubt the genuineness of these reasons, nothing could be done, and I was next approached on the subject, in the hope that my influential position might lend weight to my appeal. I entered into the spirit of the enterprise with great fervour. I consented to be made President Herr Hoffert Schultz, director of the anti kibentabin who was a Welconner authority on artistic matters, and another gentleman, a Christian banker, were also elected members of the committee, and the movement thus received fresh life. Prospectuses were sent round, exhaustive plans were made, and numerous meetings held. Here, again, I met with opposition on the part of my chief, Lutakow, if he could have done so. He would have forbidden me to move in the matter by making the most of the king's scruples referred to above, but he had had a warning not to pick a quarrel with me after his experience in the summer, when, contrary to his expectations, 
the music written by me to celebrate the king's arrival had found Favour with the monarch. As his antipathy to the proceedings was not so very serious, La Acau must have seen that even the direct opposition of his majesty could not have prevented the enterprise from being carried out privately, and that, on the contrary, the court would cut a sorry figure if the royal court theatre to which Weber once belonged should assume a hostile attitude. He therefore tried in a wold friendly way to make me desist from furthering the cause, well knowing that, without me, the plan would fail. He tried to convince me that it would be wrong to pay this exaggerated hunter to Weber's memory, whereas nobody thought of removing the ashes of Morlachi from Italy, although the latter had given his services to the royal orchestra for a much longer period than Weber had done, what would be the consequence? By way of argument, he said, suppose Reisiger died on his journey to Sumwater in Slivis's wife would then be as much justified as was Frau von Weber, who had annoyed him quite enough already in expecting her husband's dead body to be brought home with music and pomp, I tried to calm him, and if I did not succeed in making him see the difference between Reisiger and Weber, I managed to make him understand that the affair must take its course. As the Berlin Court Theatre had already announced a benefit performance to support our undertaking, Meyerbeer, to whom my committee had applied, was instrumental in bringing this about and a performance of Urinth was actually given which yielded the handsome balance of 6,000 marks. A few theatres of lesser importance now followed our lead. The Dresden Court Theatre, therefore, could not hold back any longer, and as we now had a fairly large sum at the bank, we were able to cover the expenses of the removal, as well as the cost of an appropriate vault and monument, we even had a nucleus fund for a statue of Weber, which we were to fight for later on. The elder of the two sons of the immortal master traveled to London to fetch the remains of his father. He brought them by boat down the Elbe, and finally arrived at the Dresden land stage, from whence they were to be conducted to German soil. This last journey of the remains was to take place at night. A solemn torchlight procession was to be formed and I had undertaken to see to the funeral music. I arranged this from to motives out of Urinth, using that part of the music in the overture which relates to the vision of spirits. I introduced the cavatina from Urien Hyther Dick Tempquell here near the source, which I left unaltered except that I transposed it into B-flat major, and I finished the whole, as Weber finished his opera, by a return to the first sublime motive, I had orchestrated this symphonic piece, which was well suited to the purpose, for eight chosen wind instruments, and notwithstanding the volume of sound, I had not forgotten softness and delicacy of instrumentation. I substituted the gruesome tremolo of the violas, which appears in that part of the overture adapted by me, by twenty muffled drums, and as a whole attained to such an exceedingly impressive effect especially to us who were full of thoughts of Weber, that, even in the theatre where we rehearsed, Schroeder Verden, who was present, and who had been an intimate friend of Weber's, was deeply moved. I had never carried out anything more in keeping with the character of the subject, and the procession through the town was equally impressive, as the very slow tempo, devoid of any strongly marked accents, offered numerous difficulties, I had had the stage cleared for the rehearsal, in order to command a sufficient space for the musicians, once they had thoroughly practiced the piece, to walk round me in a circle playing all the while. Several of those who witnessed the procession from their windows assured me that the effect of the procession was indescribably and sublimely solemn. After we had placed the coffin in the little mortuary chapel of the Catholic cemetery in Friedprechst, where Madame Devriant met it with a wreath of flowers, we performed, on the following morning, the solemn ceremony of lowering it into the vault. Herr Hoffertschultz and myself, as presidents of the committee, were allowed the honor of speaking by the graveside, and what afforded me an appropriate subject for the few, somewhat affecting, words which I had to pronounce, 
was the fact that, shortly before the removal of Weber's remains, the second son of the master, Alexander von Weber, had died. The poor mother had been so terribly affected by the sudden death of this youth, so full of life and health, that had we not been in the very midst of our arrangements, we should have been compelled to abandon them, for in this new loss the widow saw a judgment of God who, in her opinion, looked upon the removal of the remains as an act of sacrilege prompted by vanity, as the public seemed particularly disposed to hold the same view. It fell to my lot to set the nature of our undertaking in the proper light before the eyes of the world, and this I so far succeeded in doing that, to my satisfaction, I learned from all sides that my justification of our action had received the most general acceptance. On this occasion I had a strange experience with regard to myself, when for the first time in my life I had to deliver a solemn public speech. Since then I have always spoken extemporary. This time, however, as it was my first appearance as an orator, I had written out my speech and carefully learned it by heart. As I was thoroughly under the influence of my subject, I felt so sure of my memory that I never thought of making any notes. Thanks to this omission, however, I made my brother Albert very unhappy. He was standing near me at the ceremony, and he told me afterwards that, in spite of being deeply moved, he felt at one moment as if he could have sworn at me for not having asked him to prompt me. It happened in this way I began my speech in a clear and full voice. But suddenly the sound of my own words and their particular intonation affected me to such an extent that, carried away as I was by my own thoughts, I imagined I saw as well as heard myself before the breathless multitude. While I thus appeared objectively to myself, I remained in a sort of trance, during which I seemed to be waiting for something to happen, and felt quite a different person from the man who was supposed to be standing and speaking there. It was neither nervousness nor abstendent times on my part. Only at the end of a certain sentence there was such a long pause that those who saw me standing there must have wondered what on earth to think of me. At last my own silence and the stillness round me reminded me that I was not there to listen, but to speak. I at once resumed my discourse, and I spoke with such fluency to the very end that the celebrated actor, Emile Evriant, assured me that, apart from the solemn service, he had been deeply impressed simply from the standpoint of a dramatic orator. The ceremony concluded with a poem written and set to music by myself, and, though it presented many difficulties for men's voices, it was splendidly rendered by some of the best opera singers. Lotta Cow, who was present, was now not only convinced of the justice of the enterprise, but also strongly in favour of it. I was deeply thankful that everything had succeeded so well, and when Weber's widow, upon whom I called after the ceremony, told me how profoundly she, too, had been moved, the only cloud that still darkened my horizon was dispelled. In my youth I had learned to love music through my admiration for Weber's genius, and the news of his death was a terrible blow to me, to have, as it were, come into contact with him again and after so many years by this second funeral was an event that stirred the very depths of my being. From all the particulars I have given concerning my intimacy with the great masters who were my contemporaries, it is easy to see at what sources I had been able to quench my thirst for intellectual intercourse. It was not a very satisfactory outlook to turn from Weber's grave to his living successors but I had still to find out how absolutely hopeless this was. I spent the winter of 1840 frost partly in yielding to attractions from outside, and partly in indulging in the deepest meditation, by dint of great energy, and by getting up very early. Even in winter, I succeeded in completing my score to Tannhauser Rurley in April, having, as already stated, finished the composition of it at the end of the preceding year. 
In writing down the orchestration I made things particularly difficult for myself by using the specially prepared paper which the printing process renders necessary, and which involved me in all kinds of trying formalities. I had each page transferred to the stone immediately, and a hundred copies printed from each, hoping to make use of these proofs for the rapid circulation of my work, whether my hopes were to be fulfilled or not. I was at all events fifteen hundred marks out of pocket when all the expenses of the publication were paid, in regard to this work which called for so many sacrifices, and which was so slow and difficult. More details will appear in my autobiography. At all events, when May came round I was in possession of a hundred neatly bound copies of my first new work since the production of The Fly and Her Hollander and Hiller, to whom I showed some parts of it, formed a tolerably good impression of its value. These plans for rapidly spreading the fame of Might Anhauser were made with the hope of a success which, in view of my needy circumstances, seemed ever more and more desirable. In the course of one year since I had begun my own publication of my operas, much had been done to this end. In September of the year 1844 I had presented the King of Saxony with a special richly bound copy of the complete P. and off fort arrangement of Rienzi, dedicated to His Majesty. The fly and her hall and her had also been finished, and the P. and off fort arrangement of Rienzi for duet, as well as some songs selected from both operas, had either been published or were about to be published. Apart from this I had had twenty five copies made of the scores of both these operas by means of the so-called autographic transfer process, although only from the writing of the copyists. All these heavy expenses made it absolutely imperative that I should try to send my scores to the different theatres, and induce them to produce my operas, as the outlay on the piano scores had been heavy and these could only have a sale if my works got to be known sufficiently well through the theatre. I now sent the score of my Rienzi to the more important theatres, but they all returned my work to me, the Munich Court Theatre even sending it back and opened. I therefore knew what to expect, and spared myself the trouble of sending my Dutchman. From a speculative business point of view the situation was this, the Hopeford success of Tannhauser would bring in its wake a demand for my earlier works. The worthy Messer, my agent, who was the music publisher appointed to the court, had also begun to feel a little doubtful, and saw that this was the only thing to do. I started at once on the publication of a P. and off fort arrangement of Tannhauser, preparing it myself while Rockle undertook the fly and her Hollander, and a certain clink did Rienzi. The only thing that Messer was absolutely opposed to was the title of my new opera, which I had just named Der Venisberg. He maintained that, as I did not mix with the public, I had no idea what horrible jokes were made about this title. He said the students and professors of the medical school in Dresden would be the first to make fun of it, as they had a predilection for that kind of obscene joke. I was sufficiently disgusted by these details to consent to the change to the name of my hero, Tannhauser. I added the name of the subject of the legend which, although originally not belonging to the Tannhauser myth, was thus associated with it by me, a fact which later on Simrock, the great investigator and innovator in the world of legend, whom I esteemed so highly, took very much amiss. Tannhauser under Sankariki off Wartburg should henceforth be its title, and to give the work Comedia Veli appearance I had the words specially printed in Gothic characters upon the piano arrangement, and in this way introduced the work to the public. The extra expenses this involved were very heavy, but I went to great pains to impress Messer with my belief in the success of my work. So deeply were we involved in this scheme, and so great were the sacrifices it had compelled us to make, that there was nothing else for it but to trust to a special turn of fortune's wheel. As it happened, the management of the theatre shared my confidence in the success of Tannhauser, 
I had induced Lutakow to have the scenery for Tannhauser painted by the best painters of the great opera house in Paris. I had seen their work on the Dresden stage. It belonged to the style of German scenic art which was then fashionable, and really gave the effect of first Skull's work. The order for this, as well as the necessary negotiations with the Parisian painter, Despolic, had already been settled in the preceding autumn. The management agreed to all my wishes, even to the ordering of beautiful costumes of meaty Availi character designed by my friend Hein. The only thing Lutakow constantly postponed was the order for the Hall of Song on the Wartburg. He maintained that the Hall for Kaiser Karl the Great in Oberon, which had only recently been delivered by some French painters, would answer the purpose just as well. With superhuman efforts I had to convince my chief that we did not want a brilliant thrunum, but a scenic picture of a certain character such as I saw before my mind's eye, and that it could be painted only according to my directions. As in the end I became very irritable and cross, he soothed me by saying that he had no objection to having this scene painted, and that he would order it to be commenced at once, adding that he had not agreed immediately only with the view of making my joy the greater, because what one obtained without difficulty one rarely appreciated. This hall of song was fated to cause me great trouble later on. Thus everything was in full swing circumstances were favorable, and seemed to cast a hopeful light upon the production of my new work at the beginning of the autumn season. Even the public was looking forward to it and for the first time I saw my name mentioned in a friendly manner in a communication to the Algemeine Zeitung. They actually spoke of the great expectations they had of my new work, the poem of which had been written with undoubted poetic feeling. Full of hope, I started in July on my holiday, which consisted of a journey to Marine Bard in Bohemia, where my wife and I intended to take the cure Again I found myself on the volcanic soil of this extraordinary country. Bohemia, which always had such an inspiring effect on me, it was a marvelous summer, almost too hot, and I was therefore in high spirits. I had intended to follow the easy-going mode of life which is a necessary part of this somewhat trying treatment, and had selected my books with care, taking with me the poems of Wolfram von Eschenbach, edited by Simrock and Sanmart, as well as the anonymous epic Lohengrin, with its lengthy introduction by Gores. With my book under my arm I hid myself in the neighboring woods, and pitching my tent by the brook in company with Titterell and Parsifal, I lost myself in Wolfram's strange yet irresistibly charming poem. Soon, however, a longing seized me to give expression to the inspiration generated by this poem, so that I had the greatest difficulty in overcoming my desire to give up the rest I had been prescribed while partaking of the water of Marine Bard. The result was an Evernsikersing state of excitement. Lo and grin, the first conception of which dates from the end of my time in Paris, stood suddenly revealed before me, complete in every detail of its dramatic construction, the legend of the swan which forms such an important feature of all the many versions of this series of myths that my studies had brought to my notice, exercised a singular fascination over my imagination. Remembering the doctor's advice, I struggled bravely against the temptation of writing down my ideas, and resorted to the most strange and energetic methods. Owing to some comments I had read in Gerviens's History of German Literature, both the Meister Sin von Nuremberg and Hans Sachs had acquired quite a vital charm for me. The marker alone, and the part he takes in the master signing, were particularly pleasing to me, and on one of my lonely walks, without knowing anything particular about Hans Sachs and his poetic contemporaries, I thought out a humorous scene in which the cobbler is a popular artisan with the hammer on his last, gives the marker a practical lesson by making him sing, thereby taking revenge on him for his conventional misdeeds. To me the force of the whole scene was concentrated in the two following points. 
on the one hand the marker with his slate covered with chalk marks and on the other hans sacks holding up the shoes covered with his chalk marks each intimating to the other that the singing had been a failure to this picture by way of concluding the second act i added a scene consisting of a narrow crooked little street in nuremberg with the people all running about in great excitement and ultimately engaging in a street brawl thus suddenly the whole of my meisterson comedy took shape so vividly before me that inasmuch as it was a particularly cheerful subject and not in the least likely to overexcite my nerves i felt i must write it out in spite of the doctor's orders i therefore proceeded to do this and hoped it might free me from the thrall of the idea of low and grin but i was mistaken for no sooner had i got into my bath at noon than i felt an overpowering desire to write out low and grin and this longing so overcame me that i could not wait the prescribed hour for the bath but when a few minutes elapsed jumped out and barely giving myself time to dress ran home to write out what i had in my mind i repeated this for several days until the complete sketch of low and grin was on paper the doctor then told me i had better give up taking the waters and baths saying emphatically that i was quite unfit for such cures my excitement had grown to such an extent that even my efforts to sleep as a rule ended only in nocturnal adventures among some interesting excursions that we made at this time one too eager fascinated me particularly on account of its association with wallenstein and of the peculiar costumes of the inhabitants in mid-august we travelled back to dresden where my friends were glad to see me in such good spirits as for myself i felt as if i had wings in september when all our singers had returned from their summer holidays i resumed the rehearsals of tannhauser with great earnestness we had now got so far at least with the musical part of the performance that the possible date of the production seemed quite close at hand schroeder verden was one of the first to realize the extraordinary difficulties which the production of tannhauser would entail and indeed she saw these difficulties so clearly that to my great discomfiter she was able to lay them all before me once when i called upon her she read the principal passages aloud with great feeling and force and then she asked me how i could have been so simple-minded as to have thought that so childish a creature as tichixt would be able to find the proper tones for tannhauser i tried to bring her attention and my own to bear upon the nature of the music which was written so clearly in order to bring out the necessary accent that in my opinion the music actually spoke for him who interpreted the passage even if he were only a musical singer and nothing more she shook her head saying that this would be all right in the case of an oratorio she now sang elizabeth's prayer from the piano score and asked me if i really thought that this music would answer my intentions if sung by a young and pretty voice without any soul or without that experience of life which alone could give the real expression to the interpretation i sighed and said that in that case the youthfulness of the voice and of its owner must make up for what was lacking at the same time i asked her as a favour to see what she could do towards making my niece to hannah understand her part all this however did not solve the tannhauser problem for any effort at teaching tichixt would only have resulted in confusion i was therefore obliged to rely entirely upon the energy of his voice and on the singer's peculiarly sharp speaking tone devrient's anxiety about the principal parts arose partly out of concern about her own she did not know what to do with the part of venus she had undertaken it for the sake of the success of the performance for although a small part so much depended upon its being ideally interpreted later on when the work was given in paris i became convinced that this part had been written into sketchy a style and this induced me to reconstruct it by making extensive additions and by supplying all that which i felt it lacked for the moment however 
it looked as if no art on the part of the singer could give to this sketch anything of what it ought to represent the only thing that might have helped towards a satisfactory impersonation of venus would have been the artist's confidence in her own great physical attraction and in the effect it would help to produce by appealing to the purely material sympathies of the public the certainty that these means were no longer at her disposal paralyzed this great singer who could hide her age and matronly appearance no longer she therefore became self conskies and unable to use even the usual means for gaining an effect on one occasion with a little smile of despair she expressed herself incapable of playing venus for the very simple reason that she could not appear dressed like the goddess what on earth am I to wear as Venus? She exclaimed, After all, I cannot be clad in a belt alone. A nice figure of fun I should look, and you would laugh on the wrong side of your face. On the whole, I still built my hopes upon the general effect of the music alone, the great promise of which at the rehearsals greatly encouraged me. Hiller, who had looked through the score and had already praised it, assured me that the instrumentation could not have been carried out with greater sobriety the characteristic and delicate sonority of the orchestra delighted me and strengthened me in my resolve to be extremely sparing in the use of my orchestral material in order to attain that abundance of combinations which i needed for my later works at the rehearsal my wife alone missed the trumpets and trombones that gave such brightness and freshness to Rienzi. Although I laughed at this, I could not help feeling anxious when she confided to me how great had been her disappointment when, at the theater rehearsal, she noticed the really feeble impression made by the music of the Sankariki, speaking from the point of view of the public, who always want to be amused or stirred in some way or other. She had thus very rightly called attention to an exceedingly questionable side of the performance, but I saw at once that the fault lay less with the conception than with the fact that I had not controlled the production with sufficient care. In regard to the conception of this scene, I was literally on the horns of a dilemma, for I had to decide once for all whether this Sankariki was to be a concert of arias or a competition in dramatic poetry. There are many people even nowadays in spite of having witnessed a perfectly successful production of this scene, have not received the right impression of its purport. Their idea is that it belongs to the traditional operatic genre, which demands that a number of vocal evolutions shall be juxtaposed or contrasted, and that these different songs are intended to amuse and interest the audience by means of their purely musical changes in rhythm and time on the principle of a concert program by various items of different styles this was not at all my idea my real intention was if possible to force the listener for the first time in the history of opera to take an interest in a poetical idea by making him follow all its necessary developments for it was only by virtue of this interest that he could be made to understand the catastrophe which in this instance was not to be brought about by any outside influence but must be the outcome simply of the natural spiritual processes at work hence the need of great moderation and breadth in the conception of the music first in order that according to my principle it might prove helpful rather than the reverse to the understanding of the potical lines and secondly in order that the increasing rhythmic character of the melody which marks the ardent growth of passion may not be interrupted too arbitrarily by unnecessary changes in modulation and rhythm hence too the need of a very sparing use of orchestral instruments for the accompaniment and an intentional suppression of all those purely musical effects which must be utilized and that gradually only when the situation becomes so intense that one almost ceases to think and can only feel the tragic nature of the crisis no one could deny that i had contrived to produce the proper effect of this principle the moment i played the sankariki on the piano with the view of ensuring all my future successes 
I was now confronted with the exceptional difficulty of making the opera singers understand how to interpret their parts precisely in the way I desired. I remembered how, through lack of experience, I had neglected properly to superintend the production of the fly and her hollander, and as I now fully realized all the disastrous consequences of this neglect, I began to think of means by which I could teach the singers my own interpretation. I have already stated that it was impossible to influence Dichixt, for if he were made to do things he could not understand, he only became nervous and confused. He was conscious of his advantages. He knew that with his metallic voice he could sing with great musical rhythm and accuracy, while his delivery was simply perfect. But, to my great astonishment, I was soon to learn that all this did not by any means suffice. For, to my horror, at the first performance, that which had strangely escaped my notice in the rehearsals became suddenly apparent to me, at the close of the Sankariki, when Tannhauser in frantic excitement, and forgetful of everybody present has to sing his praise to Venus, and I saw Dichix moving towards Elizabeth and addressing his passionate outburst to her. I thought of Schroeder Vitterin's warning in very much the same way as Croesus must have thought when he cried, O oh, Solon, Solon, at the funeral pyre, in spite of the musical excellence of Tichix, the enormous life and melodic charm of the Sankariki failed entirely. On the other hand, I succeeded in calling into life an entirely new element such as probably had never been seen in opera. I had watched the young baritone Mitter Wurchers with great interest in some of his parts. He was a strangely reticent man, and not at all sociably inclined, and I had noticed that his delightfully mellow voice possessed the rare quality of bringing out the inner note of the soul. To him I entrusted Wolfram, and I had every reason to be satisfied with his zeal and with the success of his studies. Therefore, if I wished my intention and method to become known, especially in regard to this difficult anchorage, I had to rely on him for the proper execution of my plans and everything they involved. I began by going through the opening song of this scene with him, but... After I had done my utmost to make him understand how I wanted it done, I was surprised to find how very difficult this particular rendering of the music appeared to him. He was absolutely incapable of repeating it after me, and with each renewed effort his singing became so commonplace and so mechanical that I realized clearly that he had not understood this piece to be anything more than a phrase in recitative form which he might render with any inflections of the voice that happened to be prescribed, or which might be sung either this way or that, according to fancy, as was usual in operatic pieces. He, too, was astonished at his own want of capacity, but was so struck by the novelty and the justice of my views that he begged me not to try any more for the present but to leave him to find out for himself how best to become familiar with this newly revealed world. During several rehearsals he only sang in a whisper in order to get over the difficulty, but at the last rehearsal he acquitted himself so admirably of his task, and threw himself into it so heartily, that his work has remained to this day as my most conclusive reason for believing that, in spite of the unsatisfactory state of the world of operato day, it is possible not only to find, but also properly to train, the singer whom I should regard as indispensable for a correct interpretation of my works. It was through the impression made by Mitter Wurchers that I ultimately succeeded in making the public understand the whole of my work. This man, who had utterly changed himself in bearing, look, and appearance in order to fit himself to the role of Wolfram, had, in thus solving the problem, not only become a thorough artist, but by his interpretation of his part had also proved himself my savior at the very moment when my work was threatening to fail through the unsatisfactory result of the first performance. By his side the part of Elizabeth made a sweet impression, the youthful appearance of my niece, her tall and slender form, the decidedly German cast of her features, 
as well as the incomparable beauty of her voice, with its expression of almost childlike innocence, helped her to gain the hearts of the audience, even though her talent was more theatrical than dramatic. She soon rose to fame by her impersonation of this part, and often in later years, when speaking about Tannhauser performances in which she had appeared, People used to tell me that its success had been entirely due to her. Strange to say, in such reports people referred principally to the charm of her acting at the moment when she received the guests in the Wartburg Hall, and I used to account for this by remembering the untiring efforts with which my talented brother and I had trained her to perform this very part and yet it was never possible to make her understand the proper interpretation of the prayer in the third act, and I felt inclined to say, O oh, Solon, Solon, as I had done in the case of Tichikston, when after the first performance I was obliged to make a considerable cut in this solo, a proceeding which greatly reduced its importance forever afterwards, I heard later that Johanna, who for a short period actually had the reputation of being a great singer, had never succeeded in singing the prayer as it ought to be sung, whereas a French singer, Mademoiselle Maurice Axe, achieved this in Paris to my entire satisfaction. In the beginning of October we had so far progressed with our rehearsals that nothing stood in the way of an immediate production of Tannhauser save the scenery, which was not yet complete. A few only of the scenes ordered from Paris had arrived, and even these had come very late. The Wartburg Valley was beautifully effective and perfect in every detail. The inner part of the Venisburg, however, gave me much anxiety the painter had not understood me. He had painted clusters of trees and statues, which reminded one of Versailles, and had placed them in a wild cave. He had evidently not known how to combine the weird with the alluring. I had to insist on extensive alterations, and chiefly on the painting out of the shrubs and statues, all of which required time. The grotto had to lie half hidden in a rosy cloud, through which the Wartburg Valley had to loom in the distance. This was to be done in strict obedience to my own ideas. The greatest misfortune, however, was to befall me in the shape of the tardy delivery of the scenery for the Hall of Song. This was due to great negligence on the part of the Paris artists, and we waited and waited until every detail of the opera had been studied and studied again at Nauzim. Daily I went to the railway station and examined all the packages and boxes that had arrived, but there was no Hall of Song. At last I allowed myself to be persuaded not to postpone the first performance any longer, and I decided to use the Hall of Karl the Great out of Oberon, originally suggested to me by Lutakow instead of the real thing, considering the importance I attached to practical effect. This entailed a great sacrifice of my personal feelings, and true enough when the curtain rose for the second act, the reappearance of this thrunerm, which the public had seen so often, added considerably to the general disappointment of the audience, who had anticipated astonishing surprises in this opera. On the 19th of October the first performance took place. In the morning of that day a very beautiful young lady was introduced to me by the leader Lipinski. Her name was Madame Ivalergies, and she was a niece of the Russian Chancellor. Count von Nesselrod. Liszt had spoken to her about me with such enthusiasm that she had traveled all the way to Dresden especially to hear the first production of my new work. I thought I was right in regarding this flattering visit as a good omen, but although on this occasion she turned away from me, somewhat perplexed and disappointed by the very unintelligible performance and the somewhat doubtful reception with which it met, I had sufficient cause in afteries to know how deeply this remarkable and energetic woman had nevertheless been impressed. A great contrast to this visit was one I received from a peculiar man called C. Gaylord. He was the editor of a Berlin musical paper, which had only just started, and in which I had read with great astonishment an entirely favorable and important criticism of my fly and her Hollander. 
although necessity had compelled me to remain indifferent to the attitude of the critics, yet this particular notice gave me much pleasure, and I had invited my unknown critic to come and hear the first production of Tannhauser in Dresden. This he did, and I was deeply touched to find that I had to deal with a young man who, in spite of being threatened by consumption, and being also exceedingly badly off, had come at my invitation, simply from a sense of duty and honor, and not with any mercenary motive. I saw from his knowledge and capacities that he would never be able to attain a position of great influence, but his kindness of heart and his extraordinarily receptive mind filled me with a feeling of profound respect for him. A few years later I was very sorry to hear that he had at last succumbed to the terrible disease from which I knew him to be suffering, for to the very end he remained faithful and devoted to me, in spite of the most trying circumstances. Meanwhile I had renewed my acquaintance with the friend I had won through the production of the Fly and her Hollander in Berlin, and who for a long time I had never had an opportunity of knowing more thoroughly, the second time I met her was at Schroeder Veterans, with whom she was already on friendly terms, and of whom she used to speak as one of my greatest conquests. She was already past her first youth, and had no beauty of feature except remarkably penetrating and expressive eyes that showed the greatness of soul with which she was gifted. She was the sister of Frommen, the bookseller of Gina and could relate many intimate facts about Goethe, who had stayed at her brother's house when he was in that town. She had held the position of reader and companion to the Princess Augusta of Prussia, and had thus become intimately acquainted with her, and was regarded by her own association as almost a bosom friend and confidant of that great lady. Nevertheless, she lived in extreme poverty, and seemed proud of being able by means of her talent as a painter of array boxes, to secure for herself some sort of independence. She always remained faithfully devoted to me, as she was one of the few who were uneflundus by the unfavorable impression produced by the first performance of Tannhauser, and promptly expressed her appreciation of my latest work with the greatest enthusiasm. With regard to the production itself, the conclusions I drew from it were as follows. The real faults in the work, which I have already mentioned incidentally, lay in the sketchy and clumsy portrayal of the part of Venus, and consequently of the whole of the introductory scene of the first act. In consequence of this defect, the drama never even rose to the level of genuine warmth. Still less did it attain to the heights of passion which, according to the poetic conception of the part, should so strongly work upon the feelings of the audience as to prepare them for the inevitable catastrophe in which the scene culminates, and thus led up to the tragic denouement. This great scene was a complete failure, in spite of the fact that it was entrusted to so great an actress as Schroeder Verden, and a singer so unusually gifted as Tichik's the genius of Devriant might yet have struck the right note of passion in the scene had she not chanced to be acting with a singer incapable of all dramatic seriousness, and whose natural gifts only fitted him for joyous or declamatory accents, and who was totally incapable of expressing pain and suffering. It was not until Wolfram's touching song and the closing scene of this act were reached that the audience showed any signs of emotion. Tichik strought such a tremendous effect in the concluding phrase by the jubilant music of his voice that, as I was afterwards informed, the end of this first act left the audience in a great state of enthusiasm. This was maintained, and even exceeded in the second act, during which Elizabeth and Wolfram made a very sympathetic impression. It was only the hero of Tannhauser who continued to lose ground, and at last so completely failed to hold the audience that in the final scene he almost broke down himself in dejection, as though the failure of Tannhauser were his own. The fatal defect of his performance lay in his inability to find the right expression for the theme of the great adagio passage of the finale beginning with the words, 
who led the sinner to salvation, the heaven-sent messenger drew near. The importance of this passage I have explained at length in my subsequent instructions for the production of Tannhauser, indeed, owing to Tychix's absolutely expressionless rendering, which made it seem terribly long and tedious, I had to omit it entirely from the second performance, as I did not wish to offend so devoted and, in his way, so deserving a man as Tychix to I let it be understood I had come to the conclusion that this theme was a failure. Moreover, as Tychix was thought to be an actor chosen by myself to take the parts of the heroes in my works, this passage, which was so immeasurably vital to the opera, continued to be omitted in all the subsequent productions of Tannhauser, as though this proceeding had been approved and demanded by me. I therefore cherished no illusions about the value of the subsequent universal success of this opera on the German stage. My hero, who, in rapture as in woe, should always have asserted his feelings with boundless energy, slunk away at the end of the second act with the humble bearing of a penitent's inner, only to reappear in the third with a demeanor designed to awaken the charitable sympathy of the audience, his pronunciation of the Pope's excommunication, however, was rendered with his usual full rhetorical power, and it was refreshing to hear his voice dominating the accompanying trombones. Granted that this radical defect in the hero's acting had left the public in a doubtful and unsatisfied state of suspense regarding the meaning of the whole, yet the mistake in the execution of the final scene arising from my own inexperience in this new field of dramatic creation, undoubtedly contributed to produce a chilling uncertainty as to the true significance of the scenic action. In my first complete version I had made Venus, on the occasion of her second attempt to recall her faithless lover, appear in a vision to Tannhauser when he is in a frenzy of madness, and the awfulness of the situation is merely suggested by a faint roseate glow upon the distant Horselberg. Even the definite announcement of Elizabeth's death was a sudden inspiration on the part of Wolfram. This idea I intended to convey to the listening audience solely by the sound of bells tolling in the distance, and by a faint gleam of torches to attract their eyes to the remote Wartburg. Moreover, there was a lack of precision and clearness in the appearance of the chorus of young pilgrims, whose duty it was to announce the miracle by their song alone. At that time I had given them no budding staves to carry, and had unfortunately spoiled their refrain by a tedious and unbroken monotony of accompaniment. When at last the curtain fell, I was under the impression, not so much from the behavior of the audience, which was friendly, as from my own inward conviction, that the failure of this work was to be attributed to the immature and unsuitable material used in its production. My depression was extreme, and a few friends who were present after the piece, among them my dear sister Clary and her husband, were equally affected. That very evening I decided to remedy the defects of the first night before the second performance, I was conscious of where the principal fault lay, but hardly dared give expression to my conviction. At the slightest attempt on my part to explain anything to Tychix, I had to abandon it. As I realized the impossibility of success, I should only have made him so embarrassed and annoyed that on one pretext or another he would never have sung Tannhauser again. In order to ensure the repetition of my opera, Therefore, I took the only course open to me by arrogating to myself all blame for the failure. I could thus make considerable curtailments, whereby, of course, the dramatic significance of the leading role was considerably lessened. This, however, did not interfere with the other parts of the opera, which had been favorably received. Consequently, Although inwardly very humiliated, I hoped to gain some advantage for my work at the second performance, and was particularly desirous that this should take place with as little delay as possible. But Tychix was hoarse, and I had to possess my soul in patience for fully a week. I can hardly describe what I suffered during that time. It seemed as if this delay would completely ruin my work. 
Every day that elapsed between the first and second performance left the result of the former more and more problematic, until at last it appeared to be a generally acknowledged failure, while the public as a whole expressed angry astonishment that, after the approval they had shown of my Renzi, I had paid no attention to their taste in writing my new work. There were May kind and judicious friends who were utterly perplexed at its inefficiency, the principal parts of which they had been unable to understand, or thought were imperfectly sketched and finished. The critics, with unconcealed joy, attacked it as Raven's attack carry unthrown out to them. Even the passions and prejudices of the day were drawn into the controversy in order, if possible, to confuse men's minds and prejudice them against me. It was just at the time when the Gemrinthalikich agitation, set in motion by Chersky and Wrong as a highly meritorious and liberal movement, was causing a great commotion. It was now made out that by Tannhauser Rye had provoked a reactionary tendency, and that precisely as Meyerbeer with his Huguenots had glorified Protestantism, so I with my latest opera would glorify Catholicism. The rumor that in writing Tannhauser Rye had been bribed by the Catholic part was believed for a long time, while the effort was being made to ruin my popularity by this means. I had the questionable honor of being approached, first by letter, afterwards in person, by a certain M. Rousseau, at that time editor of the Prussian Stotzting, who wished for my friendship and help. I knew of him only in connection with a scathing criticism of my fly and her Hollander. He informed me that he had been sent from Austria to further the Catholic cause in Berlin, but that he had had so many sad experiences of the fruitlessness of his efforts, that he was now returning to Vienna to continue his work in this direction undisturbed, with which work I had, by my Enhauser, proclaimed myself fully in accord. That remarkable paper, the Dresdener Anzeiger, which was a local organ for the redress of slander and scandal, daily published some fresh bit of news to my prejudice. At last I noticed that these attacks were met by witty and forcible little snubs, and also that encouraging comments appeared in my favour, which for some time surprised me very much, as I knew that only enemies and never friends interested themselves in such cases. But I learned, to my amusement, from Rockel, that he and my friend Hein had carried out this inspiriting campaign on my behalf. The if leaking against me in this quarter was only troublesome because at that unfortunate period a die was hindered from expressing myself through my work. Tichikst continued hoarse, and it was said he would never sing in my opry again. I heard from Lutakow that, scared by the failure of Tannhauser, he was holding himself in readiness to countermand the order for the promised scenery for the Hall of Song, or to cancel it altogether. I was so terrified at the cowardice which was thus revealed, that I myself began to look upon Tenhauser as doomed. My prospects and my whole position, when viewed in this mood, may be readily gathered from my communications, especially those referring to my negotiations for the publication of my works. This terrible week dragged out like an endless eternity. I was afraid to look anybody in the face, but was one day obliged to go to Messrs. Music Shop, where I met Gottfried Semper just buying a textbook of Tannhauser. Only a short time before I had been very much put out in discussing this subject with him. He would listen to nothing I had to say about the Minnesangers and pilgrims of the Middle Ages in connection with art but gave me to understand that he despised me for my choice of such material, while Messer assured me that no inquiry whatever had been received for the numbers of Tannhauser already published. It was strange that my most energetic antagonist should be the only person who had actually bought and paid for a copy. In a peculiarly earnest and impressive manner, he remarked to me that it was necessary to be thoroughly acquainted with the subject if a just opinion was to be passed on it, and that for this purpose, unfortunately, nothing but the text was available. This very meeting with Semper, strange as it may appear, was the first really encouraging sign that I can remember. 
but I found my greatest consolation in those days of trouble and anxiety in Rockle, who from that time forward entered into a lifelong intimacy with me. He had, without my being aware of it, disputed, explained, quarreled, and petitioned on my behalf, and thereby roused himself to a veritable enthusiasm for Tannhauser. The evening before the second performance, which was at last to take place, we met over a glass of beer, and his bright demeanor had such a cheering effect upon me that we became very lively. After contemplating my head for some time, he swore that it was impossible to destroy me, that there was a something in me, something probably in my blood, as similar characteristics also appeared in my brother Albert, who was otherwise so unlike me. To speak more plainly, he called it the peculiar heat of my temperament. This heat, he thought, might consume others, whereas I appeared to feel at my best when it glowed most fiercely, for he had several times seen me positively ablaze. I laughed and did not know what to make of his nonsense. Well, he said, I should soon see what he meant in Tannhauser, for it was simply absurd to think the work would not live and he was absolutely certain of its success. I thought over the matter on my way home, and came to the conclusion that if Tannhauser did indeed win its way, and become really popular, incalculable possibilities might be attained. At last the time arrived for our second performance. For this I thought I had made due preparation by lessening the importance of the principal part, and lowering my original ideals about some of the more important portions and I hoped by accentuating certain undoubtedly attractive passages to secure a genuine appreciation of the whole. I was greatly delighted with the scenery which had at last arrived for the whole of song in the second act, the beautiful and imposing effect of which cheered us all, for we looked upon it as a good omen. Unfortunately I had to bear the humiliation of seeing the theatre nearly empty. This, more than anything else, sufficed to convince me what the opinion of the public really was in regard to my work. But, if the audience was scanty, the majority, at any rate, consisted of the first friends of my art, and the reception of the piece was very cordial. Mitterwurchers especially aroused the greatest enthusiasm. As for Tichixt, my anxious friends, Rockle and Hine, thought it necessary to endeavor by every artifice to keep him in a good humor for his part, in order to give practical assistance in making the undoubted obscurity of the last scene clear. My friends had asked several young people, more especially artists, to give vent to torrents of applause at those parts which are not generally regarded by the operoiging public as provoking any demonstration. Strange to say, the outburst of applause thus provoked after the words, An angel flies to God's throne for thee, and will make his voice heard Heinrich. Thou art saved, made the entire situation suddenly clear to the public. At all subsequent productions this continued to be the principal moment for the expression of sympathy on the part of the audience. Although it had passed quite unnoticed on the first night, a few days later a third performance took place, but this time before a full house. Schroeder Verden, depressed at the small share she was able to take in the success of my work, watched the progress of the opera from the small stage box. She informed me that Lutakow had come to her with a beaming face, saying he thought we had now carried Tannhauser happily through, and this certainly proved to be the case. We often repeated it in the course of the winter, but noticed that when two performances followed close upon one another, there was not such a rush for the second, from which we concluded that I had not yet gained the approval of the great operating public, but only of the more cultured section of the community. Among these real friends of Tannhauser there were many, as I gradually discovered, who as a rule never visited the theater at all, and least of all the opera. This interest on the part of a totally new public continued to grow in intensity, and expressed itself in a delightful and hitherto unknown manner by a strong sympathy for the author. It was particularly painful to me, on Tichix's account, 
to respond alone to the calls of the audience after almost every act. However, I had at last to submit, as my refusal would only have exposed the vocalist to fresh humiliations. For when he appeared on the stage with his colleagues without me, the loud shouts from me were almost insulting to him. With what genuine eagerness did I wish that the contrary were the case, and that the excellence of the execution might overshadow the author, the conviction that I should never attain this with Mike Anhauser in Dresden guided me in all my future undertakings. But, at all events, in producing Tannhauser in this city I had succeeded in making at least the cultured public acquainted with my peculiar tendencies, by stimulating their mental faculties and stripping the performance of all realistic accessories. I did not, however, succeed in making these tendencies sufficiently clear in a dramatic performance, and in such an irresistible and convincing manner as also to familiar the uncultivated taste of the ordinary public with them when they saw them embodied on the stage, by enlarging the circle of my acquaintances, and making interesting friends, I had a good opportunity during the winter of obtaining further information on this point in a way that was both instructive and encouraging. My acquaintance and close intimacy at this time with Dr. Herman Frank of Breslau, who had for some time been living quietly in Dresden, was also very inspiring. He was very comfortably off and was one of those men who, by a wide knowledge and good judgment, combined with considerable gifts as an author, won an excellent reputation for himself in a large and select circle of private friends, without, however, making any great name for himself with the public. He endeavored to use his knowledge and abilities for the general good, and was induced by Brockhaus to edit the Deutsch Allgemeines Eiting when it first started. This paper had been founded by Brockhaus some years earlier. However, after editing it for a year, Frank resigned this post, and from that time forward it was only on the very rarest occasions that he could be persuaded to touch anything connected with journalism. His curt and spirited remarks about his experiences in connection with the Deutsch Allgemeines Eiting justified his disinclination to engage in any work connected with the public press. My appreciation was all the greater, therefore, when, without any persuasion on my part, he wrote a full report on Tannhauser for the Augsburger Allgemeines Eiting. This appeared in October or November 1840 in a supplement to that paper, and although it contained the first account of a work which has since been so widely discussed, I regard it, after mature consideration, as the most fairy kang and exhaustive that has ever been written. By this means my name figured for the first time in the great European political paper, whose columns, in consequence of a remarkable change of front which was to the interests of the proprietors, have since been opened to any one who wished to make merry at the expense of me or my work. The point which particularly attracted me in drive, Frank was the delicate and tactful art he displayed in his criticism and his methods of discussion. There was something distinguished about them that was not so much the outcome of rank and social position as of genuine worldwide culture. The delicate coldness and reserve of his manner charmed rather than repelled me, as it was a characteristic I had not met with hitherto. When I found him expressing himself with some reserve in regard to persons who enjoyed a reputation to which I did not think they were always entitled, I was very pleased to see during my intercourse with him that in many ways I exercised a decisive influence over his opinion. Even at that time I did not care to let it pass unchallenged when people evaded the close analysis of the work of this or that celebrity by referring in terms of eulogy to his good notcher. I even cornered my worldly wise friend on this point. When a few years later I had the satisfaction of getting from him a very concise explanation of Meyer Beer's good notcher, of which he had once spoken, and he recalled with a smile the extraordinary questions I had put to him at the time. He was, however, 
quite alarmed when I gave him a very lucid explanation of the disinterestedness and conspicuous altruism of Mendelssohn in the service of art, of which he had spoken enthusiastically. In a conversation about Mendelssohn, he had remarked how delightful it was to find a man able to make real sacrifices in order to free himself from a false position that was of no service to art. It was assuredly a grand thing, he said, to have renounced a good salary of 9,000 marks as general musical conductor in Berlin, and to have retired to Leipzig as a simple conductor at the Gewandhaus concerts and Mendelssohn was much to be admired on that account. Just at that time I happened to be in a position to give some correct details regarding this apparent sacrifice on the part of Mendelssohn, because when I had made a serious proposal to our general management about increasing the salaries of several of the poorer members of the orchestra, Lutakow was requested to inform me that, according to the king's latest commands, the expenditure on the state bands was to be so restricted that for the present the poorer chamber musicians could not claim any consideration. For Herr von Falkenstein, the governor of the Leipzig district, who was a passionate admirer of Mendelssohn's, had gone so far as to influence the king to appoint the latter secret conductor, with a secret salary of 6,000 marks, this sum, together with the salary of 3,000 marks openly granted him by the management of the Leipzig Uwand House, would amply compensate him for the position he had renounced in Berlin, and he had consequently consented to migrate to Leipzig. This large grant had, for Decency's sake, to be kept secret by the board administering the band funds, not only because it was detrimental to the interests of the institution, but also because it might give offence to those who were acting as conductors at a lower salary, if they knew another man had been appointed to a sinecure. From these circumstances Mendelssohn arrived not only the advantage of having the grant kept a secret, but also the satisfaction of allowing his friends to applaud him as a model of self escaring zeal for going to Leipzig which they could easily do, although they knew him to be in a good financial position. When I explained this to Frank, he was astonished, and admitted it was one of the strangest cases he had ever come across in connection with undeserved fame. We soon arrived at a mutual understanding in our views about many other artistic celebrities with whom we came in contact at that time in Dresden, this was a simple matter in the case of Ferdinand Hiller, who was regarded as the chief of the Goodnet Hart ones. Regarding the more famous painters of the so-called Dusseldorf school, whom I met frequently through the medium of Tannhauser, it was not quite so easy to come to a conclusion, as I was to a great extent influenced by the fame attached to their well-conner names, but here again Frank startled me with opportune and conclusive reasons for disappointment when it was a question between Bendemann and Hubner. It seemed to me that Hubner might very well be sacrificed to Bendemann, the latter, who had only just completed the frescoes for one of the receptermonets at the royal palace, and had been rewarded by his friends with a banquet, appeared to me to have the right to be honored as a great master. I was very much astonished, therefore, when Frank calmly pitied the king of Saxony for having had his room bedowed by Bendemann. Nevertheless, there was no denying that these people were good at heart. My intercourse with them became more frequent, and at all events offered me opportunities of mixing with the more cultured artistic society, in distinction to the theatrical circles with which I had usually associated. Yet I never derived from it the least enthusiasm or inspiration. The latter, however, appears to have been Hiller's main object, and that winter he organized a sort of social circle which held weekly meetings at the home of one or the other of its members in turn. Reinecke, who was both painter and poet, joined this society together with Hubner and Bendemann, and had the bad fortune to write the new text for an opera for Hiller, the fate of which I will describe later on. Robert Schumann, the musician, who was also in Dresden at this time, and was busy working out on opera, 
which eventually developed into Genofive made advances to Hiller and myself. I had already known Schumann in Leipzig, and we had both entered upon our musical careers at about the same time. I had also occasionally sent small contributions to the new Zeitricht firm music, of which he had formerly been editor, and more recently a longer one from Paris on Rossini's Stabat Mater. He had been asked to conduct his parodies on Perry at a concert to be given at the theater, but his peculiar awkwardness in conducting on that occasion aroused my sympathy for the conscientious and energetic musician whose work made so strong an appeal to me, and a kindly and friendly confidence soon grew up between us. After a performance of Tannhauser, at which he was present, he called on me one morning and declared himself fully and decidedly in favor of my work. The only objection he had to make was that the stretch of the second finale was too abrupt, a criticism which proved his keenness of perception, and I was able to show him, by the score, how I had been compelled, much against my inclination, to curtail the opera, and thereby create the position to which he had taken exception. We often met when out walking and, as far as it was possible, with a person so sparing of words. We exchanged views on matters of musical interest. He was looking forward to the production, under my baton, of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, as he had attended the performances at Leipzig and had been very much disappointed by Mendelssohn's conducting, which had quite misunderstood the time of the first movement. Otherwise his society did not inspire me particularly, and the fact that he was too conservative to benefit by my views was soon shown, more especially in his conception of the poem of Genofeva. It was clear that my example had only made a very transient impression on him, only just enough, in fact, to make him think it advisable to write the text of an opera himself. He afterwards invited me to hear him read his libretto, which was a combination of the styles of Hebel and Tieck. When, however, out of a genuine desire for the success of his work, about which I had serious misgivings, I called his attention to some grave defects in it, and suggested the necessary alterations, I realized how matters stood with this extraordinary person. He simply wanted me to be swayed by himself, but deeply resented any interference with the product of his own ideals, so that thenceforward I let matters alone. In the following winter, our circle, thanks to the assiduity of Hiller, was considerably wide and, and it now became a sort of club whose object was to meet freely every week in a room at Engel's restaurant at the Postplatz. Just about this time the famous J. Schnorr of Munich was appointed director of the museums in Dresden, and we entertained him at a banquet. I had already seen some of his large and well exitist cartoons, which made a deep impression on me, not only on account of their dimensions, but also by reason of the events they depicted from old German history, in which I was at that time particularly interested. It was through Schnorr that I now became acquainted with the Munich school of which he was the master. My heart overflowed when I thought what it meant for Dresden. If such giants of German art were to shake hands there, I was much struck by Schnorr's appearance and conversation, and I could not reconcile his whining pedagogic manner with his mighty cartoons. However, I thought it a great stroke of luck when he also took to frequenting Engel's restaurant on Saturdays. He was well versed in the old German legends, and I was delighted when they formed the topic of conversation. The famous sculptor, Hanel used also to attend these meetings, and his marvelous talent inspired me with the greatest respect, although I was not an authority on his work, and could only judge of it by my own feelings. I soon saw that his bearing and manner were affected. He was very fond of expressing his opinion and judgment on questions of art, and I was not in a position to decide whether they were reliable or otherwise. In fact, it often occurred to me that I was listening to a Philistine swaggerer. It was only when my old friend Pecht, who had also settled in Dresden for a time, clearly and emphatically explained to me Hanel's standing as an artist, 
that I conquered all my secret doubts and tried to find some pleasure in his works. Rachel, who was also a member of our society, was the very antithesis of Hanel. I often found it difficult to believe that the pale, delicate man, with the whining, nervous way of expressing himself, was really a sculptor, but as similar peculiarities in Schnorr did not prevent me from recognizing him as a marvelous painter. This helped me to make friends with Rachel, as he was quite free from affectation and had a warm, sympathetic soul that drew me ever closer to him. I also remember hearing from him a very enthusiastic appreciation of my personality as a conductor, in spite, however, of being fellow mayors of our versatile art club, we never attained a footing of real comradeship. For, after all, no one thought much of anybody else's talents. For instance, Hiller had arranged some orchestral concerts, and to commemorate them he was entertained at the usual banquet by his friends. When his services were gratefully acknowledged with due rhetorical pathos, yet I never found, in my private intercourse with Hiller's friends, the least enthusiasm in regard to his work. On the contrary, I only noticed expressions of doubt and apprehensive shrugs. These fated concerts soon came to an end. At our social evenings we never discussed the works of the masters who were present. They were not even mentioned, and it was soon evident that none of the members knew what to talk about. Semper was the only man who, in his extraordinary fashion, often so enlivened our entertainments that Rachel, inwardly sympathetic, though painfully startled, would heartily complain against the unrestrained outbursts that led not infrequently to hot discussions between Semper and myself. Strange to say, we too always seemed to start from the hypothesis that we were antagonists, for he insisted upon regarding me as the representative of Medievali Catholicism which he often attacked with real fury. I eventually succeeded in persuading him that my studies and inclinations had always led me to German antiquity and to the discovery of ideals in the early Teutonic myths. When we came to paganism and I expressed my enthusiasm for the genuine heathen legends, he became quite a different being, and a deep and growing interest now began to unite us in such a way that it quite isolated us from the rest of the company. It was, however, impossible ever to settle anything without a heated argument, not only because Semper had a peculiar habit of contradicting everything flatly, but also because he knew his views were opposed to those of the entire company, his paradoxical assertions, which were apparently only intended to stir up strife, soon made me realize, beyond any doubt, that he was the only one present who was passionately in earnest about everything he said, whereas all the others were quite content to let the matter drop when convenient. A man of the latter type was Gutzkow, who was often with us. He had been summoned to Dresden by the general management of our court theater, to act in the capacity of dramatist and adapter of plays. Several of his pieces had recently met with great success. Zop von Schwert, Das Erbel der Artfa, and Uriel Acosta shed an unexpected luster on the latest dramatic repertoire, and it seemed as though the advent of Gutzkow would inaugurate a new era of glory for the Dresden Theater, where my operas had also been first produced, the good intentions of the management were certainly undeniable. My only regret on that occasion was that the hopes my old friend Lobb entertained of being summoned to Dresden to fill that post were unrealist. He also had thrown himself enthusiastically into the work of dramatic literature. Even in Paris I had noticed the eagerness with which he used to study the technique of dramatic composition especially that of Scribe, in the hope of acquiring the skill of that writer, without which, as he soon discovered, no protocol drama in German could be successful. He maintained that he had thoroughly mastered this style in his comedy, Rococo, and he cherished the conviction that he could work up any imaginable material into an effective stage play. At the same time, he was very careful to show equal skill in the selection of his material, in my opinion, this theory of his was a complete failure. 
as his only successful pieces were those in which popular interest was excited by catch drafts. This interest was always more or less associated with the politics of the day, and generally involved some obvious diatribes about German unity and German liberalism, as this important stimulus was first applied by way of experiment to the subscribers to our residence theatre, and afterwards to the German public generally. It had, as I have already said, to be worked out with the consummate skill which, presumably, could only be learned from modern French writers of comic opera. I was very glad to see the result of this study in Lauby's plays, more especially as when he visited us in Dresden, which he often did on the occasion of a new production, he admitted his indebtedness with modest candor, and was far from pretending to be a real poet. Moreover, he displayed great skill and an almost fiery zeal, not only in the preparation of his pieces, but also in their production, so that the offer of a post at Dresden, the hope of which had been held out to him, would at least, from a practical point of view, have been a benefit to the theatre. Finally, however, the choice fell on his rival Gutzkow, in spite of his obvious unsuitability for the practical work of dramatist. It was evident that even as regards his successful plays his triumph was mainly due to his literary skill, because these effective plays were immediately followed by wearisome productions which made us realize, to our astonishment, that he himself could not have been aware of the skill he had previously displayed. It was, however, precisely these abstract qualities of the genuine man of letters which, in the eyes of many, cast over him the halo of literary greatness, and when Lut a cow, thinking more of a showy reputation than of permanent benefit to his theatre, decided to give the preference to Gutzkow, he thought his choice would give a special impetus to the cause of higher culture. To me the appointment of Gutzkow as the director of dramatic art at the theatre was peculiarly objectionable as it was not long before I was convinced of his utter incompetence for the task, and it was probably owing to the frankness with which I expressed my opinion to Lutakow that our subsequent estrangement was originally due. I had to complain bitterly of the want of judgment and the levity of those who so recklessly selected men to fill the posts of managers and conductors in such precious institutions of art as the German royal theatres, to obviate the failure I felt convinced must follow on this important appointment, I made a special request that Gutzkow should not be allowed to interfere in the management of the opera. He readily yielded, and thus spared himself great humiliation. This action, however, created a feeling of mistrust between us, though I was quite ready to remove this as far as possible by coming into personal contact with him whenever opportunity offered on those evenings when the artists used to gather at the club, as already described, I would gladly have made this strange man, whose head was anxiously bowed down on his breast, relax and unburden himself in his conversations with me, but I was unsuccessful on account of his constant reserve and suspicion and his studied aloofness, an opportunity arose for a discussion between us when he wanted the orchestra to take a melodramatic part which they afterwards did in a certain scene of his Uriel Acosta, where the hero had to recant his alleged heresy, the orchestra had to execute the soft tremolo for a given time on certain chords, but when I heard the performance it appeared to me absurd, and equally derogatory both for the music and the drama, on one of these evenings I tried to come to an understanding with Gutzkow concerning this, and the employment of music generally as a melodramatic auxiliary to the drama, and I discussed my views on the subject in accordance with the highest principles I had conceived. He met all the chief points of my discussion with a nervous distrustful silence, but finally explained that I really went too far in the significance which I claimed for music and that he failed to understand how music would be degraded if it were applied more sparingly to the drama, seeing that the claims of verse were often treated with much less respect when it was used as a mere accessory to operatic music, 
To put it practically, in fact, it would be advisable for the librettist not to be too dainty in this matter. It was impossible always to give the actor a brilliant exit. At the same time, however, nothing could be more painful than when the chief performer made his exit without any applause. In such cases a little distracting noise in the orchestra really supplied a happy diversion. This I actually heard Gutzkow say moreover. I saw that he really meant it. After this I felt I had done with him. It was not long before I had equally little to do with all the painters, musicians, and others elots in art belonging to our society. At the same time, however, I came into closer contact with Berthold Auerbach. With great enthusiasm, Alwine Frommen had already drawn my attention to Auerbach's pastoral stories. The account she gave of these modest works, for that is how she characterized them, sounded quite attractive. She said that they had had the same refreshing effect on her circle of friends in Berlin as that produced by opening the window of a scented boudoir to which she compared the literature they had hitherto been used to and letting in the fresh air of the woods. After that I read the pastoral stories of the Black Forest, which had so quickly become famous, and I, too, was strongly attracted by the contents and tone of these realistic anecdotes about the life of the people in a locality which it was easy enough to identify from the vivid descriptions. As at this time Dresden seemed to be becoming ever more and more the rendezvous for the lights of our literary and artistic world, Auerbach also reconciled himself to taking up his quarters in this city and for quite a long time lived with his friend Hiller, who thus again had a celebrity at his side of equal standing with himself, the short, sturdy Jewish peasant boy, as he was placed to represent himself to be, made a very agreeable impression. It was only later that I understood the significance of his green jacket, and above all of his green hunting cane which made him look exactly what the author of Swabi on pastoral stories ought to look like, and this significance was anything but naive one. The Swiss poet Gottfried Keller once told me that, when Auerbach was in Zurich and he had decided on taking him up, he Auerbach had drawn his attention to the best way in which to introduce one's literary effusions to the public, and to make money, and he advised him above all things, to get a coat and cap like his own, for being, as he said, like himself, neither handsome nor well-grown, it would be far better deliberately to make himself look rough and queer. So saying, he placed his cap on his head in such a way as to look a little rakish. For the time being, I perceived no real affectation in our Bach. He had assimilated so much of the tone and ways of the people, and had done this so happily that, in any case, one could not help asking oneself why, with these delightful qualities, he should move with such tremendous seas in spheres that seemed absolutely antagonistic. At all events, he always seemed in his true element even in those circles which really seemed most opposed to his assumed character. There he stood in his green coat, keen, sensitive, and natural, surrounded by the distinguished society that flattered him, and he loved to show letters he had received from the Grand Duke of Weimar and his answers to them, all the time looking at things from the standpoint of the swabby, unpeasant nature which suited him so admirably. What especially attracted me to him was the fact that he was the first Jew I ever met with whom one could discuss Judaism with absolute freedom. He even seemed particularly desirous of removing, in his agreeable manner, all prejudice on this score, and it was really touching to hear him speak of his boyhood, and declare that he was perhaps the only German who had read Klopstock's Messiah all through, having one day become absorbed in this work, which he read secretly in his cottage home. He had played the truant from school, and when he finally arrived too late at the schoolhouse, his teacher angrily exclaimed, You confounded Jew boy, where have you been, lending money again? Such experiences had only made him feel pensive and melancholy, but not bitter, 
and he had even been inspired with a real compassion for the coarsens of his tormentors. These were traits in his character which drew me very strongly to him. As time went on, however, it seemed to me a serious matter that he could not get away from the atmosphere of these ideas, for I began to feel that the universe contained no other problem for him than the elucidation of the Jewish question. One day, therefore, I protested as good-naturedly and confidentially as I could, and advised him to let the whole problem of Judaism drop, as there were, after all, many other standpoints from which the world might be criticized. Strange to say, he thereupon not only lost his ingenuousness, but also fell to whining in an ecstatic fashion, which did not seem to me very genuine, and assured me that that would be an impossibility for him, as there was still so much in Judaism which needed his whole sympathy, I could not help recalling the surprising anguish which he had manifested on this occasion, when I learned, in the course of time, that he had repeatedly arranged Jewish marriages, concerning the happy result of which I heard nothing, save that he had, by this means, made quite a fortune, when, several years afterwards, I again saw him in Zurich. I observed that his appearance had unfortunately changed in a manner quite disconcerting. He looked really extraordinarily common and dirty. His former refreshing liveliness had turned into the usual Jewish restlessness, and it was easy to see that all he said was uttered as if he regretted that his words could not be turned to better account in a newspaper article. During his time in Dresden, however, our botch warm agreement with my artistic projects really did me good, even though it may have been only from his Semitic and Swabian standpoint. So did the novelty of the experience I was at that time undergoing as an artist. In meeting with Everensikers in regard and recognition among people of note, of acknowledged importance and of exceptional culture, if after the success obtained by Rienzi, I still remained with the circle of the real theatrical world. The greater success following on Tannhauser certainly brought me into contact with such people as I have mentioned above, who, though to be sure they considerably enlarged my ideas, at the same time impressed me very unfavorably with what was apparently the pinnacle of the artistic life of the period. At any rate, I felt neither rewarded nor Fortunately, even diverted by the acquaintances I won by the first performance of Might and Hauser that winter, on the contrary, I felt an irresistible desire to withdraw into my shell and leave these gay surroundings into which, strangely enough, I had been introduced at the instigation of Hiller, whom I soon recognized as being a nonentity. I felt I must quickly compose something as this was the only means of ridding myself of all the disturbing and painful excitement Tannhauser had produced in me. Only a few weeks after the first performances I had worked out the whole of the low and grin text. In November I had already read this poem to my intimate friends, and soon afterwards to the Hiller set. It was praised and pronounced effective. Schumann also thoroughly approved of it although he did not understand the musical form in which I wished to carry it out, as he saw no resemblance in it to the old methods of writing individual solos for the various artists. I then had some fun in reading different parts of my work to him in the form of arias and cavatinas, after which he laughingly declared himself satisfied. Serious reflection, however, aroused my gravest doubts as to the tragic character of the material itself, and to these doubts I had been led, in a manner both sensible and tactful, by Frank. He thought it offensive to effect Elsa's punishment through Logren's departure, for although he understood that the characteristics of the legend were expressed precisely by this highly potical feature, he was doubtful as to whether it did full justice to the demands of tragic feeling in its relation to dramatic realism. He would have preferred to see Low and Grin die before our eyes owing to Elsa's loving treachery. As, however, this did not seem feasible, he would have liked to see Low and Grin spellbound by some powerful motive and prevented from getting away. Although, of course, 
I would not agree to any of these suggestions. I went so far as to consider whether I could not do away with the cruel separation and still retain the incident of Lognorin's departure, which was essential. I then sought for a means of letting Elsa go away with low and grin, as a form of penance which would withdraw her also from the world. This seemed more promising to my talented friend. While I was still very doubtful about all this, I gave my poem to Frau von Luttekau, so that she might peruse it and criticize the point raised by Frank. In a little letter, in which she expressed her pleasure at my poem, she wrote briefly, but very decidedly, on the knotty question, and declared that Frank must be devoid of all poetry if he did not understand that it was exactly in the way I had chosen, and in no other, that Low and Grin must depart. I felt as if a load had fallen from my heart. In triumph I showed the letter to Frank, who, much abashed, and by way of excusing himself, opened a correspondence with Frau von Luttekau, which certainly cannot have been lacking in interest, though I was never able to see any of it. In any case, the upshot of it was that Low and Grin remained as I had originally conceived it. Curiously enough, some time later, I had a similar experience with regard to the same subject, which again put me in a temporary state of uncertainty, when Adolf Starr gravely raised the same objection to the solution of the Low and Grin question. I was really taken aback by the uniformity of opinion, and as, owing to some excitement, I was just then no longer in the same mood as when I composed Low and Grin. I was foolish enough to write a hurried letter to Starr in which, with but a few slight reservations, I declared him to be right. I did not know that, by this, I was causing real grief to List, who was now in the same position with regard to Starr as Frau von Luttekau had been with regard to Frank. Fortunately, however, the displeasure of my great friend at my supposed treachery to myself did not last long, for, without having got wind of the trouble I had caused him, and thanks to the torture I myself was going through, I came to the proper decision in a few days, and, as clear as daylight, I saw what madness it had been. I was therefore able to rejoice List with the following laconical protest which I sent him from my Swiss resort. Star is wrong, and Low and Grin is right. For the present I remained occupied with the revision of my poem, for there could be no question of planning the music to it just now. That peaceful and harmonious state of mind which is so favorable to creative work, and always so necessary to me for composing, I now had to secure with the greatest difficulty, for it was one of the things I always had the hardest struggle to obtain, all the experiences connected with the performance of Tannhauser having filled me with true despair as to the whole future of my artistic operations. I saw it was hopeless to think of its production being extended to other German theatres, for I had not been able to achieve this end even with the successful Rienzi. It was perfectly obvious, therefore, that my work would, at the utmost, be conceded a permanent place in the Dresden repertoire. As the result of all this, my pecuniary affairs, which have already been described, had got into such a serious state that a catastrophe seemed inevitable. While I was preparing to meet this in the best way I could, I tried to stufapy myself on the one hand, by plunging into the study of history, mythology, and literature, which were becoming ever dearer and dearer to me, and on the other by working incessantly at my artistic enterprises. As regards the former, I was chiefly interested in the German Middle Ages, and tried to make myself familiar with every point relative to this period. Although I could not set about this task with philological precision, I proceeded with such earnestness that I studied the German records, published by Grimm, for instance, with the greatest interest, as I could not put the results of such studies immediately into my scenes. There were many who could not understand why, as an operatic composer, I should waste my time on such barren work. Different people remarked later on that the personality of Low and Grin had a charm quite its own, 
but this was ascribed to the happy selection of the subject, and I was specially praised for choosing it. Material from the German Middle Ages, and later on, subjects from Scandinavian antiquity were therefore looked forward to by many, and, in the end, they were astonished that I gave them no adequate result of all my labors. Perhaps it will be of help to them if I now tell them to take the old records and such works to their aid. I forgot at that time to call Hiller's attention to my documents, and with great pride he seized upon a subject out of the history of the Hohenstaufen. As, however, he had no success with his work, he may perhaps think I was a little artful for not having spoken to him of the old records. Concerning my other duties, my chief undertaking for this winter consisted in an exceptionally carefully prepared performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which took place in the spring on Palm Sunday. This performance involved many a struggle, besides a host of experiences which were destined to exercise a strong influence over my further development. Roughly they were as follows the Royal Orchestra had only one opportunity a year of showing their powers independently in a musical performance outside the opera or the church, for the benefit of the pension fund for their widows and orphans. The old so-called opera house was given up to a big performance originally only intended for oratorios. Ultimately, in order to make it more attractive, a symphony was always added to the oratorio, and, as already mentioned, I had performed on such occasions. Once the pastoral symphony, and later Haydn's creation, the latter was a great joy to me, and it was on this occasion that I first made its acquaintance, as we two conductors had stipulated for alternate performances, the symphony on Palm Sunday of the year 1846 fell to my lot. I had a great longing for the Ninth Symphony, and I was led to the choice of this work by the fact that it was almost unknown in Dresden. When the directors of the orchestra, who were the trustees of the pension fund, and who had to promote its increase, got to know of this, such a fright seized them that they interviewed the general director, Lutakow, and begged him, by virtue of his high authority, to dissuade me from carrying out my intention. They gave as a reason for this request that the pension fund would surely suffer through the choice of this symphony, as the work was in ill repute in the place, and would certainly keep people from going to the concert. The symphony had been performed many years before by Reisiger at a charity concert, and, as the conductor himself honestly admitted, had been an absolute failure. Now it needed my whole ordure, and all the eloquence I could command, to prevail over the doubts of our principal, with the orchestral directors. However, there was nothing for me to do but quarrel, as I heard that they were complaining all over the town about my indiscretion. In order to add shame to their trouble, I made up my mind to prepare the public in such a way for the performance, upon which I had resolved, and for the work itself, that at least the sensation caused would lead to a full haul, and thus, in a very favorable manner, guarantee satisfactory returns, and contradict their belief that the fund was menaced. Thus, the Ninth Symphony had, in every conceivable way, become for me a point of honor for the success of which I had to exercise all my powers to the utmost. The committee had misgivings regarding the outlay needed for procuring the orchestral parts, so I borrowed them from the Leipzig Concert Society. Imagine my feelings, however, on now seeing for the first time since my earliest boyhood the mysterious pages of this score, which I studied conscientiously in those days, the sight of these same pages had filled me with the most mystic reveries, and I had stayed up for nights together to copy them out, just as at the time of my uncertainty in Paris, on hearing the rehearsal of the first three movements performed by the incomparable orchestra of the conservatory, I had been carried back through years of error and doubt to be placed in marvelous touch with my earliest days while all my inmost aspirations had been fruitfully stimulated in a new direction, 
So now, in the same way, the memory of that music was secretly awakened in me as I again saw before my own eyes that which in those early days had likewise been only a mysterious vision. I had by this time experienced much which, in the depths of my soul, drove me almost unconsciously to a process of summing puck, to an almost despairing inquiry concerning my fate, what I dared not acknowledge to myself was the fact of the absolute insecurity of my existence both from the artistic and financial point of view, for I saw that I was a stranger to my own mode of life as well as to my profession, and I had no prospects whatsoever. This despair, which I tried to conceal from my friends, was now converted into genuine exaltation thanks entirely to the Ninth Symphony, it is not likely that the heart of a disciple has ever been filled with such keen rapture over the work of a master, as mine was at the first movement of this symphony. If any one had come upon me unexpectedly while I had the open score before me, and had seen me convulsed with sobs and tears as I went through the work in order to consider the best manner of rendering it, he would certainly have asked with astonishment if this were really fitting behavior for the conductor royal of Saxony. Fortunately, on such occasions I was spared the visits of our orchestra directors, and their worthy conductor Reisiger, and even those of F. Hiller, who was so versed in classical music. In the first place I drew up a program, for which the book of words for the cow race was ordered according to Custafirmus and me with a good pretext. I did this in order to provide a guide to the simple understanding of the work, and thereby hoped to appeal not to the critical judgment, but solely to the feelings of the audience. This program, in the framing of which some of the chief passages in Goethe's Faust were exceedingly helpful to me, was very well received not only on that occasion in Dresden, but later on in other places. Besides this, I made use of the Dresden Anz Eiger by writing all kinds of shortened enthusiastic anonymous paragraphs in order to whet the public taste for a work which hitherto had been an ill repute in Dresden. Not only did these purely extraneous exertions succeed in making the receipts of that year by far exceed any that had been taken there to four, but the orchestra directors themselves, during the remaining years of my stay in Dresden, made a point of ensuring similarly large profits by repeated performances of the celebrated symphony. Concerning the artistic side of the performance, I aimed at making the orchestra give as expressive a rendering as possible, and to this end made all kinds of notes, myself in the various parts, so as to make quite sure that their interpretation would be as clear and as colored as could be desired, it was principally the custom which existed then of doubling the wind instruments that led me to a most careful consideration of the advantages this system presented, for, in performances on a large scale, the following somewhat crude rule prevailed all those passages marked piano were executed by a single set of instruments, while those marked forte were carried out by a duplicated set as an instance of the way in which I took care to ensure an intelligible rendering by this means. I might point to a certain passage in the second movement of the symphony, where the whole of the string instruments play the principal and rhythmical figure in C major for the first time. It is written in triple octaves, which play uninterruptedly in unison and, to a certain degree, serve as an accompaniment to the second theme which is only performed by feeble wood instruments. As Fort Sissio is indicated alike for the whole orchestra, the result in every imaginable rendering must be that the melody for the wood instruments not only completely disappears, but cannot even be heard through the strings, which, after all, are only accompanying. Now, as I never carried my piety to the extent of taking directions absolutely literally, rather than sacrifice the effect really intended by the master to the erroneous indications given. I made the strings play only moderately loudly instead of real fort sissio, up to the point where they alternate with the wind instruments in taking up the continuation of the new theme. 
Thus, the motive, rendered as it was as loudly as possible by a double set of wind instruments, was, I believe, for the first time since the existence of the symphony, heard with real distinctness. I proceeded in this manner throughout in order to guarantee the greatest exactitude in the dynamical effects of the orchestra. There was nothing, however difficult, which was allowed to be performed in such a way as not to arouse the feelings of the audience in a particular manner. For example, many brains had been puzzled by the fugato in sixtite time which comes after the chorus. Fro we sani san unfliegen in the movement of the finale marked Ali a marsha in view of the preceding inspiriting verses, which seemed to be preparing for combat and victory. I conceived this fugato really as a glad but earnest horsing, and I took it at a continuously fiery tempo, and with the utmost vigour. The day following the first performance I had the satisfaction of receiving a visit from the musical director Anaker of Freiburg, who came to tell me somewhat penitently that though until then he had been one of my antagonists, since the performance of the symphony he certainly reckoned himself among my friends. What had absolutely overwhelmed him, he said, was precisely my conception and interpretation of the fugato. Furthermore, I devoted special attention to that extraordinary passage, resembling a recitative for the cellos and basses, which comes at the beginning of the last movement, and which had once caused my old friend Poland's such great humiliation in Leipzig. Thanks to the exceptional excellence of our bass players, I felt certain of attaining to absolute perfection in this passage. After twelve special rehearsals of the instruments alone concerned, I succeeded in getting them to perform in a way which sounded not only perfectly free, but which also expressed the most exquisite tenderness and the greatest energy in a thoroughly impressive manner. From the very beginning of my undertaking I had at once recognized that the only method of achieving overwhelming popular success with this symphony was to overcome, by some ideal means, the extraordinary difficulties presented by the choral parts. I realized that the demands made by these parts could be met only by a large and enthusiastic body of singers. It was above all necessary, then, to secure a very good and large choir. So, besides adding the somewhat feebled Reisig Academy of singing to our usual number of members in the theater chorus, in spite of great difficulties I also enlisted the help of the choir from the Kreuzschigl, with its fine boys' voices, and the choir of the Dresden Seminary, which had had much practice in church singing, in a way quite my own nine outride to get these three hundred singers, who were frequently united for rehearsals, into a state of genuine ecstasy. For instance, I succeeded in demonstrating to the basses that the celebrated passage Sidum Schlinden, Millionen, and especially Bruder Ubermem Sternenstelmus ein Guter Vater Wohnen, could not be sung in an ordinary manner, but must, as it were, be proclaimed with the greatest rapture. In this I took the laid in a manner so elated that I really think I literally transported them to a world of emotion utterly strange to them for a while, and I did not desist till my voice, which had been heard clearly above all the others, began to be no longer distinguishable even to myself, but was drowned so to speak, in the warm sea of sound. It gave me particular pleasure, with Mitterwurcher's cooperation, to give a most overwhelmingly expressive rendering of the recitative for baritone. Frund nicked D. Stone. In view of its exceptional difficulties, this passage might almost be considered impossible to perform, and yet he executed it in a way which showed what fruit our mutual interchange of ideas had borne. I also took care that, by means of the complete reconstruction of the hall, I should obtain good acoustic conditions for the orchestra, which I had arranged according to quite a new system of my own. As may be imagined, it was only with the greatest difficulty that the money for this could be found. However, I did not give up, and owing to a totally new construction of the platform, I was able to concentrate the whole of the orchestra towards the center. 
and surround it in amphitheater fashion by the throng of singers who were accommodated on seats very considerably raised. This was not only of great advantage to the powerful effect of the choir, but it also gave great precision and energy to the finely organist orchestra in the purely symphonic movements. Even at the general rehearsal the hall was overcrowded. Reisiger was guilty of the incredible stupidity of working up the public mind against the symphony and drawing attention to Beethoven's very regrettable error. Gade, on the other hand, who came to visit us from Leipzig, where he was then conducting the Gewandhaus concerts, assured me after the general rehearsal that he would willingly have paid double the price of his ticket in order to hear the recitative by the basses once more whilst Hiller considered that I had gone too far in my modification of the tempo. What he meant by this I learned subsequently when I heard him conducting intricate orchestral works. But of this I shall have more to say later on. There was no denying that the performance was, on the whole, a success in fact. It exceeded all our expectations, and was particularly well received by the non-musical public. Among these I remember the philogelous driver. Cockley, who came to me at the end of the evening and confessed that it was the first time he had been able to follow a symphonic work from beginning to end with intelligent interest. This experience left me with a pleasant feeling of ability and power, and strongly confirmed me in the belief that if I only desired anything with sufficient earnestness, I was able to achieve it with irresistible and overwhelming success. I now had to consider, however, what the difficulties were, which hitherto had prevented a similarly happy production of my own new conceptions. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which was still such a problem to so many, and had, at all events, never attained to popularity, I had been able to make a complete success, yet, as often as it was put on the stage, Meitenhauser taught me that the possibilities of its success had yet to be discovered. How was this to be done? This was and remained the secret question which influenced all my subsequent development. I dared not, however, indulge at that time in any meditation on this point with the view of arriving at any particular results. For the real significance of my failure, of which I was inwardly convinced, stood absolutely bare before me with all its terrifying lessons. Albeit, I could no longer delay taking even the most disagreeable steps with the view of warding off the catastrophe which menaced my financial position. I was led to this, thanks to the influence of a ridiculous omen. My agent, the purely nominal publisher of my three operas Enzi, the Fly and her Hollander and Tannhauser eccentric court music publisher, C. F. Messer, invited me one day to the café known as the Vertebrer to discuss our money affairs. With great qualms we talked over the possible results of the annual Easter fair, and wondered whether they would be tolerably good or altogether bad. I gave him courage and ordered a bottle of the best Hautsautnert. A venerable flask made its appearance, I filled the glasses, and we'd ranked to the good success of the fair, when suddenly we both yelled as though we had gone mad, while, with horror, we tried to read our mouths of the strong tarragon vinegar with which we had been served by mistake. Heavens, cried Messer, nothing could be worse. True enough, I answered, no doubt there is much that will turn to vinegar for us. My good Halmer revealed to me in a flash that I must try some other way of saving myself than by means of the Easter fair. Not only was it necessary to refund the capital which had been got together by dint of Everensikersing sacrifices, in order to defray the expenses of the publication of my operas, but, owing to the fact that I had been obliged ultimately to seek aid from the usurers, the rumor of my debts had spread so far abroad that even those friends who had helped me at the time of my arrival in Dresden were seized with anxiety on my account. At this time I met with a really sad experience at the hands of Madame Schroeder Verden, who, as the result of her incomprehensible lack of discretion, did much to bring about my final undoing. 
When I first settled in Dresden, as I have already pointed out, she lent me three thousand marks, not only to help me to discharge my debts, but also to allow me to contribute to the maintenance of my old friend Keats in Paris. Jealousy of my niece Johanna, and suspicion that I had made her my niece come to Dresden in order to make it easier for the general management to dispense with the services of the great artist, had awakened in this otherwise so noble-minded woman the usual feelings of animosity towards me, which are so often met within the theatrical profession. She had now given up her engagement. She even declared openly that I had been partly instrumental in obtaining her dismissal and abandoning all friendly regard for me, whereby she deeply wronged me in every respect. She placed the I, O, U, I had given her in the hands of an energetic lawyer, and without further ado this man sued me for the payment of the money. Thus I was forced to make a clean breast of everything to let account, and to beseech him to intervene for me, and if possible to obtain a royal advance that would enable me to clear my position, which was so seriously compromised. My principal declared himself willing to support any request I might wish to address to the king on this matter. To this end I had to note down the amount of my debts. But as I soon discovered that the necessary sum could only be assigned to me as a loan from the theatre pension fund, at an interest of five per cent, and that I should moreover have to secure the capital of the pension fund by a life insurance policy, which would cost me annually three per cent of the capital borrowed, I was, for obvious reasons, tempted to leave out of my petition all those of my debts which were not of a pressing nature, and for the payment of which I thought I could count on the receipts which I might finally expect from my publishing enterprises. Nevertheless, the sacrifices I had to make in order to repay the help offered me increased to such an extent that my salary of conductor, in itself very slender, promised to be materially diminished for some time to come. I was forced to make the most turksome efforts to gather together the necessary sum for the life insurance policy, and was therefore obliged frequently to appeal to Leipzig. In addition to this, I had to overcome the most appalling doubts in regard both to my health and to the probable length of my life, concerning which I fancied I had heard all sorts of malicious apprehensions expressed by those who had observed me but casually in the miserable condition which I was in at that time. My friend Poussin Ellie, as a doctor who was very intimate with me, eventually managed to give such satisfactory information concerning the state of my health that I succeeded in insuring my life at the rate of three per cent. The last of these painful journeys to Leipzig was, at all events, made under pleasant circumstances owing to a kind invitation from the old maestro Louis Spark. I was particularly pleased over this, because to me it meant nothing less than an act of reconciliation. As a matter of fact, Spar had written to me on one occasion, and had declared that, stimulated by the success of my fly and her Hollander and his own enjoyment of it. He had once more decided to take up the career of a dramatic composer, which of recent years had brought him such scant success. His last work was an operate Kreuferschum he had sent to the Dresden Theatre in the course of the preceding year in the hope, as he himself assured me that I would urge on its production. After asking this fab hour, he drew my attention to the fact that in this work he had made an absolutely new departure from his earlier operas, and had kept to the most precise rhythmically dramatic declamation, which had certainly been made all the more easy for him by the excellent subject. Without being actually surprised, my horror was indeed great when, after studying not only the text, but also the score, I discovered that the old maestro had been absolutely mistaken in regard to the account he had given me of his work. The custom in force at that time that the decision concerning the production of works should not, as a rule, rest with one of the conductors alone, did not tend to make me any less fearful of declaring myself emphatically in favour of this work. 
In addition to this, it was Reisiger, who, as he had often boasted, was an old friend of Spars, whose turn it was to select and produce a new work. Unfortunately, as I learned later, the general management had returned Spars' opera to its author in such a curt manner as to offend him, and he complained bitterly of this to me. Genuinely concerned at this, I had evidently managed to calm and appease him, for the invitation mentioned above was clearly a friendly acknowledgment of my efforts. He wrote that it was very painful for him to have to touch at Dresden on his way to one of the Waterens Plas. As, however, he had a real longing to make my acquaintance, he begged me to meet him in Leipzig, where he was going to stay for a few days. This meeting with him did not leave me unimpressed. He was a tall, stately man, distinguished in appearance, and of a serious and calm temperament. He gave me to understand, in a touching, almost apologetic manner, that the essence of his education and of his aversion from the new tendencies in music had its origin in the first impressions he had received on hearing, as a very young boy, Mozart's magic flute, a work which was quite new at that time, and which had a great influence on his whole life, regarding my libretto to Low and Grin, which I had left behind for him to read, and the general impression which my personal acquaintance had made on him. He expressed himself with almost surprising warmth to my brother Lenaw, Herman Brockhaus, at whose house we had been invited to dine, and where, during the meal, the conversation was most animated. Besides this, we had met at real musical evenings at the conductor Hauptmann's as well as at Mendelssohn's, on which occasion I heard the master take the violin in one of his own quartets. It was precisely in these circles that I was impressed by the touching and venerable dignity of his absolutely calm demeanor. Later on, I learned from Witznefser whose testimony, be it said, I cannot vouch at Tannhauser, when it was performed at Castle, had caused him so much confusion and pain that he declared he could no longer follow me, and feared that I must be on the wrong road. In order to recover from all the hardships and cares I had gone through, I now managed to obtain a special favour from the management, in the form of a three-month leave, in which to improve my health in rustic retirement, and to get pure air to breathe while composing some new work. To this end I had chosen a peasant's house in the village of Grossgrapes, which is halfway between Pilnitz and the border of what is known as Saxon Switzerland. Frequent excursions to the Porsberg, to the adjacent Liebethaler, and to the far distant Bastion helped to strengthen my unstrung nerves. While I was first planning the music to low and grin, I was disturbed incessantly by the echoes of some of the airs in Rossini's William Tell which was the last opera I had had to conduct. At last I happened to hit on an effective means of stopping this annoying obtrusion. During my lonely walks I sang with great emphasis the first theme from the Ninth Symphony, which had also quite lately been revived in my memory. This succeeded at Pirna, where one can bathe in the river. I was surprised, on one of my almost regular evening constitutionals, to hear the air from the pilgrim's chorus out of Tannhauser whistled by some bather, who was invisible to me, this first sign of the possibility of popular sizing the work, which I had with such difficulty succeeded in getting performed in Dresden, made an impression on me which no similar experience later on has ever been able to surpass. Sometimes I received visits from friends in Dresden, and among them Hans von Bülow, who was then sixteen years old, came accompanied by Lipinski. This gave me great pleasure, because I had already noticed the interest which he took in me. Generally, however, I had to rely only on my wife's company, and during my long walks I had to be satisfied with my little dog Peps. During this summer holiday, of which a great part of the time had at the beginning to be devoted to the unpleasant task of arranging my business affairs, and also to the improvement of my health, I nevertheless succeeded in making a sketch of the music to the whole of the three acts of Low and Grin, 
although this cannot be said to have consisted of anything more than a very hasty outline. With this much gained, I returned in August to Dresden, and resumed my duties as conductor, which every year seemed to become more and more burdensome to me. Moreover, I immediately plunged once more into the midst of troubles which had only just been temporarily allayed, the business of publishing my operas, on the success of which I still counted as the only means of liberating me from my difficult position, demanded ever fair sacrifices if the enterprise were to be made worth while, but as my income was now very much reduced, even the smallest outlays necessarily laid me into ever and more painful complications, and I once more lost all courage. On the other hand, I tried to strengthen myself by again working energetically at low and grin. While doing this, I proceeded in a manner that I have not since repeated. I first of all completed the third act, and in view of the criticism already mentioned of the characters and conclusion of this act, I determined to try to make it the very pivot of the whole opera. I wished to do this, if only for the sake of the musical motive appearing in the story of the Holy Grail, but in other respects the plan struck me as perfectly satisfactory, owing to previous suggestions on my part. Gluxifigenie in Aulis was to be produced this winter. I felt it my duty to give more care and attention to this work, which interested me particularly on account of its subject, than I had given to the study of the Armida. In the first place, I was upset by the translation in which the opera with the Berlin score was presented to us. In order not to be led into false interpretations through the instrumental additions which I considered very badly applied in this score, I wrote for the original edition from Paris, when I had made a thorough revision of the translation, with a view merely to the correctness of declamation, I was spurred on by my increasing interest to revise the score itself. I tried to bring the poem as far as possible into agreement with Euripides' play of the same name, by the elimination of everything which, in deference to French taste, made the relationship between Achilles and Iphigenia one of tender love. The chief alteration of all was to cut out the inevitable marriage at the end. For the sake of the vitality of the drama, I tried to join the arias and choruses, which generally followed immediately upon each other without rhyme or reason, by connecting links, prologus, and epilogues. In this I did my best, by the use of Gluck's themes, to make the interpolions of a strange composer as inapatable as possible. In the third act alone was I obliged to give Iphigenia, as well as Artemis, whom I had myself introduced, recitatives of my own composition. Throughout the rest of the work I revised the whole instrumentation more or less thoroughly, but only with the object of making the existing version produce the effect I desired. It was not till the end of the year that I was able to finish this tremendous task, and I had to postpone the completion of the third act of Low and Grin, which I had already begun, until the new year. The first thing to claim my attention at the beginning of the year 1840 was the production of Iphigenia. I had to act as stage manager in this case, and was even obliged to help the Septnaterns and the Mechanicians over the smallest details, owing to the fact that the scenes in this opera were generally strung together somewhat clumsily and without any apparent connection. It was necessary to recast them completely, in order so to animate the representation as to give to the dramatic action the life it lacked. A good deal of this faultiness of construction seemed to me due to the many conventional practices which were prevalent at the Paris Sapri in Gluck's time. Mitterwurchers was the only actor in the whole cast who gave me any pleasure. In the role of Agamemnon he showed a thorough grasp of that character, and carried out my instructions and suggestions to the letter, so that he succeeded in giving a really splendid and intelligent rendering of the part. The success of the whole performance was far beyond my expectations, and even the directors were so surprised at the exceptional enthusiasm aroused by one of Gluck's operas, that for the second performance they, on their own initiative, 
had my name put on the program as reviser, this at once drew the attention of the critics to this work, and for once they almost did me justice. My treatment of the overture, the only part of the opera which these gentlemen heard rendered in the usual trivial way, was the only thing that they could find fault with. I have discussed and given an accurate account of all that relates to this in a special article on Gluck's overture to Iphigenia in Aulis, and I only wish to adhere that the musician who made such strange comments on this occasion was Ferdinand Hiller. As in former years, the winter meetings of the various artistic elements in Dresden which Hiller had inaugurated continued to take place, but they now assumed more the character of salons in Hiller's own house. And it seemed to me intended solely for the purpose of laying the foundations for a general recognition of Hiller's artistic greatness. He had already founded among the more wealthy patrons of art, the chief of whom was the banker Caskell, a society for running subscription concerts, as it was impossible for the royal orchestra to be placed at his disposal for this purpose. He had to content himself with members of the town and military bands for his orchestra, and it cannot be denied that, thanks to his perseverance, he attained a praiseworthy result, as he produced many compositions which were still unknown in Dresden,